First of all, what the future of monarchy was going to be, and secondly, exactly what he could expect when he was going to be Prince of Wales. At the main college building on the seafront, Prince Charles has done most of his work. In the language laboratory, he spent an hour each day perfecting his Welsh grammar and pronunciation. His tutor is Mr. Edward Millwood, a former vice president of the Welsh Nationalist Party. Well, this has been a crash course. It's been only part of a crash course amongst other studies. And in the short time that he's been working, he's developed a very good accent, and uh, I'm sure it's going to stand him in very good stead from now on. Carnarvon waits like a bride for her wedding, gaily dressed for the big moment, but anxious too that something could go wrong, though every precaution has been taken to make sure that it doesn't. As traffic jams block the town, army bomb disposal experts are on the alert. His investor was obviously quite a big, a big thing. Uh, it was obviously broadcast, televised, which was a would be a fast. From that, I want to say from that day forward, but probably even before then, the the kind of the training and the preparation of one day becoming king began. And I think, you know, he took this very seriously his whole life. Mayach and Echiad. Wed i fy'n hyfforth yn ddwys. A gallaf eich sicrhau fy mod wedi cymryd sylwi o'r gobeithion am lygywyd and the nhw. Charles' attitude towards every kind of formal event at this stage in his life, I think, could be best summarised as fear. If you look at him and you look at his face and the pictures and the film that exists, he looks frightened, he looks like he's not confident about the situation, and he looks as if he's finding it quite difficult to cope with all the attention placed upon him. Because there's always a sense, I think, that having to live up to not just your mother's example, but examples of every single monarch who's gone before you. What's really nice is I noticed when I was working for him at Highgrove, he was very much training his son, Prince William, in, I believe, in how he would become a Prince of Wales, and he was teaching him all the things that he had learned. So he's passed it on to Prince William, who is now the Prince of Wales. Well, any heir to the throne always has a series of responsibilities, some of which are quite dull. I mean, going to functions, opening things, meeting people. Some are more exciting, going on international tours and things like that. And Charles got on with it, because essentially every member of the royal family knew and knows but to get on with something like this is what you're there for. You're not there to be lionised all the time. You are a public servant, and public service is something that is drilled into them very, very young. It's been traditional that any member, any male member of a royal family would be expected to spend time in the army, and Charles was not an obvious fit to spend time in the armed forces, but the fact that he served in the RAF for several years in the 1970s was an indication that, first of all, he could put his mind to something like this and do it with... I don't think it's... I think it's true to say that compared to, say, Prince Andrew, who was quite a distinguished pilot, Charles was not exactly out of a top drawer in the RAF, but it was still an invaluable time for him because he found himself mixing with his men on much more equal terms than he ever had been able to when he was at school. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. And I think that it was actually probably a character forming experience for him because it did give him a sense of working with the armed forces and that's something that he's had a lifelong respect for. So while it's fair to say that Charles was not the most distinguished member of the RF has ever been, it was certainly an important time for him and something that I think affected and led to the man that he's become. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the, the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Well, Charles's great uncle, Dickie Mountbatten, Lord Mountbatten, apparently once said to him that it was important for him to sow his wild oats before he got married. There was a real sense with Charles that he was expected to have a bachelor life because his father had not had much of a bachelor life. I mean, he'd had girlfriends, but he had no serious relationships before he married Princess Elizabeth. I think that the family generally thought with Charles that he shouldn't marry before he was 30, that he should 
date as many people as he could and see what came of that. And on the one hand, he wasn't necessarily the most outgoing of men. He wasn't necessarily somebody who was going to be a lady killer. But on the other hand, he was a Prince of Wales. There was no shortage of people who would have married him. Well, he met Lady Diana Spencer in 1977 because he'd actually been dating her elder sister, Sarah, for a while. When he first met Diana, she was 16. And it was an unequal relationship because she was still a girl. But there was obviously a spark between them, a spark of interest. And of course, at this stage, Charles was still seeing Camilla Shand, who later became Camilla Parker Bowles. So I think it's fair to say that on the one hand, the relationship with Diana was not necessarily an obvious love match from the beginning, but on the other hand, there was very much an, in an interest on both sides. And she was somebody, perhaps because of her youth, who was not phased by responsibilities that she'd have to take on if she became Princess of Wales. She now faced possibly the most daunting initiation test for would-be members of the royal family, ordeal by the media. Her flat came under siege. She was followed wherever she went. Yesterday you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would, in all likelihood, be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. The months between the engagement and the wedding were hectic, often exhilarating, sometimes trying. She had to learn the restrictions of royal life. Never again would she be able to walk quietly down to the shops. Prince Charles had to keep the engagements he'd accepted before the announcement of the engagement, and this meant some separation. Diana had to accept this and do her best to hide her feelings. When Charles and Diana were asked in their engagement interview if they were in love, she replied, of course, and Charles more or less shrugged and said, whatever love means. Each of those answers is disingenuous. Diana is answering, of course, because she doesn't want to try and get into any kind of deeper question. She wants to brush away the answer. Charles's whatever love means is, I think, an attempt on his part to try and say, that's a ridiculous question. Why are you asking me that? I'm not interested in responding to it. However, it was the worst possible thing he could have said because for decades afterwards, that has been taken to mean he doesn't love Diana, he's doing this because he feels he has to, he's been forced into it, he couldn't care less, she could be anyone. And I think that a lot of the public ill will towards Charles comes about because it was felt he wasn't in love with Diana. And that response, I think, has led to a lot of it. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously, means, uh, obviously it means two very happy people. Yes, thank Once you. Again, you congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, thank you very much. much. Be kind. Of a royal wedding was by far the biggest event for the royal family that there'd been since the coronation nearly 30 years before. And it was something that people were queuing up on the streets to see it. There were millions and hundreds of millions of people watching it worldwide because it was bringing glamour to the royal family. It was the idea, I mean, the famous picture of the kissing on Buckingham Palace balcony, one of the most reproduced images of the royal family of the 20th century. And it was one of those days that was freighted with pageantry, freighted with pomp, and it was designed to show at the, at the beginning of the 1980s, at the start of Thatcherism, that Britain could still put on this kind of event that would still excite people, it would still show off what soft power could do. The best places are filling up and everyone's making sure it's going to be a great day. Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal brides since the young Queen Victoria was its first, marrying Prince Albert 141 years ago. The royal carriages, the Queen's procession and Prince Charles's little procession will drive down the leafy mall to Admiralty Arch in the distance. And five minutes after the Prince of Wales has passed, Lady Diana and her father will come out from Clarence House in the glass coach, just with police outriders, for she's not royal yet, and will follow her husband-to-be to St Paul's. 
And I feel rather sorry for Diana, actually, because she was caught in the middle of it, and she was still so young at this stage. I mean, she's only 20 years old. And the idea of being placed in front of the world's cameras and the world's media and essentially told to perform must have been absolutely terrifying. I mean, Charles had more experience of it, of course, because he'd been doing it for longer, but it still must have been overwhelming for him as well. I think that their relationship was troubled after the birth of Prince Harry, and one of the reasons why it was troubled was simply because Diana was essentially running her own show. She was getting a lot of attention, but her husband wasn't. She was somebody who was being fated, she was being seen increasingly as a fashion icon, and she wasn't doing what she was supposed to be doing, which was sitting at home, smiling, and having children. And you have to see that Diana essentially epitomised the collision between the traditions of the royal family, where royal wives were supposed to say very little and to be docile, and an emerging sense in the 1980s and even more so of the 1990s, that women were not prepared just to shut up and be spoken to and to sit and smile, but to actually have their own identities and their own brands. Camilla Parker Bowles was the great love of Charles's life, and he met her in the 1970s, and she was a debutante. She was not from the highest aristocratic background, but she was a sort of comfortable country gentry background. She wasn't felt to be suitable as a wife for him precisely for this reason. I mean, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, felt that one of the Spencer daughters was far more suitable. And so you can see that if, he, if Charles had been allowed to marry Camilla, when he wanted to marry Camilla, the whole trajectory of the royal family would have been entirely different because they got on very well, they shared a similar sense of humour, similar interests, they obviously found each other very attractive. And this was, I think, one of the tragedies of the, the last day royal family that Charles was simply not allowed to marry the woman he wanted to because they were having an affair up to, including, and after his marriage. And Diana must have known about it, and that must have been enormously hard for her to have been presented with this marriage that you know is to some extent a sham because your husband's having an affair with another woman. Charles' reaction to Diana's death in August 1997 was absolute horror. I mean, there's no two ways of describing it. The mother of your children's been killed very suddenly. There's no possibility of preparing for it. He was in a state of shock, and I think all of his actions throughout that time have to be seen as Peter Martin Charles at his best, actually. He went to Paris straight away. He was the person who was responsible for bringing her back. He was very much somebody who was lobbying her to be given every single state funeral and all the rest of it against I think his mother's and grandmother's wishes because they saw her as somebody who'd left the royal family and wasn't entitled to this kind of treatment whereas he with half an eye on his public reputation took the argument she is going to, she's the mother of a future king of England she deserves this and I think that you can see I mean we have no idea what their relationship was like after their divorce we don't know for certain if they ever met or what the, what the correspondence was like, if they dealt with each other very much, if they were communicating through third parties. But certainly, I mean, it must have been the most awful shock for him, as it was for everybody else in the country. Well, Charles's marriage to Camilla in 2005 was, it was a civil ceremony rather than a religious ceremony. And it was very much felt, I think, by everybody in the country that they'd finally managed to make each other happy. And I think that if they had been allowed to marry 25 years before, the world would have been a much better place for it. But I think that what had been done so cleverly was that Camilla had been seen during Diana's lifetime as a rather villainous figure, which she really isn't. She's a very charming, very lovely woman. And what happened was this PR campaign you know, a year or so after Diana's death that Camilla and Charles were seen together in public. She was very much acknowledged as his companion. And eventually after, I mean, it was quite a long time. I mean, it was eight years between Diana's death and their marriage. I mean, he could not be accused of rushing into it. The, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty. And she also saw her dedication to Charles because she... She so helps him, and he wants her at his side, and she will be at his side, so she's got, she's almost in a queen mother type of role. You know, queen mother was there for her husband in his weaker moments, and I think Camilla will be there for Charles. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. 
It's very happy news, and when the Cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole Government. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. If you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Can I say you can have a place. Congratulations. How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just all right. I'm just, I'm just coming down to work. Did you get down on one knee to propose? <laughs> what else? Another picture of us. The king's relationship with his wife is is fantastic. They are the best of friends. There is no question of that. I've, I've witnessed that. They're the best of friends. They're a team. They work well together. They support each other. They laugh together. It's it's wonderful to to see and and to have been part of, to be part of that. You know, to witness that. I remember when the engagement was announced, I was actually with the King in the, in the morning, uh, when obviously it was Prince of Wales at that point, and I was with him. And he went off to, I think, to London. And I went to the staff room and it said that the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall were going to be getting married. And I was completely shocked because I had no idea, as did everyone else that was around that, that day. So it was a closely guarded secret. But I was equally happy because I, I, uh, I adored Mrs. Packer Bowles, I got on really well with her, and I was excited about it. And then I got the, the phone call, I think it was about a few months later, all the invitations started arriving for the wedding, and I, was, I, didn't, I, I hadn't qualified, I hadn't been there long enough, you had to be there a year. And then I got a phone call from, uh, from London, from one of the, the team, uh, senior members of the team, to say that the, the Prince and the Duchess would personally invite me as their guest because I hadn't been there long enough to go as a staff member, so they would invite me as a, uh, as a guest. They wanted to personally invite me. And I was so, I couldn't believe it. I, I, remember the, I remember that day so well. I was so excited and put the phone down and I think I was probably phoning my, fr my family and friends so you won't believe it, I'm invited to the wedding. Your Royal Highness, uh, mm -hmm. eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you, you are you, feeling? Heard how in particular you? <laughs> Princess William and Harry are feeling mm. at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy. Very pleased. Be a good day. Prince yeah. Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. Uh -huh. Prince anything. William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. The one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. <laughs> the wedding was amazing. We went to the wedding uh, 9th of April uh, 2005. It was an amazing day. It was at Windsor Castle. Uh, we were at the castle for the, the, the reception. Queen, Queen did a speech. Um, you had all members of the royal family there. There was a real party atmosphere. It was fun. William and Harry were there. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. Watch William and Harry chase after the, the car as the car drives off with the, the Prince of Wales and Dutch Kong was so much fun, really funny. I think they decorated the back of the car and everything. It was, a, it was absolutely wonderful. And, and she's always been a support to him. She's always been absolutely wonderful. So the, the king served the longest apprenticeship, I think, in history as Prince of Wales. And I suppose you might think that he was frustrated, maybe, or 
you get to a point where you want to do the job. And, and from my view, that was never the case. He he enjoyed being Prince of Wales. He did a, an amazing job. They'd never been the Prince of Wales. It had more or less created it into an actual job. And that's what he did. He made it an actual job. I'm delighted to say we've got a new member of our weather team tonight. Uh, let me hand over to him now. Your Highness. Well, it's an unsettled picture as we head towards the end of the week. Uh, this afternoon it'll be cold, wet and windy across most of Scotland. We're under the influence of uh, low pressure and this weather uh, front pushing northwards is bringing cloud and outbreaks of rain. The rain, of course, will be heaviest over the borders and uh, around Edinburgh, where it could lead to difficult conditions on the roads. Uh, in the west, rain will be lighter and patchier. There will maybe a few drier interludes over Dumfries House in Ayrshire. Aha! There'll be snow for the higher ground of the Highlands and Aberdeenshire. The potential for a few flurries over Balmoral. Who the hell wrote this script? Uh, as the afternoon goes on. The best of the drier and brighter weather will, of course, be over the Northern Isles and the far north of the mainland. So, a little hazy sunshine for the Castle of Maine, Caithness. But a cold day everywhere with temperatures of just eight Celsius and a brisk northeasterly wind. Thank God it isn't a bank holiday. <laughs> Well, what, what Charles has done throughout his life is, in addition to his Convention of Royal Responsibilities, he's had a real interest in making a difference in the lives of younger people. And so the major thing he's known for is the Prince's Trust, which is this organisation which specialises in giving out funding to disadvantaged organisations and individuals and trying to make their lives better. And the thing about the Prince's Trust is that it's a brilliant idea. He's had public persona and the ability to actually make it work, and so it's one of those things that even people who don't like the royal family and even people who have Republican sentiments would usually agree that Prince's Trust has been a force for good. And I think that what you can see in Charles is genuine desire to make things better for people. I mean, he genuinely is somebody who has said, I worry about the fate of my subjects. And I think that's true. I think he does. I mean, he doesn't always get it right, but none of us would. And I think that the Prince's Trust and the Prince's Foundation are real concrete steps to actually helping people's lives. So when I, when I created the Prince's Trust in 1976 to help improve the lives of disadvantaged young people, it was because I was so acutely aware of the challenges that they faced. And over the years, some of the um, challenges have changed, but the overall mission uh, of giving people self-confidence, self-esteem and better opportunities remains the same. And in that time, we have helped over one million young people. And I always get, used to get so annoyed that it hadn't got to one million long ago because we had to keep counting people who were still going through the system, even though we were actually helping 50,000 people a year. I thought, I know my maths is bad, <laughs> but... So we've helped over one million young people transform their lives, and the Prince's Trust now works in 18 countries across the Commonwealth and, and beyond. I would like to take this opportunity to say to you, Charles, how proud I am of everything you have accomplished with the Trust and the way you personally have inspired this organisation. It is a very great pleasure for me, therefore, to present a Royal Charter to the Prince's Trust in recognition of its outstanding achievements over nearly a quarter of a century. Led in the job, you know, he, he, he lent the job from his, his, his mother and, and father. The, his education was always about preparing him for the day that he became king. I don't think anyone would ever imagined that he'd been Prince of Wales for as long as he, as he was but it's put me in a really good place of understanding the country and the world we're in today. So I think if you would say to me, is, is he, is he the best man for the job? I think it's safe to say yes, he is, because he has done uh, and an amazing uh, bit of training. And as the Queen once said, famously said that training is everything. At the end of the day, that's the answer to everything. And it's true, it is the answer to everything as that training that her son had has now put him into a job that he can, that he can undertake.
Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. The late Queen and the King were very, very close. Her, her son, she had a, 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 a wonderful relationship with him. Again, a fun relationship, which we all saw. We used to see different events in London when he would suddenly call her mummy and she'd pull a face at him. And, you know, there was a, a, a wonderful relationship. Mummy. <laughs> But, but they respected each other. I mean, he really respected his mother. He respected the fact that she was queen and everything that stood for. I think that probably the shock of the mother's, his mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you, in a way. So I think he, he wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level, which would be really the only way to deal with something of that enormity happening to you. It was very surreal the day after his mother's death to see the king and the queen's concert return to London. It was very surreal, because um, he was returning as a king. It must be the most extraordinary experience to walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace as king, something you've done untold times before as Prince of Wales, mm. and to feel this garment of, this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders, because you start to think to yourself, well, what am I taking on? What is this responsibility? I mean, what does the future hold for me? So Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to. And I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. And so I think that a lot of people found that much more affecting than they were expecting to, because just as the Queen was a kind of grandmother to the nation, he was very explicitly offering himself as a substitute. And I think that many people who wouldn't expect that they were going to be moved by it were moved by it. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service, I renew to you all today. Outside the Royal Court, the state trumpets sound. Before rolling news, the role of this part of the ceremony was to spread the word to a waiting nation. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. God save the king! So the proclamation was quite special because the proclamation's always been, well, part of it is always private. The actual part that you saw outside on the balcony of St James's Palace has been televised or recorded before. 
but what goes on indoors you never see. So the fact we actually got to see him um, actually doing the, the signing and everything was quite was quite special, even if there was one or two little funny moments. But it was quite an important, a historical uh, important moment uh, for him and for us to all be allowed to watch that, which was. I, could, I mean, I was amazed that we got to see it, and and again, it's one of those um, memories. I think that we we'll always, we we'll always have. You know, it was, it was quite special seeing that. My mother's reign was unequalled in its duration, its dedication, and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. The proclamation of King Charles was something that, that took place just after his announcement as king, and if something that was announced in every major city and every major town in Britain, and something that, because it hadn't happened in so long, it hadn't happened since the 1950s, there was a real interest in it, because people hadn't seen a proclamation before, but of course now they are seeing this man being proclaimed king, which is, again, it's something that's been going on for centuries, but it's still got a hugely symbolic role that we are seeing before our very eyes, the reassertion of a monarchy, the reassertion of kingship, because not a lot of people alive today are going to remember King George VI, his grandfather. So having a king again is really quite a novelty. King Charles III played at his mother's funeral was very much head of the family and also king of the nation. And I'm sure it was quite a difficult time, mainly because you know the eyes of the world are watching you. It's not a private thing at all when he's aware of that. Everything he does, every, every action, every tear, everything has been watched and listened to and and disgust. Well, Charles was obviously responsible for making sure that the, fu that the funeral went as smoothly as it did, because he was obviously the focus of attention. He was the person that most people were looking at in terms of how it was going to be for him. And he's somebody who I think was on the day, he walked behind the coffin, he was very much, you know, the, the focus of public interest, the focus of public attention. And he did everything exceptionally well. I mean, the funeral was very well organised. It had been, of course, organised. It had been planned for years, but it went off without a hitch, and Charles's involvement in that has to be seen as testament to the fact that everything worked well. There was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles.
must have been a very strange experience because you hear this song, which you've heard a million times before, when it's about your mother and God save the Queen, and it's about the King and it's about you, and it must have been a very extraordinarily cathartic experience in a lot of regards, but also an overwhelming one. I don't think, I know you'll be a good king. You'll be a caring king, a compassionate king. You'll be a king for the people. Well, I always thought that Charles would make a wonderful king because he cares so much. He cares about his country. He cares about its heritage. He cares about the planet. And he cares about the people. And I think that he, that's really the attributes you need for a king he is perfect. I suspect that Charles will be a modernising monarch. I suspect that he'll be somebody who tries to fulfil his own interests. And so far he's been popular, so far you look at all the polls and there seems to be general approval for what he's doing. But he's still very much of a honeymoon period. I mean, we're not going to see yet, for quite a while, as to how he really is as king. I mean, he's only been king a matter of a few months. He has his flaws, but everybody knows them. His flaws are, don't come as a surprise. But with Camilla at his side, I think he is going to be uh, wonderful and compassionate and understanding and all the things that he needs to be. What well, do you think I, about Lady Diana? Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And, I mean, great fun. Mm. And bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but did it cross either of your minds that um, in three years' time you would be announcing your engagement, thinking of being not married? No. no. Not, not at all. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but heavier is the burden of being next in line. I think that probably the shock of the mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king, it, it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you in a way. So I think he, he wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level. The British royal family is built on the traditional duty until death. For every heir to the throne, there is a spare. I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. Charles knew he'd become king, following in his mother's footsteps, leaving his sister Anne behind. Despite their close childhood bond, becoming the reigning monarch would definitely divide the pair. Unlike his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles always knew he would one day become king. Becoming heir apparent at just three years old, Charles has become the oldest and longest surviving heir apparent in British history, and the longest serving Prince of Wales, having held the title since 1958. In his own way, he has defined the role of the heir apparent. He has been called a visionary in his creative and forward-thinking ideas, with his passions for the environment, architecture, and alternative medicine. 
Charles is president or patron to over 400 charities and organizations, and is known as one of the most hard-working royals, alongside his sister, Anne, Princess Royal. The Prince of Wales has had a life with challenges. Well, he was a very studious child. I mean, he was somebody who was quite unlike Prince Philip, who was a much more boisterous character. He was unlike his mother as well. Who, from, his mother was somebody who was very serious from a very young age, and Charles, I think, inherited this seriousness. But what he had, which she didn't have, was a real interest in learning, a real interest in books and things like that. This is seen as quite anomalous because members of the royal family are not traditionally seen as intellectuals, but Charles, I think, was seen as somebody who had intellectual ideas and interests, possibly inculcated in him from his nannies from a very young age. Well, Queen Elizabeth was a very dutiful mother, and if you think that she, she, she became queen age 25, she had, you know, Prince Charles was, I think, he was four. Nelly, and, and Princess Sam is only, she was born in 1950, and she was only th just three when, she, when the Queen was crowned. So basically her children were taken away from her. She just didn't have time to be with them. Uh, so she would see them in the morning, you know, for 15 minutes, and she would see them at night for half an hour. But again, you have to judge it by the lords of the time. That was how aristocratic When the coronation took place in 1953, it was quite interesting because Charles was obviously just about old enough to be out of the and to have an understanding of what was going on and what the decisions were and what did. And I suspect that for a very young boy, it would have been an overwhelming experience of the pageantry and the noise that she had not been but it also been, probably by the back of his mind, this full percolation about, it's going to be me one day, this is all going to happen for me. It was a three hour ceremony. It was, everybody recalls, the coldest June day that had ever happened. And it was pouring with rain. And people, you know, there, there was, it, it, if you go back, this is 1953. So the ceremony itself was very, very serious and very religious and very dramatic. And it's impossible to speculate exactly how it felt because we have no record because we have some time right down how much he remembers exactly how it was. But certainly, it must have been a sense of absolutely terrifying pressure being put on you as, as a young child to see all this at such a young age and to think one day, unless something horrible happens or unexpected, this will all be for me as well. Well, obviously he was the eldest sibling of four. And I think it's fair to say that because he was the first sibling and because he was going to be Prince of Wales and then eventually he was going to become king, there was always a sense that he was the one who was given the most attention and the most focus. So I think this was something that he, on the one hand, he thrived on, because who wouldn't thrive in a situation where you're always told that you're the most important one. The young prince suffered from bullying at school and bouts of homesickness as he was sent to Gordonstown in Scotland, the alma mater of his father, Prince Philip. A school his father had hoped would make a man out of Charles and instill in him the qualities required in a young man who would one day be king. Well, Charles was sent to public school in Scotland at Gordonstown, which is an infamously tough school where essentially the attitude is spare the role and spoil the child. It made Charles embittered, it made him, I think, somebody quite closed in terms of his emotions because he had to keep so much to himself. And he actually thought that Gordonstown would be good for Charles because it was up in the north of Scotland, away from the press, and it was, you know, it was meant to be wonderful outdoor life and, and, and you know, great emphasis was placed upon the training of the mind as well as the training of the brain. And Philip thought it would be perfect. I think the Queen and the Queen Mother probably thought that it, he would be, being such a sensitive young man, he probably would have been better to go to Eton. Prince Philip wanted his son to be uh, an image of himself. He wanted him to be macho and he wanted him to be sporty and he wanted him to have a sort of very strong personality. Well, Charles wasn't like that at all. He was very timid. He wasn't particularly sporty. He, 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 you know, he was a little awkward. 
and he wasn't really the son that Philip hoped he'd have. So as Charles grew, their relationship was, just didn't work. It was quite common before Charles for monarchs to go up to Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, Edward, Ed VIII, when he was Prince of Wales, went to Magdalen College, Oxford. But most people went to universities simply to acquire a, kind of a, a tick box, whereas Charles actually went to Cambridge with the intention of studying. He was the first member of the royal family to have actually gone to university with the intention of doing a three-year course and having a degree. But he had a very good time at Cambridge because I think after the privations of prep school and boarding school, he found people he was comfortable with, he found an academic environment that he enjoyed, and he managed to act a lot as well. So I think you can say that Cambridge was in many respects the making of, of, of Prince Charles, and then of course when he became King Charles, he still convinced some of these were a very strong links to his old university, and he got a 2-2 in history in the end, which actually, for somebody who came from a non-academic background, was quite an achievement. Uh, I'm letting out a little slack, a little slack now. Yes, taking up the strain, taking up the strain. This is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's very, very large indeed. I, I, I... Challenges have also arisen from the media reporting, focused on the ups and downs of Charles's personal and romantic life. His days as the most eligible bachelor prince saw great speculation about his future wife. The eventual marriage to Lady Diana Spencer was just the fairy tale the world had been waiting for, a dashing prince with his blushing bride. Although Charles had been Prince of Wales for some years, it wasn't until the 1st of July 1969 that the Queen officially invested in him. Before the ceremony, Charles had left Cambridge University to spend a term at the University College of Wales at Aberystwyth. During his tenure in Wales, he spent his time learning about Welsh history and culture and learning to speak the language. Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, is one of the hardest working members of the British royal family. Known for her no-nonsense attitude, the princess has a very well-deserved reputation for hard work, commitment to her work, and charitable causes. Her brother's role was predestined, but hers was not, and she has spent many decades finding that role and redefining the meaning in her work. Although Princess Anne plays a vital part in the most famous family in the world, her story is less often told in the media. She may be the most hard-working member of the British royal family, but she isn't necessarily the most well-known. In recent years, however, a wave of popularity for the princess has developed following the Netflix series The Crown airing. Erin Doherty, who plays the princess, revealed her enthusiastic and genuine appreciation and fascination for Princess Anne and her work. Has it changed your perceptions of the royals, your perception of Princess Anne? I mean, I honest, honestly, I didn't really know anything about her, so I kind of got the call and I was like, okay, cool. And then I kind of went away and was like, oh wow, this is, she's a real deal. She's this kind of royal rock star. Love her. I think she's brilliant. <laughs> I just think she's honest right. and she's just, just has no time for, she just, just doesn't want to waste any time like lying or pretending that she feels a certain way, especially when I think there's so many, there's such a kind of politeness that you have to abide by within her family that I think when it comes to her personal life, she's so strictly the opposite because she has no time for it, yeah. which is brilliant. I just think she's great. Princess Anne is the only daughter of the Queen and Prince Philip, born only a couple of years after her brother Prince Charles on the 15th of August, 1950. As her two younger brothers, Princes Andrew and Edward, were born several years later, Charles and Anne shared a close bond growing up. At that time, the royal family's life was blessed, with summer and Christmas holidays spent in Balmoral and Sandringham, laying the foundations for Princess Anne's love 
of horseback riding. Many idyllic times were spent playing with her older brother and roaming free in the country estates. The princess had a secure and happy childhood. Princess Anne is said to have had an incredibly close emotional bond with her father, Prince Philip. He admired her for her challenging and resilient nature. Some reporters have even said Princess Anne was Philip's favorite son. They had a lot in common, similar in their pragmatic approach to life and their strength of character, whilst not being adverse to expressing a strong opinion. Charles and Anne shared a governess, Catherine Peebles, for their early education. Still, by 1963, Anne was keen to move on to the outside world, to a boarding school, and she was enrolled at Benedon School, a historic house in the beautiful Kent countryside, the Garden of England. And what's your, your, your personal reaction to having the princess come here? I think it is a very great honor for us and I hope a great opportunity. May I ask you finally about your own feelings on discipline? Suppose a, a girl does something that's against the rules, what, what happens to her? It depends what the, the misdemeanor happens to be. We deal with such misdemeanors ad hoc, usually a talking to in the right way is all that is necessary. Otherwise, we deal with it according to what it is. Have you ever expelled a girl? Never so far. The princess has been vocal about the benefits of a boarding school education. And whilst acknowledging that some students may not enjoy the experience, she felt it was the right thing for her. In June 1987, the Queen bestowed the title upon her daughter, Anne, the Princess Royal. Truth is, you know, there's, there's really only you and them. And that requires an awful lot of concentration. <laughs> um, there are certain advantages in being lost in a class of... Were you nervous? Uh, Were you nervous about going to public school? No, I think I did better? actually rather look, quite look forward to it in many ways. And how, how did they treat you? Was there any bullying down? I imagine there wasn't really, knowing you. Or at least, <laughs> or at least being aware of you. I wasn't that big a girl. Well, <laughs> Although the title is honorary, it is the highest honor that may be given to a female member of the royal family. So it was a very significant moment for the Queen to publicly recognize the immense dedication Anne had been applying to her role as a working member of the royal family. Being a young, beautiful princess and daughter to the queen made Princess Anne a very eligible young lady. As with her brother, Prince Charles, there was great speculation as to whom she would marry, although the pressure was relatively low, as her children in all likelihood would not end up as the future king or queen. A shared interest in equestrian sports brought Anne together with her first husband, Captain Mark Phillips. The engagement was announced on the 29th of May, 1973. In a peek behind the curtain, the royal couple sat down for an interview. Why have you kept a bay in the wedding service? Well, for that reason, I think it's in the service. And perhaps because I'm rather an old-fashioned girl. And, um... <laughs> As, as the, the dean said the other day, the, the um, consensus that says obey, and, and I have to say worship, so I think so. Pays money, takes a choice. Would you even um, 
well, I suppose after badminton. But um, can't speak for him or me, really. Mr. Phillips, uh, let me throw that one at you. Yes, it was after badminton that we decided really. Has it been a great strain keeping it secret and indeed keeping it away from people like ourselves? <laughs> I think it has, yes, it became rather a strain. Yeah. You seem on the surface to be a, a very shy person. It's not every day one proposes to a princess. Did it require a lot of courage to propose? I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the, the fact that um, the, girl, the girl in question is a princess maybe it makes any difference at all. I think it was. I think if you get married to somebody, it's a very, very personal thing, and the two of you just feel it, and, and it's a completely natural thing. I think you've got to be brave to propose to anybody, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> but I, think I mean, indeed, it, 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 perhaps it becomes relatively more important. But I rather hope that, I mean, every time he spoke to me or took me out, that he didn't actually think of me as a princess. Do you think you'll make a good housewife? I mean, can you cook, for example? Well, it's hardly up to me to say that. Um, Cooks can be eggs, <laughs> recommend this. Yes, I mean, I've done a bit of cooking my time. Would you like to cook Captain Phillips' breakfast before he goes off to work, for example? I can manage that. It's easy. Especially when he's eventing, because he's not going to get more than a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> when you were a teenager, did you have any idea of the sort of girl that you would like to marry? No, I... I <laughs> no, I didn't know. I, I, I wasn't very clever with, with, with girls, I don't think, when I no, was a teenager. I, d I definitely was a bit um, not very good, not very successful, should I say. Well, if you had not met a man whom you wanted to marry, do you think you would have married out of a sense of duty? No way. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you know. Heavens, no. Princess Anne married Captain Mark Phillips on the 14th of November, 1973, at Westminster Abbey. It is thought that the Queen offered Mark a royal title, but he turned it down, preferring to keep Captain as his title. Mark Anthony Peter, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her as long as ye both shall live? I will. Anne Elizabeth Alice Louise, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep the only unto him so long as ye both shall live? I will. I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As she was the first of the Queen's children to marry, it was indeed a very special day. Around 500 million viewers were estimated to have watched it on television. It also happened to be the 25th birthday of her brother, Prince Charles. Last coach on the last stage of its journey through the forecourt and right into the centre courtyard of the palace. This really is coming home for the moment. Palace ready must be home for all. And it comes into that central courtyard. We're looking at it through the glass window of the grand entrance. That entrance which must be so familiar to many people who've attended the garden party. Two postillions first, now the coach itself, four grey. There's the red carpet leading up the flight of staircase into the marble hall. Reins in carefully. Footman bow, open the doors, and in Mark Phillips, and now welcome home, Princess.
The couple's first child, Peter Mark Phillips, was born on the 15th of November, 1977. And young Peter was the first grandchild for the Queen. So an extraordinary moment for Her Majesty and Prince Philip, as it was for Princess Anne and Captain Phillips. With the temperature just above freezing, Princess Anne came out. But instead of stopping on the steps for a moment for the large crowd, as she had promised, she just had a few quick words with the hospital staff. Nurse Zora Ahroff held Paddington Bear, a hospital mascot. Two-day-old Master Phillips was carried out by Sister Delphine Stevens, the midwife who was present at the birth. Well wrapped up against the curl, he was handed to the princess, who, ignoring normal advice, sat with her son in the front seat of the car. And off the couple went to Buckingham Palace for lunch. They'll be staying there until they move to their new home in Gloucestershire. As Mark did not take a title when he married Princess Anne, it was also decided that their children would not receive any royal titles. Anne has said she wished they could have as normal a childhood as possible. Anne and Mark settled into family life with their newborn son, and for the next four years, they did their duty, but focused on family. Their second child, Zara Phillips, was born on the 15th of May, 1981. After the birth of Zara, trouble was slowly brewing in the marriage between Anne and Mark. They were reportedly rarely seen together. The initial spark had worn off, and both were thought to be engaged in extramarital affairs. Subsequently, reports and accusations emerged that Phillips had fathered a love child with a New Zealand art teacher, Heather Tonkin. The couple separated in 1989 and divorced in 1992. Princess Anne went on to marry Sir Timothy Lawrence, who happened to be a query to the Queen from 1986 to 1989. They remain contentedly married, sharing their passions and hobbies, but with a keen eye on their royal duties and responsibilities. I think with a family generally fought with Charles, that he shouldn't marry before he was 30, that he should date as many people as he could and see what came of that. And on the one hand, he wasn't necessarily the most outgoing of men, he wasn't necessarily somebody who was going to be a lady killer, but on the other he was Prince of Wales, there was no shortage of people who would have married him. He met Lady Diana Spencer in 1977 because he'd actually been dating her elder sister Sarah for a while. When he first met Diana, she was 16. And it was an unequal relationship because she was still a girl, but there was obviously a spark between them, a spark of interest. And of course at this stage, Charles was still seeing Camilla Shand, who later became Camilla Parker Bowles. So I think it's fair to say that on the one hand, the relationship with Diana was not necessarily an obvious love match from the beginning, but on the other hand, there was very much an, in an interest on both sides. And she was somebody, perhaps because of her youth, who was not phased by responsibilities that she'd have to take on if she became Princess of Wales. In February 1981, Charles and Diana announced their engagement and appeared in an interview that would go down in history. When the reporter asked if the couple were in love, Diana replied, of course. Charles added, whatever in love means, and there he planted the seed of doubt. Difficult to find the right sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and unhappy. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> so. 
Well, it obviously, means, obviously means two very happy people. Yes. 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 Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Okay. Charles's whatever love means is, I think, an attempt on his part to try and say, that's a ridiculous question, why are you asking me that? I'm not interested in responding to it. However, it was the worst possible thing he could have said because for decades afterwards, that has been taken to mean he doesn't love Diana, he's doing this because he feels he has to, he's been forced into it, he couldn't care less, she could be anyone. And I think that a lot of the public ill will towards Charles comes about because it's felt he wasn't enough with Diana. And that response, I think, has led to a lot of it. As we now know, Charles and Diana's marriage was unsuccessful. Whilst they built a family unit together with sons William and Harry, the relationship between Charles and Diana was not destined to last. Charles later rekindled an old spark with former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles. Much to the dismay and disapproval of royal courtiers, But they went on to marry, and the public accepted their partnership. Well, Charles's marriage to Camilla in 2005 was, it was a civil ceremony rather than a religious ceremony. And it was very much felt, I think, by everybody in the country that they'd finally managed to make each other happy. And I think that if they had been allowed to marry 25 years before, the world would have been a much better place for it. But I think that what had been done so cleverly was that Camilla had been seen during Diana's lifetime as a rather villainous figure, which she really isn't. She's a very charming, very lovely woman. And what happened was this the PR campaign, you know, a year or so after Diana's death, that Camilla and Charles were seen together in public. She was very much acknowledged as his companion. And eventually after, I mean, it was quite a long time. I mean, it was eight years between Diana's death and their marriage. I mean, he could not be accused of rushing into it. The, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty and she also saw her dedication to Charles because she she so helps him and he wants her at his side and she will be at his side so she's got she's almost in a queen mother type of role you know queen mother was there for her husband in his weaker moments and I think Camilla will be there for Charles when it came to his own family Diana was well known to be a very hands-on mother, but Charles was a supportive parent too. William and Harry have praised their father publicly, and he has clearly set a strong example of the importance of hard work and generosity to others. After Diana's death, Charles had to step up and take more responsibility for William and Harry. Though the young princes were growing up, and becoming more independent, it was undoubtedly challenging for them both. As the Prince of Wales, Charles undertook official duties on behalf of the Queen. He sponsors the Prince's charities and is a patron, president or member of over 400 other charities and organisations. Anne entered public life at 18 and continued serving as a working royal. Involved in upwards of 300 different charity organisations, Anne is considered the busiest royal family member. The hardest working royal is a title she often receives, battling it out with her brother Charles, who has always attended the most engagements. The monarch is the head of the armed forces, and it has always been a great tradition of the royal family that every member should engage in active service and lead by example, playing more than just a symbolic role. The Queen was the first female member of the royal family to serve full-time on active service as a member of the ATS during World War II. Is being treated just like any other trainee. 
Now visited by her parents and sister Margaret Rose at a training station in southern England, she shows them she knows a fan belt from a spark plug, all right, and isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Her father gave her an officer's commission early in March. Papa and Mama seem to approve, too. Daughter is the first woman member of the royal family to join the services full time. Prince Philip II was an active member of the Royal Navy during World War II. So for Charles, it was an essential next step for him as heir to the throne and future head of the armed forces. While studying at Cambridge University, Charles received flying lessons from the RAF. He went on to RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire to train as a jet pilot, with his passing out parade in September 1971. Like his great-grandfathers, his grandfather and his father, he pursued a naval career, taking a six-week course at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. Charles served on the guided missile destroyer HMS Norfolk, and then on two frigates, the HMS Minerva from 1972 to 1973 and the HMS Jupiter in 1974. In steaming heat, Prince Charles's frigate, HMS Minerva, edged her way into Nassau Harbour. A few minutes before, he had formally ended his duties as one of the ship's navigation officers and taken on the role again of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, with his personal standard broken from the mast. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. To get to Rawson's place, where the welcome speeches would be made, the prince walked at speed through an aisle of shouting, yelling Bahamians, with security men running in front to clear a path for him. If it was all a bit confused, the prince showed no sign of being put out by it. The speeches were from a dais placed in front of the old Nassau landmark, the statue of the prince's great-great-great-grandmother, and were brief to the relief of those in full dress with the temperature in the 90s. It will be five days of ceremonial engagements before Prince Charles rejoins Minerva next Wednesday for two more months of Caribbean patrol as a naval lieutenant. One of Princess Anne's great passions, just like her mother, is horses. But the ambitious princess furthered her passion, taking on an equestrian career alongside her royal duties. Influenced by her father, who excelled at polo and had a keen appetite for competition, it was in the royal blood to succeed at equine sports. At a farm near Windsor today, as with almost every other day since she came back from the Far East, Princess Anne has been riding with Doublet, preparing for the badminton horse trials in April and in the long term, if that goes well, selection for the Munich Olympics in the summer. The princess is a specialist in the tough three-day event that takes in a dressage with its 30 carefully prepared movements, 18 miles of cross-country riding, and on the last day, arena show jumping. After a layoff through the royal tour in Thailand and Malaysia, the princess is working back to fitness and accepting no more official engagements other than those already agreed to. The young princess began competing at 11 years old, winning a jumping event held at Windsor Park. She continued to ride during her school years at Benedon. Her fearless approach to riding and the wild side of her character saw her succeed and take several falls, leaving her with more broken bones than most people see in a lifetime. Thank you. 
the business, Princess Anne has a reputation of being a good competitor with a lot of endurance and a dislike of not winning. Mrs. Oliver feels that she's managed to help boost her confidence. For Princess Anne to get to the Olympics, she has to do well at badminton, get on the team shortlist, and then hold her form through the summer to the final trials only three weeks before the games start. The chairman of the selectors points out that she is by no means an automatic choice in an event in which Britain is traditionally strong. But as European champion, if she holds her form this year, she stands more than a good chance of getting into the team of four. By Olympic standards, the princess has reached the top very quickly, and Alison Oliver has few doubts about her ability to stand up to the competition and the strain of the Munich stadiums if she is chosen to go. On the 8th of September 2022, Charles's life would change forever. At the moment of his mother's death, the Prince of Wales became King Charles III. The extraordinary reign of Queen Elizabeth II ended, and the day he had spent a lifetime preparing for had arrived. A moment he would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Buckingham Palace announced that the Queen was under medical supervision and one by one members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. Charles and Anne returned to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second significant Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. Broadcasters announced her death and said the King and Queen would return to London the following day. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy, and following his mother's example, Charles stepped into his duties as king. I think that probably the shock of the mother's, his mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king, it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you in a way. So I think he, he wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level, which would be really the only way to deal with something of that enormity happening to you. On Saturday, the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace. It was time to proclaim the new king. For the first time in history, this historic ceremony was filmed. The Privy Council proclaimed His Majesty as King Charles III. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. The late Queen and the King were very, very close. Her, her son, she had a, 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 a wonderful relationship with him. Again, a fun relationship, which we all saw. We used to see different events in London when he would suddenly call her mummy and she'd pull a face at him and you know there was a, a, a wonderful relationship. Mummy. <laughs> but but they respected each other. I mean he really respected 
his mother. He respected the fact that she was queen and everything that stood for. Outside the royal court, the state trumpets sound. Before rolling news, the role of this part of the ceremony was to spread the word to a waiting nation. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. Charles made a personal declaration, referencing his mother's reign. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. So the proclamation was quite special because the proclamation's always been, well, part of it is always private. The actual part that you saw outside on the balcony of St James's Palace has been televised or recorded before. But what goes on indoors, you never see. So the fact we actually got to see him um, actually doing the, the signing and everything was quite, was quite special. Even if there was one or two little funny moments, but it was quite an important, a historical uh, important moment uh, for him and for us to all be allowed to watch that, which was, I, could, I mean, I was amazed that we got to see it. And, and again, it's one of those um, memories, I think, that we'll always, we'll always have. You know, it, was, it was quite special seeing that. In the days following his mother's death, Charles visited different nations. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles made himself very visible, just like his mother did. He met with people waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state, and visited people across the country who were grieving too. Charles, along with his brothers and sisters, solemnly held a vigil at St. Giles's Cathedral and later at Westminster Hall, a touching and challenging moment for the siblings. On the 19th of September, Charles played an essential part in the late Queen's funeral. King Charles walked behind the coffin alongside his siblings and sons, a poignant moment. It must be the most extraordinary experience to walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace as king, something you've done untold times before as Prince of Wales, and to feel this garment of this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders, because you start to think to yourself, well, what am I taking on? What is this responsibility? I mean, what does the future hold for me? So Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to, and I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion for sovereign never wavered. Through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. 
Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. And so I think that a lot of people found that much more affecting than we were expecting to, because just as the Queen was a kind of grandmother to the nation, he was very explicitly offering himself as a substitute. And I think that many people who wouldn't expect to be moved by it were moved by it. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. Arriving at St George's Chapel, a minor funeral service commenced. The chorus sang, God save the King, for the first time. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. He is the Sovereign. He is the King. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. On May the 6th, the first coronation in 70 years will occur. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, the pomp and tradition will still feature. Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. The proclamation of King Charles was something that took place just after his announcement as king, and it's something that was announced in every major city and every major town in Britain, and something that, because it hadn't happened in so long, it hadn't happened since the 1950s, there was a real interest in it, because people hadn't seen a proclamation before, but of course now they are seeing this man being proclaimed king, which is, again, it's something that's been going on for centuries, but it's still got a hugely symbolic role that we are seeing before our very eyes, the reassertion of monarchy, the reassertion of kingship, because not a lot of people alive today are going to remember King George VI, his grandfather. So having a king again is really quite a novelty. The role King Charles III played at his mother's funeral was very much head of the family and also king of the nation. And I'm sure it was quite a difficult time, mainly because, you know, the eyes of the world are watching you. It's not a private thing at all, and he's, he's aware of that. Everything he does, every every action, every tear, everything has been watched and listened to and, and discussed. Well, Charles was obviously responsible for making sure that the, fun that the funeral went as smoothly as it did, because he was obviously the focus of attention. He was the person that most people were looking at in terms of how it was going to be for him. And he's somebody who I think was on the day, he walked behind the coffin, he was very much, you know, the, the focus of public interest, the focus of public attention. And he did everything exceptionally well. I mean, the funeral was very well organised. It had been, of course, organised. It had been planned for years, but it went off without a hitch, and Charles's involvement in that has to be seen as testament to the fact that everything worked well. There was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The 
first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. It must have been a very strange experience because you hear this song that you've, that you've heard a million times before. I mean, it's about your mother, and God Save the Queen. And it's about the king, it's about you. It must have been a very extraordinarily cathartic experience in lots of regards, but also an overwhelming one. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he can no longer speak so freely about his passions and opinions. He instead has to remain unbiased. King Charles has taken on his responsibilities with ease, dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents and state officials, and attending various engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride. You must remember that the princess lived within the British royal family for 15 years. She knew exactly what went on within it. She knew how things were done. She was at times extraordinarily unhappy and her husband did nothing. She felt very wretched much of the time. But at the same time, she was a mother and she had to maintain a brave face for her children. She didn't want them too affected by her evident distress at finding herself in a loveless marriage with a husband who was carrying on an affair and not even bothering to hide it from him. Often the most disturbing feature of mental illness is just how little it takes for people who seemed otherwise fine to move off their normal behavior before they're labeled crazy or unstable. Even to try to understand just how trapped they feel when in the depths of depression can help enormously. She's, can't you see me looking from side to side? Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. And she was there. She was even at my wedding. So this spectre was always there in the princess's life. She found her soulmate. Her soulmate was Hasnut Khan, the heart surgeon, not Dodi Al Fayed. Hasnut Khan had been the princess's companion for over two years. Nobody knew about Hasnut Khan. That was not played out on the world stage. Whereas, after they'd broken up, the princess was invited to the south of France by the Mohammed Al Fayeds. She met Dodi Al-Fayed. Did you know that the romance of 
The princess and Dodi al Fayed was 30 days from beginning to end. It only lasted 30 days. That was not the love of her life. That was not the man she was going to marry. That's all fabrication. I spoke to her regularly when she was away. Have you seen Hasnet? I said, yes, I went for a drink with him last night. What does he think of my, me being here in the south of France with Dodé al -Fayed? Well, he's not too pleased. Has he seen the pictures in the papers? Yes, he has, because you know his routine. You know every morning he goes to the corner shop and sees the press. You know that. And I know that's what you're doing. You're manipulating the world's media by having these pictures taken to show Hasnet who you're with. It's sort of a... Are you jealous? I said to the princess, when are you coming home? I'm coming home on Sunday, Paul. I'm just bored. I'm on this boat. It's freezing cold downstairs. It's boiling hot on deck. I'm sending these pictures out and nobody's coming back to me. I'm having no communication. I need to come home. But the only way home is on the Harrods jet. The only way I can get home is via Paris because Dodie has to go to Paris to do some business for his father. How is he with you? Oh, he's very spoiling. He's very generous, the princess said. He's given me a necklace, some earrings. He's given me a watch. I said, you know what's coming next, don't you? He's gonna give you a ring. Do you think so? Oh, yes. He'll give you a ring. But remember, when he gives it to you, put it on the fourth finger of your right hand. Oh, yes. Fourth finger, right hand. I can hear her saying it. Fourth finger, right hand. Yes, that's the thing to do. I'll do that. You always know what to do. That's exactly what I'll do. So if there was a ring, which I very much doubt, it would have been placed on the fourth finger of the right hand. Look at the footage of the princess on that fatal night. Look at her going down in the elevator. Is that a woman in love? I don't think so. I knew the princess inside and out. That is not a woman with the man she's about to become engaged to or the man she wants to marry. That's a woman going out into the Paris night and she doesn't want to. Fate in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong man. That tragic accident should never have happened, but that's what it must be. It must be an accident. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. Her companion, the Harrods heir, Dodi Al Fayed, has been killed. The driver of the princess's car is also understood to be dead. The accident happened at just after midnight in the west of the city near the Alma Bridge. So early Sunday morning, I arrived in Paris and was taken straight by the British ambassador, taken to the hospital. And I remember going into the elevator and the elevator doors opening on the first floor and looking down the corridor and seeing two gendarmes stood outside of a door. And I thought, that's where she is. So I was led not to that room, but to the room next door, where I waited for a while with an Angl Anglican priest and a, and a Roman Catholic priest. Nurse Humbert was the French nurse on duty. Small, petite nurse that could only speak broken English. And she came to me and said, Paul, would you like to go in to see the princess? I said, yes, I would. I stared for a while in disbelief. And I watched the fan whirring on the side of the bed table. And as it moved, it moved the princess's hair. And I could see it in her eyelashes moving. And I took her hand and said, I can't. 
to sleep, aren't you? Can it, is there any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Great. Right, but Prince Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> he said we wouldn't have to wait too long. Was he completely off <laughs> Was he? Sorry, I, sorry. Was he completely off beam when he said we wouldn't have to wait too long? February 1981, the waiting was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. The ring was a sapphire surrounded by diamonds. The couple looked happy and relaxed, delighted, like everyone else, that a wedding would take place. She was much too young for him. He was a young person himself, and she was even younger. Can you take us back to when you first met? If um, you can remember. Can you remember yes, when you first met? Yes, yes, certainly can. It was 1977. The Charles came to stay as a friend of my sister Sarah's at, for a shoot. We sort of met in a ploughed field. <laughs> slightly what, previous to that, but I knew. <laughs> and what did, you, what did you think then? What was your instant impression, both of you? What did well, you think I, about Lady Diana? Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly an amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And, I mean, great fun mm. and bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Did it cross either of your minds that um, in three years' time you would be announcing your engagement, thinking of getting married? No. no. I think when you live in the royal family, you're not, well, you're not exposed to the real world, so you grow up much slower, and they, you know, sometimes you think that they have the most childlike sense of humour, and they laugh about very childlike things, but they do because they haven't been out there like all of us. So Charles has been very protected. He's also courted her older sister, of course. Um, Sarah had been a suitor, and on Diana's wedding day, her sister, Sarah, turned to her and said, I thought all this was going to be mine one day, and now it's yours. There was sibling rivalry in the Spencer household. Diana wasn't meant to achieve. The fact that Diana became Princess of Wales, probably future Queen of England, was beyond the Spencer family to comprehend. It wasn't for her to achieve. The brother should have achieved. It was his estate, not Diana's. So there was always some jealousy coming from the Spencers. Prince Charles wasn't always kind to the princess. In fact, sometimes he was quite cruel. I remember one occasion she came downstairs wearing a beautiful black and white Catherine Walker gown. And she said, Charles, I've had it made specially. Do you like it? You look like you belong to the mafia, he said, which cut her down to her knees. And then on one occasion she came down in a tartan dress and said, do you like this one? where you look like a British Caledonian stewardess. It was always undermining, just before an engagement began, so that she would lose her confidence. So it was mental cruelty in a way. I never saw any physical violence. I saw tables being upset. I saw crockery being thrown across a room, but I never saw any physical violence. I think the breaking point was probably in about 87. 
when Charles went up to Scotland for practically the whole summer and Diana stayed down here and I think that she just, I, I mean, they just realised that they were completely unsuited and she was, you know, Charles was very, very miserable, very miserable because he, he, he knew that as a, as a future monarch he really couldn't mark up on his marriage. And um, uh, the thought of what he had done deeply depressed him. So he wasn't a lot of fun to be around. And Diana was, was thinking, you know, I've got to get out of this, but she hadn't really thought it through. So if there was ever a moment, I think it was about, you know, in, in the autumn of 87. That, that, and that's when the press realized that things were really bad. You know, there was a, there was a lot of signs beforehand, but that was when it started to to actually c come out in the press. Do you find it a very daunting experience that uh, yesterday you were a nanny looking after children, um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and and one day you would, all in all likelihood, be queen? It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, I know I can't go wrong. He's there with me. Now, if you watch that, that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? Princess Diana's beaming. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously, means, your own interpretation. Uh, obviously means two very happy people. Yes, well, again, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Big and she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. Charles didn't really know what love was. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. When I joined Buckingham Palace way back in 1976, it was already rumoured that Prince of Wales would be marrying somebody like Princess Mary Astrid or Amanda Natchbull. There were rumours that he would be marrying somebody else. Lady Diana Spencer was never there. There were always suitors around Prince Charles. He was the most eligible bachelor in the world at that time, heir to the throne of England. So he was never short of female companions. I saw him occasionally with the Queen. He'd stay at Buckingham Palace. His suite of rooms were at the palace. He had his own valet. He had his own household. And he was very independent. And really, he was searching for someone who could provide him with an heir and a spare. That was his main priority. He was getting old. And the Queen had said to him, isn't it about time you settled down, Charles? Isn't it about time you made us grandparents? So his time was right when Lady Diana Spencer came into his vision. I remember the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer very well because I was at Buckingham Palace. I was responsible for the top table, which was the bride's table, the bride and groom, and of course the Queen and Prince Philip, and the bridesmaids. So I was waiting for the bride to come back. She'd appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. And then, at the end of a very long red carpeted corridor, I noticed this ball of white racing towards me and I realized it was Princess Diana. She'd rolled her train up into a ball 
tucked it under her arm. She had her slippers in one hand and she was racing down this corridor, lined with windows. And the diamonds of the Spencer family tiara were glinting in the sunshine. And she was racing towards me, just me and her in one corridor. She was like a galleon in full sail. What a picture of hope and happiness and love. She had it all. And that day, I waited the wedding breakfast in the ball supper room, served the queen and the bride, and the bride refused everything. She didn't eat a morsel. And she said to me later, I couldn't eat a thing, Paul. My stomach was in knots. I was just totally wound up by the day, by the excitement, by the spectacle. She says, but you know, the most wonderful thing was walking down the aisle of St. Paul's Cathedral with my father. She says, but did you ever look at the footage of that? I said, I've seen it many times. She says, next time you look at it, watch me. She says, can't you see me looking from side to side? Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. I'm looking for Camilla. And she was there. She was even at my wedding. So this spectre of Camilla was always there in the princess's life. Well, Diana Spencer, as she was, is probably one of the most insecure people I'd ever met. Um, and I think from her insecurities. And she was also a real mixture of being completely naive and yet worldly wise. So she was a, a barrel load of contradictions. I mean, Diana could be several people in one day. And I think one of the reasons that people are so fascinated with her still is that she was a different person with different people. And I, I take that to be part of her insecurity because she wanted to please the person she was talking to. She wanted to tell them what they wanted to hear. And so um, she was always different, so she was always fascinating. very old-fashioned, uh, very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater. And he is also a people pleaser. But he has got a very short temper. If, you know, if he loses his temper, he's then incredibly sorry and full of apologies. So he's, he's basically a very kind, and thoughtful and very sensitive person, but because of who he is and the life that he's led, he is used to getting his own way and he's used to getting his own way quickly. In the early days, Diana's light was small, but he began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And it was a sort of a star is born situation. Prince Charles would say to her, while I married you, I made you a princess. You weren't born royal. I'm the royal. So it would peeve him when on royal visits, people would be shouting on one side of the street, we want Diana, we want Diana. And I think in some interviews, he actually did say, I wish I could split my wife in half to do both sides of the street because they don't actually want me. This is a man who's been born to be king. This is a man who has been treated from the very beginning as a god. 
suddenly being eclipsed by this woman who wasn't very happy. Well, Charles was so used to having all the attention on him, which it had been since he was born, um, he, he didn't like the idea that they walked down the street, say, when they were doing a, a, a royal engagement and the crowd were calling, Diana, Diana. So he felt surplus and didn't really know what to do with himself and made lots of sort of rather pathetic remarks like, there should be two of me, and if I cut myself in half. I mean, he didn't know what to do or say. And, and yes, he, 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 it was a form of, of, of jealousy, yes, it was. The rest of the royal family and the royal household, they treated Diana as if she was just another girl. In fact, they didn't give her much consideration at all. I did notice that one day, going through the drawing room, the old queen mother, she passed the magazine table, and Diana's face was on the front of Hello Magazine or something. And as she walked past the table, she flipped the magazine over onto its backside and carried on walking. That, to me, said, she's not really accepted. They don't like it. She's beginning to outshine even the senior members of the royal family. This is dangerous territory. Well, I think after they got married and they went on their honeymoon, I, I think even then things were starting to unravel a bit because I don't think it, it, it matched what Diana had expected. She had this vision of uh, being like a fairy princess and being carried away into the sunset. But the minute she was married, her husband was off working. I mean, it was... You know, he, he's always been a very hard worker and he was devoted to his duty. And on, on the honeymoon, she was so in love. But he spent a lot of time reading books, which she didn't really quite understand. I think on, on the honeymoon, it was when her bul bulimia, which she was already having a problem with, uh, really took hold. Um, and she just, you know, she was on this e enormous yacht, Britannia, surrounded by like 200 crew, and yet she was on her own and she didn't know how to deal with it. She was too young and too naive, and, and Charles was on the upper deck reading and sunbathing, and she was lonely. Well, I used to say that Diana was a high school dropout and Charles was a university lecturer. I mean, Diana, they were so different, and obviously that can work very well, but she was very, very young, and she'd had no experience of life. And although she'd lived on the Sandringham estate and knew the royal family, she didn't really know the royal family. And unless she didn't really know what it would be like to be married into them, although her, her father, uh, Lord Spencer, had been an equerry to King George VI and was an equerry to the Queen, but. Uh, and he knew how the royal court worked, but Diana didn't. I think she thought it was all going to be sort of wonderful. Um, so she'd been disappointed from the very beginning. And she just, she had this vision of Charles, which wasn't really him at all. I mean, and then she started to find Charles very dull. And he found her stupid. I mean, she had a very quick wit, but she wasn't well read. She wasn't really educated, and Charles was highly educated. And all his friends were much, much older. So he started to dump his friends. Um, and Diana's friends were all much, much younger. And so they started to lead separate lives very, very early on. And then Diana had uh, children very, very quickly. I mean, William was born in 82, and she'd only got married in 81. Um, and she had a very difficult pregnancy with William. So she was, you know, she was getting used to being royal. She was, she was pregnant. She, the, the marriage wasn't quite what she imagined it, but she thought it would all be all right. So she was living on a dream, really. In the summer of 92, a recording of Diana speaking to one of her friends, who actually was her lover, James Gilby, 
appeared in one of the newspapers. The transcript of this recording was unbelievable. Frankie said to me today, she said, I sat next to Nigel Haver down there, and all we could talk about was you. And I said, Frankie, how awful for you? She said, oh, don't worry, the admiration club. And a lot of people talk to her about me, which she can't help. No. Her at all. I tell you, I think on to your coattails. Well, she can't. No, she absolutely can't. I need to make that quite clear. If you want to be like me, you've got to suffer. It was difficult for me to tread the path between Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Now, Diana arrived every weekend with the boys on Friday afternoon and left every Sunday. But someone else occupied that space in between. And I learned to serve two royal mistresses, one Princess of Wales and the other Mrs. Parker Bowles. This was still a secret. I was keeping this secret for both the prince and the princess until, of course, it became intolerable. It was a conversation uh, 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 Charles and Camilla had previously, and it obviously was done by a radio hacker, but it was very intimate, and it was absolutely horrific, actually. And, uh, and I think people thought that Charles is never, can never be king. This is, you know, he, he talks uh, about how, uh, you know, what he would like to be doing to Camilla in a very intimate way, and it's just, it was horrible. Including The Express, The Star and The Sun, said they wouldn't publish the full text. Uh, the press in general is at the centre of a major debate over privacy, with the Calcutt report uh, looming and the controversy over that even today. So we have taken the decision today not to publish the full transcript of the Camilla Gate tapes. But with thousands of copies of the magazine now being faxed around Britain, some editors are uneasy. Those in the know in London and the chattering classes and those with fax machines to Australia can know what's in it, but the rest of the country doesn't. And that reminds me of the 1930s, when a few editors and posh people in the know knew about the abdication crisis, plain folk didn't. Buckingham Palace tonight declined to comment on the contents of the magazine. There's been no comment from Mrs. Parker Bowles. In the past, her husband has dismissed such allegations as rubbish. Well, I think what happened with the Queen was that she sat on the fence, hoping it was all going to get better, which I think is probably what you would do. That's the normal reaction of a mother. You don't want to interfere. But of course, and then Prince Philip was, was saying, little bit, little bit, you've got to do something. And so he was egging her on and she was pulling back because you don't want to interfere in, in other people's lives. But eventually, Diana used to come to the Queen. She'd go and see her, the Queen's page of the presents and say, I've got to see Her Majesty. And, and the page would say, well, I'm, I'm really sorry, um, Your Royal Highness, but she's busy. She's with the Prime Minister or she's with whoever she was with. And Diana would wait until whoever it was left, and then she'd run in, <laughs> which was absolutely unprecedented. And there was the Queen. She'd just been having a meeting with some government minister or some, someone really senior in, a, in another world, not in the royal world and she was probably thinking about it. And then Diana pops through the door crying and saying, Mom, Mom, everybody hates me. You've got to help me, I, you, know, I, you know, hysterical. And nothing in the Queen's life had ever prepared her for, for that, that kind of confrontation. Imagine if you were brought up in this very, very strict world when everybody is also very respectful and there's very little emotion going on. And so the Queen had never, ever had to deal with this. And the royal family really don't have to deal with anything they don't want to deal with emotionally because they've got people around them to say, sorry, can't put you through. Sorry, they're busy. You know, you're protected. Um, so the Queen used to find this really difficult. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes until it became irretrievably broken down. Us both having tried. The rift in their marriage had already been exposed with the publication of a book that went straight to the top of the bestseller list this summer. Diana, her true story, claimed to tell from the inside the tale of a loveless marriage, 
with evidence from some of her closest friends, friends like her former flatmate, Caroline Bartholomew. Its author was Andrew Morton. Well, the Andrew Morton book was a sensation. No one had any idea that Diana was involved with the book at all. And in fact, she even denied that she was at the beginning. But what happened was she decided, she made a decision that she wanted the world, if you like, to know the truth of her marriage. She was just felt it was going to be really cathartic. I, I don't know if she ever regretted it. I think she probably did because it caused so much trouble. But so she decided that Andrew Morton was a nice uh, sort of intermediary to, to, to put these words out. And he was a friend of her friend, Dr. James Colehurst. They played squash together. So she thought, oh, this is, I will tell James, um, uh, and then James can take the tapes to Morton, and that way we'll, we'll never meet. Um, and of course, uh, she, you know, this was planned sometime before the book came out. So the book came out in the summer of 92, but this all took place really uh, at, at the end of 91, the beginning of 92. So, um, and when it was serialized in the Sunday Times before the book came out, I think it was, uh, I know that Prince Charles had the uh, newspaper faxed to him, this is the days of faxes, the night, you know, as soon as it dropped at midnight, the fax was sent through to Highgrove. And I think Diana says that the next morning, I think, at, at breakfast, I mean, he acted like nothing had happened at all. So it was that bad. It was just a freezing atmosphere. We saw Andrew Morton in that report, the author of that book. He's with me now in the studio. Your sources are pretty close to the princess. What have you learned about the timing of this announcement? Well, since September, negotiations have been taking place between the prince and princess about living arrangements, about working arrangements. And the, the timing, of course, has been knocked off balance by the Windsor Castle fire and by the fact that Princess Anne is, is remarrying. But it, it's been really a question of the last few few weeks uh, that people have known that uh, this was going to come out. We're told that divorce is not an option, it is not in the frame. What if two years down the road the princess, for instance, falls in love with another man or Prince Charles wants to marry another woman? It would be, it would be possible. Absolutely. They say this each time there's a, a royal separation and they talk about that the, a divorce is not on the cards. In actual fact, if Diana's a young girl, um, if she falls in love again and wishes to remarry, I see no let or hindrance why she should not divorce. And remember, Diana has always said to her friends that throughout her royal career, I will never become queen. The controversy over the state of the royal marriage took a new turn today when an article claiming to give Prince Charles's side of the story appeared in the Today newspaper. Written by the royal biographer Penny Juna, who knows the prince personally, the article says he feels betrayed by his wife's behaviour. The, the, as soon as the book began to be serialised, I wrote a piece for Today newspaper. I then reviewed the book for Today newspaper, and in both of these I spoke quite strongly in defence of the Prince of Wales, because I felt, just looking at it, that he had been very badly maligned, and unfairly so. I also spoke on radio and television. After one of the radio broadcasts, I was telephoned by one of his friends, who said, I've just listened to you. That was terrific. Thank you. Please keep it up. Please get the message across. You must remember that the princess lived within the British royal family for 15 years. She knew exactly what went on within it. She knew how things were done. She was at times extraordinarily unhappy and her husband did nothing. She felt very wretched much of the time, but at the same time she was a mother and she had to maintain a brave face for her children. She didn't want them too affected by her evident distress at finding herself in a loveless marriage with a husband who was carrying on an affair and not even bothering to hide it from her. The only secret Diana ever kept from me was the Martin Bashir interview for Panorama. I was sent home on a Sunday afternoon. Strange, I thought. Why would she be sending me home? Go and spend some time with your family. I'm doing nothing this afternoon. Don't worry about me. The next morning I came to work, I noticed all the furniture had been moved. Why have you moved the furniture? It's not in the same place. Um, I had a dance class. 
I had to move the furniture out of the way just so that we could exercise. Strange, very strange. She avoided me for the next two days, never spoke to me, and then she told me that she made a recording with Martin Bashir for Panorama. What have you said? Well, I just put the record straight, she said. I think every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path, and I think it's the strength that causes the confusion and the fear. Why is she strong? Where does she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? Something like 31 million people stopped in their tracks on that Monday night and couldn't believe what they were seeing. The Princess of Wales bearing her heart on national television. We couldn't take our eyes away from it. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. I'll put one top that charm. Right. 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 Make that yeah. The guy's got to buy the news kiosk. This guy is so good. Hey, Simon Byrne, what do you think of John Major? <laughs> well, actually, yeah. he's my best friend. Oh. Yeah. Do you think Die, die was worth it? Yeah. Is Die worth 17 million? You can still comment, can't you? I mean, would you pay your wife 17 million if you got divorced? Oh, well, I probably, if I had it, I would, yeah. <laughs> I'm very surprised at that. I thought it was a very peculiar way of doing it. On the face of it, it was rather discourteous to the Queen. But Princess Diana is very good at manipulating the media, and it may well be that she did it like this to show that she could do her own thing and also to give her a stronger bargaining power over the title that she wanted to have and perhaps over the nature of the divorce settlement when it comes. Behind closed gates at Kensington Palace, the princess was said to be deeply upset at making and declaring the decision to end the marriage. It could happen swiftly, meaning a leap year divorce. So as the public read the papers, the royal lawyers set about reading the small print. What has yet to be worked out are the complicated details of a divorce. She's got the house, Kensington Palace, which Prince Charles has always wanted to get back because he's stuck, poor fellow, in St James's Palace. And she has got the children, and obviously there's nothing going to change. She's got the money from Charles to keep up her lifestyle. I think Diana wanted to get married again, and she wanted to have another child. Um, again, I think getting married again probably was a bit of a fantasy, certainly getting married to uh, the doctor that she was in love with, or thought she was in love with, was a fantasy, because it would never have worked out, it couldn't have worked for him. Um, but she did want to get married again, very much so. She didn't want to be single for the rest of her life. She does, and in a way, I think she wanted to find someone that could work with her. In a way that it was what she'd hoped for when she married Prince Charles. Is that, well, a little later in their marriage, when, you know, when things were going well and they were doing things together, she sort of thought, she said to him, you know, we could really, we could really change things together, the power of the two of us together. And that's what she wanted. So she want, she did, I think she wanted to marry someone who, was, who had the same humanitarian outlook as her. Not in a Harry and Meghan kind of way, but in a very simple way. She wasn't going to talk in riddles and she wasn't going to give a lot of speeches about what she was going to do. She was going to get out in the field and do it. On the day of their divorce, they sat down on the sofa together and cried. But I think that might have been Diana's fantasy, because I couldn't work out that they would have even been together at that moment. But at some stage, they obviously felt very sad about it, and, and they talked to each other. And, and Charles was much friendlier with Diana. Now he knew that the nightmare, that she'd actually become unshackled from him. That, that he was able to form a, a, a much more reasonable relationship with her.
Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but heavier is the burden of being next in line. The British royal family is built on the traditional duty until death. For every heir to the throne, there is a spare. I think that probably the shock of the mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king. It, it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you in a way. So I think he. He wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level, which would be really the only way to deal with something of that enormity happening to you. Charles knew he'd become king, following in his mother's footsteps, leaving his sister Anne behind. Despite their close childhood bond, becoming the reigning monarch would definitely divide the pair. I too now solemnly pledge myself, throughout the remaining time God grants me, to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. When one steps up, the other must step back. Unlike his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles always knew he would one day become king. Becoming heir apparent at just three years old, Charles has become the oldest and longest surviving heir apparent in British history, and the longest serving Prince of Wales, having held the title since 1958. In his own way, he has defined the role of the heir apparent. He has been called a visionary in his creative and forward thinking ideas, with his passions for the environment, architecture, and alternative medicine. Charles is president or patron to over 400 charities and organizations, and is known as one of the most hard working royals alongside his sister, Anne, Princess Royal. The Prince of Wales has had a life with challenges. Well, he was a very studious child. I mean, he was somebody who was quite unlike Prince Philip, who was a much more boisterous character. He was unlike his mother as well. Who, from, his mother was somebody who was very serious from a very young age, and Charles, I think, inherited this seriousness, but what he had, which she didn't have, was a real interest in learning and a real interest in books and things like that. This is seen as quite anomalous because members of the royal family are not traditionally seen as intellectuals, but Charles, I think, was seen as somebody who had intellectual ideas and interests possibly inculcated in him from his nannies at a very young age. Well, Queen Elizabeth was a very dutiful mother, and if you think that she, she, she became queen aged 25, she had you know, Prince Charles was, I think, he was four, nearly, and, and Princess Anne was only, well, she was born in 1950, so she was only th just three when, she, when the Queen was crowned. So, basically, her children were taken away from her. She just didn't have time to be with them. Uh, so she would see them in the morning, you know, for 15 minutes, and she would see them at night for half an hour. But... Again, you have to judge it by the moors of the time. That was how aristocratic families worked. When the coronation took place in 1953, it was quite interesting because Charles was obviously just about old enough to be at the coronation and to have an understanding of what was going on in a way that none of his siblings who were currently born did. And I suspect that for a very young boy, it would have been an overwhelming experience, I mean, the pageantry, the noise, the sheer number of people. But there'd also have been, probably by then, at the back of his mind, this thought percolating about, it's going to be me one day, this is all going to happen for me. It was a three-hour ceremony it was, everybody recalls, the coldest June day that had ever happened. And it was pouring with rain. And people, you know, there, there was, if you go back, this is 1953. So the ceremony itself was very, very serious and 
very religious and very dramatic. And it's impossible to speculate exactly how he would have felt because we have no record of his thoughts of a time and I doubt very much he remembers exactly how it was. But certainly it must have been a sense of absolutely terrifying pressure being put on you as a young child to see all this at such a young age and to think one day, unless something horrible happens or unexpected, this will all be for me as well. Well, obviously he was the eldest sibling of four. And I think it's fair to say that because he was the first sibling and because he was going to be Prince of Wales and then eventually he's going to become king, there was always a sense that he was the one who was given the most attention and the most focus. So I think there is something that he, on the one hand, he thrived on, because who wouldn't thrive in a situation where you're always told that you're the most important one? The young prince suffered from bullying at school and bouts of homesickness as he was sent to Gordonstown in Scotland, the alma mater of his father, Prince Philip. A school his father had hoped would make a man out of Charles and instill in him the qualities required in a young man who would one day be king. Well, Charles was sent to public school in Scotland at Gordonston, which is an infamously tough school where essentially the attitude is spare the rod and spoil the child. It made Charles embittered. It made him, I think, somebody quite closed in terms of his emotions because he had to keep so much to himself. And he actually thought that Gordonston would be good for Charles because it was up in the north of Scotland, away from the press. Uh, it was, you know, it was meant to be wonderful outdoor life and 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 you know, great emphasis was placed upon the training of the mind as well as the training of the brain. And Philip thought it would be perfect. I think the queen and the queen mother probably thought that it, he would be, being such a sensitive young man, he probably would have been better to go to Eton. Prince Philip wanted his son to be uh, an image of himself. He wanted him to be macho and he wanted him to be sporty and he wanted him to have a sort of very strong personality. Well, Charles wasn't like that at all. He was very timid. He wasn't particularly sporty. He, 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 you know, he was a little awkward and he wasn't really the son that Philip hoped he'd have. So as Charles grew, their relationship was, just didn't work. It was quite common before Charles for monarchs to go up to Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, Edward, Edward VIII, when he was Prince of Wales, went to Magdalen College, Oxford. But most people went to universities simply to acquire a, kind of a, a tick box, whereas Charles actually went to Cambridge with the intention of studying. He was the first member of the royal family to have actually gone to university with the intention of doing a three-year course and having a degree. But he had a very good time at Cambridge because I think after the privations of prep school and boarding school, he found people he was comfortable with, he found an academic environment that he enjoyed, and he managed to act a lot as well. So I think you can say that Cambridge was in many respects the making of, of, of Prince Charles, and then of course when he became King Charles, he still being somebody who had very strong links to his old university, and he got a 2-2 two -two in history in the end, which actually for somebody who came from a non-academic background was quite an achievement. Uh, I'm letting out a little slack, uh, a little slack now. Uh, yes, uh, taking out the strain, taking out the strain. This is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large run here. It's very, really, very really large indeed. I, I, I... Challenges have also arisen from the media reporting, focused on the ups and downs of Charles's personal and romantic life. His days as the most eligible bachelor prince saw great speculation about his future wife. The eventual marriage to Lady Diana Spencer was just the fairy tale the world had been waiting for, a dashing prince with his blushing bride. Although Charles had been Prince of Wales for some years, it wasn't until the 1st of July 1969 that the Queen officially invested in him. Before the ceremony, Charles had left Cambridge University to spend a term at the University College of Wales at Aberystwyth. During his tenure in Wales, he spent his time learning about Welsh history and culture and learning to speak the language. Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, is one of the hardest working members of the British royal family. Known for her no-nonsense attitude, the princess has a very well-deserved reputation for hard work 
commitment to her work, and charitable causes. Her brother's role was predestined, but hers was not, and she has spent many decades finding that role and redefining the meaning in her work. Although Princess Anne plays a vital part in the most famous family in the world, her story is less often told in the media. She may be the most hard-working member of the British royal family, but she isn't necessarily the most well-known. In recent years, however, a wave of popularity for the princess has developed following the Netflix series The Crown airing. Erin Doherty, who plays the princess, revealed her enthusiastic and genuine appreciation and fascination for Princess Anne and her work. Has it changed your perceptions of the royals, your perception of Princess yeah, Anne? I mean, I honest, honestly, I didn't really know anything about her, so I kind of got the call and I was like, okay, cool. And then I kind of went away and was like, oh, wow, this is, she's a real deal. She's this kind of royal rock star. I love her. I think she's brilliant. <laughs> I just think she's honest right. and she just, just has no time for... She just, just doesn't want to waste any time, like, lying or pretending that she feels a certain way, especially when I think there's so many... There's such a kind of politeness that you have to abide by within her family that I think when it comes to her personal life, she's so strictly the opposite because she has no time for it, yeah. which is brilliant. I just think she's great. Princess Anne is the only daughter of the Queen and Prince Philip, born only a couple of years after her brother Prince Charles on the 15th of August, 1950. As her two younger brothers, Princes Andrew and Edward, were born several years later, Charles and Anne shared a close bond growing up. At that time, the royal family's life was blessed, with summer and Christmas holidays spent in Balmoral and Sandringham, laying the foundations for Princess Anne's love of horseback riding. Many idyllic times were spent playing with her older brother and roaming free in the country estates. The princess had a secure and happy childhood. Princess Anne is said to have had an incredibly close emotional bond with her father, Prince Philip. He admired her for her challenging and resilient nature. Some reporters have even said Princess Anne was Philip's favorite son. They had a lot in common, similar in their pragmatic approach to life and their strength of character, whilst not being adverse to expressing a strong opinion. Charles and Anne shared a governess, Catherine Peebles, for their early education. Still, by 1963, Anne was keen to move on to the outside world, to a boarding school, and she was enrolled at Benedon School, a historic house in the beautiful Kent countryside, the Garden of England. And what's your, your, your personal reaction to having the princess come here? I think it is a very great honor for us, and I hope a great opportunity. May I ask you finally about your own feelings on discipline? Suppose a, a girl does something that's against the rules, what, what happens to her? It depends what the, the misdemeanor happens to be. We deal with such misdemeanors ad hoc, usually a talking to in the right way is all that is necessary. Otherwise, we deal with it according to what it is. Have you ever expelled a girl? Never so far. The princess has been vocal about the benefits of a boarding school education, and whilst acknowledging that some students may not enjoy the experience, she felt it was the right thing for her. In June 1987, the Queen bestowed the title upon her daughter, Anne the Princess Royal. She said, you know, there's, there's really only you and them, and it requires an awful lot of concentration. <laughs> um, there are certain advantages in being lost in a 
class of... Were you nervous? Were you nervous about going to public school? Or going no, I think I did actually rather look, quite look forward to it in many ways. And how, how did they treat you? Was there any bullying done? I imagine there wasn't really, knowing you. <laughs> or, at least, or at least being aware of you. I wasn't that big a girl. Well, <laughs> Although the title is honorary, it is the highest honor that may be given to a female member of the royal family. So it was a very significant moment for the queen to publicly recognize the immense dedication Anne had been applying to her role as a working member of the royal family. Being a young, beautiful princess and daughter to the queen made Princess Anne a very eligible young lady. As with her brother Prince Charles, there was great speculation as to whom she would marry, although the pressure was relatively low, as her children in all likelihood would not end up as the future king or queen. A shared interest in equestrian sports brought Anne together with her first husband, Captain Mark Phillips. The engagement was announced on the 29th of May, 1973. In a peek behind the curtain, the royal couple sat down for an interview. Why have you kept a bay in the wedding service? Well, for that reason, I think it's in the service. And perhaps because I'm rather an old-fashioned girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As, as the, the dean said the other day, the, the um, consensus it says obey, and, and I hope to say worship, so I think there's money takes a choice. It was even, um, well, I suppose after badminton, but um, can't speak for him or me, really. Mr. Phillips, uh, let me throw that one at you. Yes, it was after badminton that we decided it really is. Has it been a great strain keeping it secret and indeed keeping it away from people like ourselves? <laughs> I think it has, yes, it became rather a strain. Yes. You seem on the surface to be a, a very shy person. It's not every day one proposes to a princess. Did it require a lot of courage to propose? I think it, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the, the fact that... Um, the girl, the girl in question is a princess. Maybe it makes any difference at all. I think it was. I think if you get married to somebody, it's a very, very personal thing, and the two of you just feel it, and and it's a completely natural. I think you've got to be brave to propose to anybody, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> but I, don't think I mean, indeed, it, it, it perhaps it becomes relatively more important. But I rather hope that I mean, every time he spoke to me or took me out, that he can actually think of me as a princess. Do you think you'll make a good housewife? I mean, can you cook, for example? Well, that's hardly up to me to say either. Um, Cooks scrambled eggs, I think. We can look at recommend this. Yes, I mean, I've done a bit of cooking my time. Would you like to cook Captain Phillips' breakfast before he goes off to work, for example? I can manage that. It's easy. Especially when he's eventing, because he's not going to get more than a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> when you were a teenager, did you have any idea of the sort of girl that you would like to marry? No, I... I <laughs> No, I didn't. I, I, I wasn't very clever with, with, with girls, I don't think, when I, when I was a teenager. I, d I definitely was a bit um, not very good. Not very successful, should I say. <laughs> well, if you had not met a man whom you wanted to marry, do you think you would have married out of a sense of duty? No way. Um... <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you love tones, no. Princess Anne married Captain Mark Phillips on the 14th of November, 1973, at Westminster Abbey. 
It is thought that the Queen offered Mark a royal title, but he turned it down, preferring to keep Captain as his title. Mark Antony Peter, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her as long as ye both shall live? I will. Anne Elizabeth, Alice Louise, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him so long as ye both shall live? I will. I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As she was the first of the Queen's children to marry, it was indeed a very special day. Around 500 million viewers were estimated to have watched it on television. It also happened to be the 25th birthday of her brother Prince Charles. Last coach on the last stage of its journey through the forecourt and right into the centre courtyard of the palace. This really is coming home for, for the moment. Buckingham Palace really must be home to them all. And it comes into that central courtyard. We're looking at it through the glass window of the grand entrance. That entrance which must be so familiar to many people who've attended the garden party. Two postillions first, now the coach itself, four grade. There's the red carpet leading up the flight of staircase into the marble fall. The shower reigns in carefully. Footman bow, open the doors, and then Mark Phillips, and now welcome home, Princess Anne. The couple's first child, Peter Mark Phillips, was born on the 15th of November, 1977. And young Peter was the first grandchild for the Queen, so an extraordinary moment for Her Majesty and Prince Philip, as it was for Princess Anne and Captain Phillips. With the temperature just above freezing, Princess Anne came out. But instead of stopping on the steps for a moment for the large crowd, as she had promised, she just had a few quick words with the hospital staff. Nurse Zora Akroff held Paddington Bear, a hospital mascot. Two-day-old Master Phillips was carried out by Sister Delphine Stevens, the midwife who was present at the birth. Oh, well wrapped up against the cold, he was handed to the princess, who, ignoring normal advice, sat with her son in the front seat of the car. Watch yourselves now. And off the couple went to Buckingham Palace for lunch. They'll be staying there until they move to their new home in Gloucestershire. As Mark did not take a title when he married Princess Anne, it was also decided that their children would not receive any royal titles. Anne has said she wished they could have as normal a childhood as possible. Anne and Mark settled into family life with their newborn son, and for the next four years, they did their duty, but focused on family. Their second child, Zara Phillips, was born on the 15th of May, 1981.
After the birth of Zara, trouble was slowly brewing in the marriage between Anne and Mark. They were reportedly rarely seen together. The initial spark had worn off, and both were thought to be engaged in extramarital affairs. Subsequently, reports and accusations emerged that Phillips had fathered a love child with a New Zealand art teacher, Heather Tonkin. The couple separated in 1989 and divorced in 1992. Princess Anne went on to marry Sir Timothy Lawrence, who happened to be a query to the Queen from 1986 to 1989. They remain contentedly married, sharing their passions and hobbies, but with a keen eye on their royal duties and responsibilities. I think we have a family generally fought with Charles, that he shouldn't marry before he was 30, that he should date as many people as he could and see what came of that. And on the one hand, he wasn't necessarily the most outgoing of men. He wasn't necessarily somebody who was going to be a lady killer. But on the other hand, he was a Prince of Wales. There was no shortage of people who would have married him. Well, he met Lady Diana Spencer in 1977 because he'd actually been dating her elder sister Sarah for a while. And when he first met Diana, she was 16. And it was an unequal relationship because she was still a girl, but there was obviously a spark between them, a spark of interest. And of course, at this stage, Charles was still seeing Camilla Shand, who later became Camilla Parker Bowles. So I think it's fair to say that on the one hand, the relationship with Diana was not necessarily an obvious love match from the beginning, but on the other hand, there was very much an, in an interest on both sides. And she was somebody, perhaps because of her youth, who was not phased by responsibilities that she'd have to take on if she became Princess of Wales. In February 1981, Charles and Diana announced their engagement and appeared in an interview that would go down in history. When the reporter asked if the couple were in love, Diana replied, of course. Charles added, whatever in love means. And there, he planted the seed of doubt. Difficult to find that sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and unhappy. And I'm, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously, means, your own interpretation. obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank you very much. Charles's whatever love means is, I think, an attempt on his part to try and say, that's a ridiculous question. Why are you asking me that? I'm not interested in responding to it. However, it was the worst possible thing he could have said because for decades afterwards, that has been taken to mean he doesn't love Diana, he's doing this because he feels he has to, he's been forced into it, he couldn't care less, she could be anyone. And I think that a lot of the public ill will towards Charles comes about because it was felt he wasn't in love with Diana, and that response, I think, has led to a lot of it. As we now know, Charles and Diana's marriage was unsuccessful. Whilst they built a family unit together with sons William and Harry, the relationship between Charles and Diana was not destined to last. Charles later rekindled an old spark with former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles. Much to the dismay and disapproval of royal courtiers. But they went on to marry and the public accepted their partnership. Well, Charles's marriage to Camilla in 2005, was, it was a civil ceremony rather than a religious ceremony. And it was very much felt, I think, by everybody in the country that they'd finally managed to make each other happy. And I think that if they had been allowed to marry 25 years before, the world would have been a much, much better place for it. But I think that what had been done so cleverly was that Camilla had been seen during Diana's lifetime as a rather villainous figure, which she really isn't. She's a very charming, very lovely woman. And what happened was this PR campaign you know, a year or so after Diana's death that Camilla and Charles were seen together in public. She was very much acknowledged as his companion. And eventually after, I mean, it was quite a long time. I mean, it was eight years between Diana's death and their marriage. I mean, he could not be accused of rushing into it. 
the, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty and she also saw her dedication to Charles because she she so helps him and he wants her at his side and she will be at his side so she's got she's almost in a queen mother type of role you know queen mother was there for her husband in his weaker moments and I think Camilla will be there for Charles when it came to his own family Diana was well known to be a very hands-on mother, but Charles was a supportive parent too. William and Harry have praised their father publicly, and he has clearly set a strong example of the importance of hard work and generosity to others. After Diana's death, Charles had to step up and take more responsibility for William and Harry. Though the young princes were growing up, and becoming more independent, it was undoubtedly challenging for them both. As the Prince of Wales, Charles undertook official duties on behalf of the Queen. He sponsors the Prince's charities and is a patron, president or member of over 400 other charities and organisations. Anne entered public life at 18 and continued serving as a working royal. Involved in upwards of 300 different charity organizations, Anne is considered the busiest royal family member. The hardest working royal is a title she often receives, battling it out with her brother Charles, who has always attended the most engagements. I mean, people nowadays are much more questioning, I think, about um, where their money goes when they're um, giving to charities, which seems to me perfectly fair. And then if in, to some extent that uh, through these visits and what they see on, on reports helps to show them exactly what's going on, so much the better. I mean, that would probably be its main advantage. The monarch is the head of the armed forces and it has always been a great tradition of the royal family that every member should engage in active service and lead by example, playing more than just a symbolic role. The Queen was the first female member of the royal family to serve full-time on active service as a member of the ATS during World War II. Is being treated just like any other trainee. Now visited by her parents and sister Margaret Rose at a training station in southern England, she shows them she knows a fan belt from a spark plug, all right, and isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Her father gave her an officer's commission early in March. Papa and Mama seem to approve, too. Daughter is the first woman member of the royal family to join the services full time. Prince Philip, too, was an active member of the Royal Navy during World War II. So for Charles, it was an essential next step for him as heir to the throne and future head of the armed forces. While studying at Cambridge University, Charles received flying lessons from the RAF. He went on to RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire to train as a jet pilot, with his passing out parade in September 1971. Like his great-grandfathers, his grandfather and his father, he pursued a naval career taking a six-week course at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. Charles served on the guided missile destroyer HMS Norfolk, and then on two frigates, the HMS Minerva from 1972 to 1973, and the HMS Jupiter in 1974. In steaming heat, Prince Charles's frigate, HMS Minerva, edged her way into Nassau Harbour. A few minutes before, he had formally ended his duties as one of the ship's navigation officers and taken on the role again of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, with his personal standard broken from the mast. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. To get to Rawson's place, where the welcome speeches would be made, the Prince walked at speed through an aisle of shouting, yelling Bahamians with security men running in front to clear a path for him. If it was all a bit confused, the prince showed no sign of being put out by it. The speeches were from a dais placed in front of the old Nassau landmark, the statue of the prince's great-great-great-grandmother, and were brief to the relief of those in full dress with the temperature in the 90s. I'm looking forward to eager anticipation of visiting Nassau. 
It will be five days of ceremonial engagements before Prince Charles rejoins Minerva next Wednesday for two more months of Caribbean patrol as a naval lieutenant. One of Princess Anne's great passions, just like her mother, is horses. But the ambitious princess furthered her passion, taking on an equestrian career alongside her royal duties. Influenced by her father, who excelled at polo and had a keen appetite for competition, it was in the royal blood to succeed at equine sports. At a farm near Windsor today, as with almost every other day since she came back from the Far East, Princess Anne has been riding with Dublin, preparing for the badminton horse trials in April, and in the long term, if that goes well, selection for the Munich Olympics in the summer. The princess is a specialist in the tough three-day event that takes in a dressage with its 30 carefully prepared movements, 18 miles of cross-country riding, and on the last day, arena show jumping. After a layoff through the royal tour in Thailand and Malaysia, the princess is working back to fitness and accepting no more official engagements other than those already agreed to. The young princess began competing at 11 years old, winning a jumping event held at Windsor Park. She continued to ride during her school years at Benedon. Her fearless approach to riding and the wild side of her character saw her succeed and take several falls leaving her with more broken bones than most people see in a lifetime. In the business, Princess Anne has a reputation of being a good competitor with a lot of endurance and a dislike of not winning. Mrs. Oliver feels that she's managed to help boost her confidence. For Princess Anne to get to the Olympics, she has to do well at badminton, get on the team shortlist, and then hold her form through the summer to the final trials only three weeks before the games start. The chairman of the selectors points out that she is by no means an automatic choice in an event in which Britain is traditionally strong. But as European champion, if she holds her form this year, she stands more than a good chance of getting into the team of four. By Olympic standards, the princess has reached the top very quickly, and Alison Oliver has few doubts about her ability to stand up to the competition and the strain of the Munich stadiums if she is chosen to go. On the 8th of September, 2022, Charles' life would change forever. At the moment of his mother's death, the Prince of Wales became King Charles III. The extraordinary reign of Queen Elizabeth II ended, and the day he had spent a lifetime preparing for had arrived. A moment he would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Buckingham Palace announced that the Queen was under medical supervision and one by one members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. 
Giles and Anne returned to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second significant Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. Broadcasters announced her death and said the king and queen would return to London the following day. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy, and following his mother's example, Charles stepped into his duties as king. I think that probably the shock of the mother's, his mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king, it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you, in a way. So I think he he wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level, which would be really the only way to deal with something of that enormity happening to you. On Saturday, the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace. It was time to proclaim the new king. For the first time in history, this historic ceremony was filmed. The Privy Council proclaimed His Majesty as King Charles III. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. The late Queen and the King were very, very close. Her, her son, she had a, 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 a wonderful relationship with him. Again, a fun relationship, which we all saw. We used to see different events in London when he would suddenly call her mummy and she'd pull a face at him. And, you know, there was a, a, a wonderful relationship. Mummy. <laughs> but, but they respected each other. I mean, he really respected his mother, he respected the fact that she was queen and everything that stood for. Outside the royal court, the state trumpets sound. Before rolling news, the role of this part of the ceremony was to spread the word to a waiting nation. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles the Third. God save the king! Charles made a personal declaration, referencing his mother's reign. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. So the proclamation was quite special because the proclamation's always been, well, part of it is always private. The actual part that you saw outside on the balcony of St James's Palace has been televised or recorded before. But what goes on indoors, you never see. So the fact we actually got to see him um, actually doing the, the signing and everything was quite, was quite special. Even if there was one or two little funny moments, but it was quite an important, a historical uh, important moment uh, for him and for us to all be allowed to watch that, which was, I, could, I mean, I was amazed that we got to see it. And, and again, it's one of those um, memories, I think, that we'll always, 
will always have. You know, it was, it was quite a special seeing that. In the days following his mother's death, Charles visited different nations. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles made himself very visible, just like his mother did. He met with people waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state and visited people across the country who were grieving too. Charles, along with his brothers and sisters, solemnly held a vigil at St. Giles's Cathedral and later at Westminster Hall, a touching and challenging moment for the siblings. On the 19th of September, Charles played an essential part in the late Queen's funeral. King Charles walked behind the coffin alongside his siblings and sons, a poignant moment. It must be the most extraordinary experience to walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace as king, something you've done untold times before as Prince of Wales, and to feel this garment of this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders, because you start to think to yourself, well, what am I taking on? What is this responsibility? I mean, what does the future hold for me? So Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to, and I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. And so I think that a lot of people found that much more affecting than they were expecting to, because just as the Queen was a kind of grandmother to the nation, he was very explicitly offering himself as a substitute. And I think that many people who wouldn't expect that they were going to be moved by it were moved by it. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. Arriving at St George's Chapel, a minor funeral service commenced. The chorus sang, God save the King, for the first time. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. He is the sovereign. He is the king. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. On May the 6th, the first coronation in 70 years will occur. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, the pomp and tradition will still feature. Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. The proclamation of King Charles was something that took place just after his announcement as king, and it's something that was announced in every major city and every major town in Britain, it's something that, because it hadn't happened in so long, it hadn't happened since the 1950s, there was a real interest in it, because people hadn't seen a proclamation before, but of course now they are seeing this man being proclaimed king, which is, again, it's something that's been going on for centuries, but it's still got a hugely symbolic role that we are seeing before our very eyes, the reassertion of monarchy, the reassertion of kingship, because not a lot of people alive today are going to remember 
King George VI, his grandfather. So having a king again is really quite a novelty. The role King Charles III played at his mother's funeral was very much head of the family and also king of the nation. And I'm sure it was quite a difficult time, mainly because, you know, the eyes of the world are watching you. It's not a private thing at all, and he's aware of that. Everything he does, every, every action, every tear, everything has been watched and listened to and, and discussed. Well, Charles was obviously responsible for making sure that the, fu that the funeral went as smoothly as it did because he was obviously the focus of attention. He was the person that most people were looking at in terms of how it was going to be for him. And he's somebody who I think was on the day, he walked behind the coffin, he was very much, you know, the, the focus of public interest, the focus of public attention. And he did everything exceptionally well. I mean, the funeral was very well organised. It had been, of course, organised. It had been planned for years, but it went off without a hitch and Charles's involvement with that has to be seen as testament to the fact that everything worked well. There was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death. It was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. Must have been a very strange experience because you hear this song, which you've heard, which you've heard a million times before, when it's about your mother and God Save the Queen, and it's about the King and it's about you. And it must have been a very extraordinarily cathartic experience in a lot of regards, but also an overwhelming one. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he can no longer speak so freely about his passions and opinions. He instead has to remain unbiased. King Charles has taken on his responsibilities with ease, dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents and state officials, and attending various engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride.
Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but heavier is the burden of being next in line. The British royal family is built on the traditional duty until death. For every heir to the throne, there is a spare. The eldest son of King Charles III, Prince William, is next in line, leaving his brother Harry on the sidelines. I think when it comes to Prince Harry, it's obvious that there's huge affection between the two brothers. Harry was the sort of the frontline jester that, that will be the guy that be entertaining. And also, if you, if you ever got in a spot of bother, you know, if Harry were old enough, he's the sort of guy that would come out and help you William would think about it. Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. Well, I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that bad. Mean... Despite being close during their childhood and teenage years, the looming pressure of the expectations of the crown has driven a wedge between the brothers. I think the damage of the best relationship for you I don't know if it's fragile, I don't know if that's fixable. When one steps up, the other must step back. Crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace throughout the evening. Then at 10.25, their patience was rewarded with the formal notice of the birth. It was signed by Mr. George Pinker, the Queen's gynaecologist, and other doctors who attended the princess. The crowd cheered to the echo. The fact that Diana produced a little boy, an heir, um, I think just further endeared her to the British public. People loved her even more. And when she came out holding Prince William, with Prince Charles, images that really just melted, I think, even the most hardened hearts around the country. And uh, it, was, it was a cause for great celebration. Um, Britain had come through a difficult time, and I think the royal family were giving the country something to look forward to. Uh, William had a, a fairly traditional aristocratic childhood in as much as he was taken care of by nannies. His parents were, were you know, Diana particularly was a modern parent, but she was a modern aristocratic parent. And she did use nannies. And the nannies really were the people that William spent most of his time with. I've known those two boys, William and Harry, since they were born. Um, I used to change their nappies. They used to call me Uncle Paul. I've always been there, and I've watched them grow. I'm very proud of them. They're lovely boys. Being a new mother, there were, there were obviously challenges for, for Diana, but being a new mother and being a member of the royal family and trying to juggle everything within the confines of Kensington Palace, I think, really did take their toll. Now, Diana did make the decision to hire a nanny for Prince William, um, but she was always paranoid, I think, as, the, as both of her children were growing up. I think William in particular suffered growing up um, because Diana was, was very possessive and very... Um, she'd lost her own mother when she was six and she had felt abandoned and unloved. And as a result, she grew up with a great fear of being unloved and being abandoned again. Um, and when she realized that the nanny that she'd employed a woman called Barbara Barnes, who was very informal and loving and hands-on. Um, when Diana realized that the bond between Nanny and William was very strong, she, uh, she took fright. 
and found a flimsy excuse to get rid of Barbara Barnes. And so when, when William was four years old, suddenly this woman who had been in his life for as long as he could remember, whose bed he'd climbed into every morning for a cuddle before getting up, was gone. And I think that was um, a major turning point in William's life because he had been a very outgoing little boy. William became rather introverted and you know, nobody explained to him what had happened and he never saw Barbara again. William felt abandoned when the nanny left. She loved to have fun. She loved to giggle. She loved to play practical jokes. And she loved nothing more than cuddling up with her two boys watching TV and watching game shows and soap operas. And the boys were the center of her world. I was very fortunate to go with Diana to um, Richard Branson's island, Necker Island in the British Virgin Islands. You know, there was Diana on this island at a difficult time, wanted this week to be alone. Literally half a mile across the lagoon at Byrus Creek were 60 to 70 of the world's press, media, paparazzi, whatever you want to phrase it. And uh, she said, I'm not giving any further calls, Ken. I'm not doing anything. I said, I mean, it's not a problem for me. It's up to you. I mean, it's your choice. And then something changed, actually, that actually made things a lot easier. The uh, manager from the island just returned from neighboring Tortola with the supplies. And uh, in these supplies, he said, oh, he said, I'm, he was Canadian. He said, I've got some gifts for the children. I said, oh, what's that? He said, uh, I've got a couple of catapults. And I thought he meant these handout catapults. I thought, no, no, we, we don't want those. There's the last thing we want. No, but these were these massive, great uh, elastic catapults, you know, sort of inch square elastic with these huge pouches that you tie to two trees. And he had this sort of bag of balloons that you fill with water. And then you, and, and I thought, oh, maybe great for the kids. They can sort of have, you know, sort of target competitions. William heard all this. And he came up to me, he said, Ken, he said, oh, I've got a very good idea. I said, what's that? He said, well, when mommy has to give um, a press opportunity, um, Harry and me and my, um, and my cousins, we can be on the cliff top and we, we can fire the balloons at the press. I said, you, you better go and speak to your mother about this. Anyway, Diana came back almost immediately. She said, and I'm a completely different frame of mind. She said, Ken, I think it's a very good idea. So I said, so you're gonna do this press thing? Yes, why not? So the following day, this flotilla of small boats arrive. And they were delighted, of course, to be some of the best shots of Diana that ever came out in the sort of leopard skin uh, costume, etc. And then suddenly from the top of this cliff came the words, fire. So off the top of this came this sort of salvo of multicolored water-filled balloons that landed right in the center of this flotilla of, of cameramen, who, who, who interestingly found it incredibly amusing. And one of the balloons hit Whitaker. And of course, that was his piston resistance because he then shouts up something, I've just been flayed by the future King of England. And of course, everybody started laughing on the diner on the beach, her mother, her sisters, her brother. It was an incredible experience, all because of William's idea. To anyone in the know, it was very obvious that the Wales' marriage was in real trouble um, by the late 80s. Um, and uh, inevitably, the announcement was made by the then Prime Minister, John Major, that uh, Diana and Charles were going to separate. And she made sure that the first people who found out that they were going to separate were William and Harry. And she actually made the drive to Ludgrove School herself to go and tell them. And uh, Harry took it very badly, of course, being younger than William. He, he was incredibly upset. William was very stoic and said to his mother, well, if you're happier, if you're going to be happier, mummy, then this is the right thing to do. Diana 
took it upon herself to give an interview to Martin Bashir, who um, was the presenter of Panorama. Completely unprecedented, a total shock to the royal family. Diana did this interview in great secrecy, but alerted William and his housemaster to the fact that it would happen a couple of days in advance. And the housemaster said, will you please come down to Eton and explain to William what, what is about to happen? And so she went down to, to Eton and she had the briefest of conversations. I think she was there for about five minutes and said, don't worry, there's nothing sensational in it. You won't be upset. Um, you know, you'll, you'll like it. Um, and of course, she was completely wrong. William was really upset by, by that interview. And of course, caught in this very ugly crossfire were two little boys, um, William, who was at Eton at the time, who had to deal with the taunts and the other children having seen this interview, um, mocking his mother and her doe eyes as she was talking to Martin Bashir. Uh, very, very difficult for both of them. Harry was more sheltered. He was still at Ludgrove at the time. And um, I remember the headmaster there making sure that newspapers were banned. They were out the way. No one could watch that interview. It was his way of protecting Harry. I think at Eton, it was much harder to do that. William was exposed to everything, and he called his mother in a fury and a rage. I remember speaking to Simone Simmons, who was one of Diana's closest friends, who recalled that it was, it was actually the rare and only time, I believe, when William turned on his mother and said he would never forgive her for what she'd done. He had... He had been in the south of France before her death with his mother and with Dodi Fayed and Mohammed Al Fayed. And they had stayed in the Al Fayed's villa in, in the south of France and they'd been on the boat that um, Diana had been famously photographed on. They had had a pretty horrible time. William had had a row with Diana. Harry had had a row with one of Fayed's children. They had hated the publicity. They'd hated the fact that the paparazzi were all over them. They hadn't really liked the Fayeds very much. Um, they'd felt hugely uncomfortable. And so they were quite relieved, I think, to get back to spend the next part of their school holidays in Scotland with their father. On this, the first day of their Balmoral holiday. Father was in Lord of the Isles Tartan, he is a traditionalist, but the boys chose more modern garb. Harry, 12, seemed quite relaxed. William, 15, well over six feet tall, finds being on public parade very difficult. Often he did look just like his once shy mother. They flew back to England, they went up to Balmoral, and they'd been there for some weeks, having the most wonderful time with, with all the royal family, the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, and, and their father. And their mother was due to come back the next day, and they were due to fly from Balmoral down to London to see her for the last few days of the school holidays before going back to school. Um, and they had had a phone conversation with Diana on the evening, on that evening before she flew back. She'd wanted to speak to both of them, and they were playing a game, and they were actually quite irritated at having to leave the, the fun they were having and go and speak to their mother on the phone. And so they, they tried to get her off the phone quite, you know, as quickly as they reasonably could and get back to their game. And of course, that was the last time they spoke to her. That was the last time they heard her voice. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. Her companion, the Harrods heir Dodi Al Fayed, has been killed. The driver of the princess's car is also understood to be dead. The accident happened at just after midnight in the west of the city near the Alma Bridge. Uh, she died in the early hours of the next morning. And. Uh, you know, how does any 15-year-old and 12-year-old cope with that? Um, uh, it was devastating for them, obviously.
First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. You know, I remember the day William and Harry came back to Kensington Palace after their mother died. I remember standing in the hallway and William woke, walked in and shook my hand and asked me if I was all right. I said, I'm very, I'm fine, thank you. Harry ran down the corridor, flung his arms around me and broke his heart. I still remember his tears wet my shirt through. He was broken hearted. Hearts broke around the world. People watched that funeral all over the globe when they saw the coffin passing and that little envelope on the top with a wreath of flowers with the word mummy, which had been handwritten by Harry. William and Harry walked behind the, the cortege. It was a long walk. There were crowds sobbing and, and wailing and um, hundreds, thousands and thousands of people lining the route. Uh, and they walked with their father, uh, their grandfather and Charles Spencer. They did rely on one another. They were very close. Um, the, the two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter. They tease each other mercilessly. And then when their mother died, I think that brought them even closer together because they couldn't share with anyone else what they had experienced. It, it wasn't, you know, like the death of, a, of any other, any normal parent, because in, with the death of a normal parent, you don't have the world grieving as well. It was almost as though their grief was being devalued by the grief of strangers. So I think it was a very difficult time for them. And, and during that, sort of the, the years after Diana's death, there was a bond which was closer, arguably, than, than most siblings. William, although he looks like his mother, is more like his father. He's studious, he's very careful, he's very respectful, he's duty-bound. Harry, on the other hand, is a hybrid of the Spencers' red hair and the Windsors, but he has his mother's naughty streak. Harry was the sort of the frontline jester that, that will be the guy that be entertaining. And also, if you, if you ever got in a spot of bother, you know, if Harry were old enough, he's the sort of guy that would come and help you out. William would think about it. Harry was always the soldier. William was always the general. So when my two boys visited and they played war games, William had an army that he could direct. But Harry's happy to muck in. I think when it comes to Prince Harry, it's obvious that there's huge affection between the two brothers even when he was very little, when he was 10, 11 years old, and he'd see the girls starting to scream because Prince William was coming along because he was that bit older and they could see he was very handsome. He, we're told Prince Harry would, would encourage the girls to scream and, and just because he knew it really embarrassed his brother. So he seems to be the more playful one, Prince Harry. And again, that would bear out what the Princess of Wales said in that Panorama interview about he's a more, uh, sort of, more of a Spencer wild child than, than William is. And we can see it, can't we, in, in, in the, the pictures we see in his antics and the kind of things he likes to do. But I also get the, the impression from the, the times we've seen the two together talking 
to one another and about one another and about that because they've, they've spoken about their their closeness as brothers that you get the feeling that prince william for all his understanding of the seriousness of his role in the future he makes it very clear that he needs his brother and he values that harry is a party creature he always will be um, so obviously he's going to get caught out Today's papers all carry headlines about his drug-taking and underage drinking sessions. The paper which broke the story says the young prince smoked the drug on several occasions at private parties with friends. Yeah, in uh, January 2005, um, I, I ran a story about Prince Harry, a picture that we got of Prince Harry going to a party actually with William, uh, and he was wearing a Nazi outfit. Um, it created a huge stink. William's reaction to the Nazi story, when he had a chance to bend my ear about it, was, was very sweet. And it was a sort of the way I'd like my big brother to stick up for me if I'd been put in the papers and, and obviously something I'd done had upset people. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, there is something very special with William and Harry. that They are extremely close. Um, and anything bad for Harry William will stick up for him to the nth degree. Harry learned a lot in that small period of time. Um, and I don't think at that stage in his life, anybody could have said anything to him that he would have taken notice of. But luckily, he's, he's grown up since then. There's a long tradition of senior members of the royal family going into the armed forces, because after all, the monarch is head of the armed forces. Um, and it's a, it's a useful place, really, for them to be. Harry's service in the military um, wasn't just a sort of tick, you know, box-ticking exercise. Harry was a, a, a genuine believer in the military and always wanted to be a soldier from, I, I guess, from the age when he was able to, to know what a soldier was. Certainly when I met him, age three, he was always in sort of khaki uniform and, and uh, he always wanted to be a soldier. Prince Harry's military experience was fraught with security concerns. He joined Sandhurst in 2005 and in 2006, the Ministry of Defense announced that he would be deployed to Iraq the following year. This led to a fierce public debate. Harry had been stopped from going um, his, his original deployment, he was going right up to the front line, and the press worked out where he was going to be sent. Then, of course, that meant that the Taliban knew where he was going to be sent as well, which meant that if he did go, it would be putting not just him in danger, but also his men in danger. And so Harry was pulled from that deployment. I have decided today that Prince Harry will not deploy as a troop leader with his squadron. I've come to this final decision following a further... Because of the way that um, the regiments uh, rotated in their deployments, it was quite clear that William was not actually going to make it to Afghanistan. He wouldn't, his, his regiment wouldn't go there um, for 18 months. And rather than sit around um, kicking his heels, doing training work in, in this country, he decided to go and look at the other forces. After Harry's deployment was cancelled, William trained in the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force. In October 2008, it was announced that Harry would follow his brother, learning to fly military helicopters at RAF Shawbury. To me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said a lot of times before, mollycuddled or treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, in my eyes, if Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. And I think as future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was get, you get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. I and mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And the search and rescue role is now, you know, slightly different to obviously being able to go to Afghanistan, but it's still doing an important job. And yeah, I hope that it's, yeah, I hope it's a step in the right direction exactly for the future. Um, I think the, the struggle that I was talking about was mainly the exams and stuff like that. I mean, we, when you sort of, the helicopter course, you start with 
or something like four or five weeks of uh, ground school and exams. Um, exams never been my favourite and I always knew that I was going to find it harder than most people, um, but I'm through that now and uh, finally got hands on to, uh, to a job that I absolutely adore. It is still hard work, but, um, but I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's not You've bad. been helping him with the exams? Uh, yeah, an awful lot. He needs a lot of help. It's, uh, yeah, it's the RAF way, so you have to help the army out quite a lot. I mean, does it come down to sort of mental maths tests? Or? Uh, yeah, a bit of that, you know, a few trick questions, try and catch them out. Seven, eights. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> lots of that. I think the time when that bond started to fracture a bit was when Harry um, probably came out of, the, uh, out of the army and started going into royal work. Um, and I, I think he accepted that, he knew that. And he knew that, you know, to, to be able to perform two tours of duty was perhaps more than he even anticipated. Um, and then that sort of effectively landed him in an office job in the Ministry of Defence, which would not have been to his liking. And so that was the end of his military career. And I think at that point, you know, he acknowledged, like his brother, that he was cut out for royal duties. The space was, was quite small within their charitable world for the two brothers together. And I think Harry slightly railed at the hierarchy here was his brother, you know, his mate, but who was slightly pulling rank at times. And, um, you know, it was part of this new machinery, this new royal machinery of, of modernising the royal family. And, you know, I think there were great hopes for Harry, to be honest. It, it, and, you know, he was certainly probably the most popular member of the royal family at that particular time. Um, I suspect that when when William married Kate, I mean, Harry adored Kate and Kate adored Harry, but I suspect that as with every family, when one sibling marries, their focus turns slightly onto their, their new wife. And so everything looked good and, and remained so until, you know, his marriage and the, there was all that sort of I, there was a lot of, I would say, controversy, but, you know, for the first time here, you had a, a prince of the realm marrying a, an American divorcee of, 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 of mixed heritage. Um, but actually, I think the, the general feeling of that was very positive. I mean, I, I was at Windsor commentating for a, 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 a US network about it. Personally, I, I thought it was a, an amazing step forward for the royal family. You know, 20, 30 years ago, this probably wouldn't have happened. Harry and Meghan's relationship doesn't seem well supported, especially by his older brother. William looked at Harry's relationship with Meghan that was going at a fearsome pace, moving at a fearsome pace, and uttered a word of warning. Um, said, look, you know, are, are you sure are you sure about this? You are going very, very, you know, you're, you're moving fast. Um, it, it was, I think, the most legitimate remark for, for William to make as his older brother. You know, their parents' marriage had disintegrated very largely because the two didn't know one another when they got married. They'd moved too quickly for altogether different reasons, but, but they had moved too quickly. So. William was, was just adding a voice of caution. And Harry, I think, took it very badly. There were other friends of Harry's, old, old friends, who said much the same thing. Again, Harry took it very badly. But now that it is all official, Prince Harry, do you have that sense that the combination of the two of you, your different backgrounds, that you together represent something new for the royal family? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's something new. I think it's um, you know it's a for me it's a an added member of the family. It's a it's a it's another another team player as part of the the bigger team. And you know for all of us, all we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work, and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the the world in the, in the correct sense, rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. So you know the fact that I the fact that I fell in love with. Megan so incredibly quickly was a was a sort of confirmation to me that that everything everything all the stars were aligned everything was just perfect it was this 
beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. And the fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But um, mm. no, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team. We know we are. And, and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for the things that we care about as, as much as possible. I am very excited about that, yeah. I think then as time went by and Meghan moved into Kensington Palace and started, became a member of the, of the family, and there, were, there was unhappiness within the office. There were rumours um, that Meghan was bullying some of the staff. Her method of working was not what they had been used to. Whether it was because she was American, whether it was because she was a, a movie star who treated people different in a different way, it was not what had happened in the past within that royal household. And I think William, when he heard that some members of staff were being reduced to tears or not enjoying their, their working life anymore, I think he got very angry. And that, and he confronted Harry and told him what was going on. And Harry was protective of Meghan. So that is where I think the seeds of it all, a fracture in, in this bond that had been so close, came from. The announcement of Harry and Meghan's pregnancy shocked the world. Meghan and Harry welcomed the newest royal member a few weeks before their first anniversary. His name was announced two days later, Archie Harrison Mountbatten-Windsor. Meghan and Harry have been doing things their own way. They have made a statement, a clear statement, that this baby belongs to them, not the public. In my understanding, this is somewhat unprecedented. When there's this much interest and when the royals are determined to keep it to themselves, Behind the tall walls of Windsor Castle is where fewer than 25 guests were invited to witness the newest royal baptism. Those invited taken discreetly to the tiny private chapel. Outside though, the streets were thronging with people. Those hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal christening though, were left disappointed. We do pay for the royal family, including uh, Meghan and Harry. And I think that they could have given us a little, you know, um, a little something. I think it should be public, you know, it always has been, why, why change it? It's their decision, it's their family, um, it's not as if they're direct uh, in line. And this royal watcher says the public may have to get used to this royal couple's desire for privacy. Well, it seems to be the case that Harry has decided he wants his little boy to have more of a private life. He feels he's a long way from the throne and wants to enjoy some type of privacy. But it, it could be a problem because no matter what you do, he is growing up in a royal goldfish bowl. He has got two of the most famous parents in the world. Today's christening is a very different royal event, part of the continuing desire by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to raise their son Archie out of the spotlight. And they're a couple determined to do things their own way. Uh, yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I can ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there, um, from everybody out there. It's been, um, it's been amazing, so we just wanted to share this with everybody. There has been a fundamental disconnect on the part of Meghan and Harry in the difference between being a celebrity and being a royal. As a celebrity, you're entitled to privacy with, when it comes to things like this. So as a royal, the expectation is that this family, in a way, belongs to the public. They're public servants. And if the people want to see a picture of the baby, you give them a picture of the baby. If the people want to see the new mom just hours after she gives birth, trotted out in stockings and, and high heels, then you do it. That has been done up until now. 
Whether or not that's right, that is the precedent. So for Harry and Meghan to treat this the way a celebrity would really treat this, which is we ask for privacy at this time, that's not what royals do. Harry and William had very different experiences as new fathers. Harry's was a lot more private. But having said that, you know, of course you have to remember William is in a far different position than Harry. William will be king. Uh, Harry will never be king. So I think the, the standards are not the same. The expectation isn't as high. And Harry and Meghan hopefully will be allowed more privacy. Doing things their way sounds like a destabilizing factor for the very traditional royal family. And behind this destabilization are unspoken conflicts, especially with his older brother, Prince William. Harry and Meghan left, as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America. Look, they're clearly very unhappy with the royal existence that they have at the moment and the way that their public life impinges on them. It's, it's something they clearly want to change. Many people will have sympathy with that. Um, it's understandable. Um, the crux of the matter is you can't be half royal. You can be uh, part of the royal machine, you can accept the privileges that go with it, but also take the restrictions you live in in a sort of bubble, or you can um, stand back. I mean, the, the, the next generation of Dukes of Kent, Dukes of Gloucester, they're private citizens, no one would recognize right. them in the street. You can go down that route if you want. What you can't do is to be uh, a sort of transatlantic royals who drop in, do a bit of royal stuff, but then go off to do this sort of financial independence stuff in, in LA or Toronto, wherever it is. I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will uh, tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. In September 2020, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex signed a multi-million dollar deal with Netflix. The concern that Harry and Meghan would expose the entirety of the royal family's life to the public arose. There may be a point that at some stage that the Queen, Charles and William believe that what Meghan and Harry are proposing is a threat to the institution of the British monarchy, then they will act. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have undertaken a public relations blitz, appearing in a buzzy primetime interview with Oprah Winfrey that drew millions of viewers. In the interview, the couple discussed mental health issues, and the Duchess said she had suicidal thoughts after marrying into the British royal family. Uh, I think there is now an allegation of racism hanging over a member or members of the royal family. We don't know who, as we said earlier, not the Queen, not the Duke of Edinburgh, but beyond that, we don't know who Harry and Meghan uh, wouldn't say. And nor do we know the context in which this remark was made, but we do know, from what we've heard, that both Harry, when he heard it, and Meghan, when it was passed on, took offence to it, and therefore that is an issue uh, for them. And also, I think there's slightly wider questions for us as society. Harry said that he left in part because of racism uh, in the UK. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist, and did huge, huge damage to his relationship with um, his father and with, with William. Harry also accused his father of cutting him off financially, which we now know actually wasn't true. We now know several things that were said in that interview were not true. Sir, have you, broke, have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken to him yet, but I will do. And, and can you just let me know, is uh, the royal family a racist family, sir? No, we're very much not a racist family. After the death of their grandfather, Prince Philip, William and Harry both attended the funeral on April 17th, 2021. This was the first time the brothers had been seen together since Harry left for America. I think certainly it was, it would have been a conscious decision of um, 
Prince William and Prince Harry to do that at the end of the service. Um, you know, the whole family, um, apart from the Queen, sort of walked back to the castle from the chapel. You know, the fact that Harry walked with William and Kate, I think, was perhaps a symbol that there is at least a willingness to um, to talk and perhaps to have some rapprochement between the two princes. I think as far as the Queen and, and the late Duke of Edinburgh are concerned, I think that they never really fell out with their grandson in the same way as, as perhaps he has done with his brother and, and to some extent his father. So I think that um, the Queen very much would would want there to be, you know, a, a sort of reuniting. There's still going to have to be um, discussions going forward. I mean, there's an inquiry, internal inquiry going on into some of the allegations that were made in that interview. And so I think there will be difficult conversations ahead. But I think that, yes, I think that from the Queen's point of view, she would want to smooth things over, really. In September 2021, the two brothers unveiled a statue of their mother, Diana, in the sunken garden of Kensington Palace. All smiles, they would have known the world was watching, but this felt like a genuine reunion. Two sons who have had their troubles coming together with Princess Diana's brother and sisters to remember their mother. Sharing a joke and the duty of unveiling the statue a lasting tribute how Diana used her spotlight to shine a light on others. Paul, the, the princess, was a very public figure and in many respects an icon, but she was somebody's mother. So that's, I paid the greatest heed to both princes and what they had to say. I think it'll take quite a lot of work for the, for the relationship to be restored to what it was, but I think that you know, baby steps. And the fact that they were together, the fact that they were smiling together, um, laughing even at times, clearly talking, is a real step forward. Yes, it is difficult to know if this was a show of unity just for one day, but it did feel like engagements from a couple of years ago when they were on much better terms, again, bouncing off each other today in a way that only brothers can. The two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter they tease each other mercilessly. They did rely on one another. Part of this role and part of this job and this family being under the pressure that it's under, inevitably, you know, stuff, um, stuff happens. But look, we're, we're brothers, we're, we'll always be brothers. Um, we're certainly on different paths at the moment, but I will always be there for him. And as I know, he'll always be there for me. Prince William, for all his understanding of the seriousness of his role in the future, you get the feeling that he makes it very clear that he needs his brother and he values that. On September the 8th, 2022, Queen Elizabeth II passed away at her home in Balmoral after a reign of 70 years. Her death left the royal family devastated. But the monarchy continued on in the face of grief after a period of mourning. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On September 10th, 2022, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, were joined by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Windsor to view the tributes to the Queen and spent time talking to the crowds. There were mixed reactions from the people there. It was the first time since March 2020 that the two couples had been seen together, 
It appeared the brothers were trying to show the public that the tension had been squashed. The couple then attended the late Queen's funeral, with Harry marching behind the coffin with his family. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death. It was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. In his first speech to the nation, King Charles confirmed that his son, William, would be taking on the title of Prince of Wales and succeeding to be the first in line for succession. As my heir, William, now assumes the Scottish titles, which have meant so much to me. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wissog Cymru, the country whose title I've been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to bring the marginal to the center ground where vital help can be given. As Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine already hold strong connections to Wales, especially after William's work as an Air Force search and rescue pilot on the island of Anglesey. Prince William has made many official visits around the UK, meeting a broad range of people who make a difference in their community. With Kate at his side, he has also carried out overseas tours to the Commonwealth and beyond on behalf of the royal family. The couple's stability and dedication to service has caused them to be likened to Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Like his father, the King, Prince William has undertaken a very modern approach to his royal duties of representing the monarchy, including being a part of a few podcasts and celebrity interviews. On December 8, 2022, the All Access documentary series was released, titled Harry and Meghan. This was the couple's attempt to get across their side of the story, from their meeting and attempts to ingratiate into the royal family to their departure. If the trailers are anything to go by, the tone of it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for people on both sides of the Atlantic, and that's going to make family reconciliation even harder than it already is. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a loss and I'm on their side. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. Pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself.
The series is unlike anything seen before, only close in comparison to the Panorama interview with Princess Diana in 1995. Years of stories half told and whispered through the media were expanded and clarified. The couple's first introduction was via an Instagram post Harry revealed. Meghan spoke about the whirlwind of the pressure of meeting Prince William and Princess Kate for the first time. The Sussex brand, both in the UK and America, uh, is being helped in one way uh, by this Netflix documentary series by bringing uh, the Sussexes back onto our radar screens, if not our TV screens. So uh, there is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind. Uh, and by uh, cooperating with Netflix on a documentary like this, it gets us all talking about them again uh, and it keeps them uh, in the limelight and it keeps their, their brand uh, of Harry and Meghan uh, alive. For some reason, they feel very wronged, which I'm looking forward to finding out why but they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series because everyone now is opening up a can of worms. There's no going back. There is no going back. I think if he wants to get some across, I think we, you know, that's one thing that we always do. We always hate things and that's why you end up with, sadly, so much mental health and. So I think it's important that, you, that, that they can. Royals should be able to express themselves to like everyone else. But I think the problem is it's the way it's been done. You know, doing it on Netflix, obviously for money. I think if he'd done it differently in other ways, for example, there was money, but it was donated to charities and that kind of thing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to... It's, it's a difficult one. It's a really difficult one, but I think if it had been done differently, maybe people would have seen it differently. And I keep saying, I wonder what the end game is, and what I mean by that is, what, what, I wonder what he wants to achieve from it, because, you know, if we're going to be realistic, uh, over the centuries, monarchies have never always been perfect, and there's been, there's been issues, and things have gone wrong, or they've done things wrong, or whatever, and, and sometimes you get people that try to fight against them, including family, and it never ends well. You know, the, the, because monarchy is not just about. This is where people get confused. Not it's not a king and queen. It's not a prince and princess. It's it's, it's more. It's it's more than that. It's, it's when he used the word institution or a firm, that is, or a company, that that's it. And and that will do everything to protect itself. I think if that's what he's trying to fight against, I, I just don't know how that's going to pan out. I don't know how it's going to work, and that's what I don't get. Is what they what he wants to, what will be the achievement at the end of it, other than causing so much upset to him and his family and his father, his brother, that's the bit I'm confused at. I just, I would love it if they could all sort it out somehow. On January 10th, 2023, Prince Harry's autobiography, Spare, was released. This highly anticipated book tells his side of the story from the beginning and delivers lurid details about his life. However, a leaked copy of the book surfaced only days before its release in the UK, with copies going on sale early in Spain. There's been parts of it shared that shocked, surprised me, because there's things that he's talked about that royals just don't talk about. I can expect of a celebrity, I can expect to even maybe even of a politician. But when it comes to royals, there's certain things and certain parts of bodies and things they don't talk about and, and he's been talking about it. So it's a very it's a very frank, I suppose, frank and you know, he he wants people to get to understand what makes them tick, I think, is the easiest way to explain it. Confidently sold at half price already. I think it's terrible for him uh, to reveal his difficulties and unhappiness in public. 
like this. I mean, maybe he thinks it helps him, but I can't see how. I think if he were truly committed to serving other people, he wouldn't be serving his interests as he is. From the leaked Spanish copy, news outlets in the UK shared that in spare, Harry recounts how he was allegedly physically attacked by his older brother, Prince William. Going into never heard before detail, he describes how their relationship fell apart over Harry's relationship with Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. In a moment of high emotion, Harry states William called Meghan difficult, rude, and abusive. Harry seems to be doing everything to avoid responsibility, as he claims William and Kate laughed at his infamous Nazi costume he wore to a party in 2005, which he described in their Netflix documentary as one of the biggest mistakes in my life. So the thing with the royal family is the biggest thing to them is trust. That's the, that's the be all and end all is trust. And once you've lost that, it's gone. And I think, I think that will have been lost. I think that will have gone. However, Harry is still the king's son. I know how much that love is. Just that the queen loved him as well. And I don't think anything could change that. I really don't. I really believe that that kind of love cannot be uh, destroyed. But from the public point of view, there is the embarrassment part and the awkwardness of that. And I think that part. In a sit down interview released before the book with 60 Minutes, Harry shares his wish to be a part of the family again. Well, in Harry's memoir, there's a reported conversation after Prince Philip's funeral where Charles says to his sons, please, boys, don't make my final years miserable. Now, we have no way of knowing that's true or not. Like a lot of the stories in Harry's book, it might be exaggerated, it might be completely false, it might be a verbatim recording of what happened. But I do feel that his referring to his final years is an interesting idea because he has no way of knowing how long he's going to live. I mean, none of us do. But what I think he wants to do during his reign is for it not to be miserable, for it to be an uplifting and cathartic experience. Because I think what he would like is that when he dies, the country to be in a better place than when he became king. I mean, we can only hope that he's proved right, but certainly the spat between his sons is not going to go away anytime soon. I think that the general public, the public at large, would be amazed if they knew the level of manipulation and negotiation that goes on between the royal households and tabloid editors and newspaper editors. to be, I suspect, an element of whinging in this book, which I think, you know, we've kind of got the message now. And if he was to come out with some deep, dark secrets about the royal family that we don't know, I would think that would reflect very badly on him. Surprising and fantastic if this book put all that all to rest and said, from now on, we're going to be a family. It's quite okay for Harry and Meghan to live in America, but to come over here and be part of the family in the holidays. Here we see Harry reaching out emotionally, suggesting that he wants his father and his brother back. So on that level, perhaps uh, a scope for reconciliation, but no contrition on his part. And all of this now builds towards, you know, the prospect of the gathering of the family of the firm at the coronation in May. I think the damage has been done to the relationship through the different media interviews, the book. I don't know if it's, I really don't know if that's fixable. I know the King loves and adores both boys equally. I, I witnessed that a lot on many occasions. So I know how much that love is, just that the Queen loved him as well. And I don't think anything could change that. I really don't. I really believe that that kind of love cannot be destroyed. As far as the, the love between a father and son, I don't know. I, I'd like to think that one day that will be, that that's fixable. One day they can fix that. Even though the relationship and the public might never be the same again, it'd be nice to think that one day behind closed doors they can, they can heal that part of the relationship, which I think is, that is possible, I think. Thank you.
the, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty and she also saw her dedication to Charles because she, she so helps him. She's his soulmate, she's his best friend. And I think that's vice versa. I don't think that's one way. I think they both see that in each other. Camilla was absolutely charming and said how wonderful he was and how much she loved him. And you, you, you saw that this was a true love affair. Charles and Camilla, king and queen. A new era has dawned. King Charles III inherits the heavy burden of the crown. At his side, dutiful, loving and stoic Camilla, queen consort. Camilla Shand was born on the 17th of July, 1947, daughter of Major Bruce Shand and Rosalind Cubitt, growing up alongside her brother and sister, Mark and Annabelle. Charles was born the following year on the 14th of November, 1948. It is no secret that the road to their eventual marriage and very public commitment to each other was not an easy one for the couple. Charles and Camilla were, most probably unfairly, deemed the villains in a story that captivated the nation. Their childhoods were very different, as Charles always knew that he was destined to become king, and he carried the great weight of responsibility and duty on his shoulders from a very young age. In the 1970s, the then Prince Charles was known as one of the world's most eligible bachelors. It was a predestined part of his responsibility as heir to the throne to marry a suitable, aristocratic young woman and to continue the line of succession. By comparison, Camilla led a much more relaxed and idyllic childhood, which many would compare to the blissful, innocent lives of the characters depicted in stories by Enid Blyton. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from a very early age. You know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She was funny, she was a great rider, and she made him laugh. And I think that she's very, very attractive to both men and women because of her personality. She's got a wonderful personality. And, you know, when Charles first met her, I mean, she didn't care what she looked like, but, you know, she was a great horsewoman, she was really sporty, and I suppose she was a challenge, too because, you know, she was basically in love with Andrew Parker Bowles. So I think she had a lot of ingredients that Charles really, really fell in love with, and um, he never really fell out of love with her. So it is, it is a very romantic story. Lucia Santa Cruz, his first brief love affair, had decided that the bachelor prince would get on very well with a friend of hers, the young Camilla Shand. The couple was introduced, and it's reported that Camilla immediately said, my great-grandmother was the mistress of your great-great-grandfather. So how about it? She was referring to her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, who was allegedly the long-term mistress of Charles's great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII. A cheeky and humorous introduction that would mark the start of an epic romance. Charles and Camilla both felt a dangerous but beguiling and instant magnetic attraction, and they quickly struck up a romantic relationship. Camilla would attend Charles's polo matches in Windsor Great Park, and they became known as a couple at the exclusive members-only club, Annabelle's in Berkeley Square. Well, Charles is like very old-fashioned, uh, very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater. Um, and he is also a people pleaser. But he has got a very short temper. And he's after, if you know, if he loses his temper, he's then incredibly sorry. And full of apologies. So he's, he's basically a very kind and thoughtful and very sensitive person. 
in the 1970s, Charles had completed his education at Cambridge University, and he was undergoing training to join the armed forces. Having trained as a jet pilot in the Royal Air Force, Charles went on to pursue his career in the Royal Navy, facing a fast-track six-week training course at Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. He was whisked away from Dartmouth, allegedly as a result of a plot by senior royals to get him away from Camilla. He went on to serve on HMS Norfolk, HMS Minerva and HMS Jupiter, which took him far away from the woman he loved. At the time, Camilla was not deemed an appropriate choice for the wife of the future king, and Charles was still quite young. He publicly stated he wished to marry by the age of 30, but they had not made that all-important commitment to each other. So, whilst Charles was away serving in the Navy, Camilla married her other great love at the time, Andrew Parker Bowles, an army officer, a man with whom she had had an on-off relationship for several years, and with whom Princess Anne had allegedly had a brief affair before she herself married and settled down. I think Charles was very, very hurt when Camilla and Andrew got married and he stayed well out of it. He was away at sea. Charles was said to have been extremely upset about their marriage. He felt he had completely lost someone who had such a special place in his life and in his heart. He was thousands of miles away at sea in a small cabin on board his ship. In steaming heat, Prince Charles's frigate, HMS Minerva, edged her way into Nassau Harbour. A few minutes before, he had formally ended his duties as one of the ship's navigation officers and taken on the role again of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, with his personal standard broken from the mast. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. To get to Rawson's place, where the welcome speeches would be made, the prince walked at speed through an aisle of shouting, yelling Bahamians, with security men running in front to clear a path for him. If it was all a bit confused, the prince showed no sign of being put out by it. The speeches were from a dais placed in front of the old Nassau landmark, the statue of the prince's great-great-great-grandmother, and were brief to the relief of those in full dress with the temperature in the 90s. I'm looking forward to eager it will be five days of ceremonial engagements before Prince Charles rejoins Minerva next Wednesday for two more months of Caribbean patrol as a naval lieutenant. He knew it was going to happen, but he just didn't want to be part of it. So he just stayed well out, well out of the way, and I think he was, he was very, very sad, very sad about it, but he knew that probably there was nothing he could do about it. Well, there wasn't anything he could do about it. Charles remained close friends with the newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. Parker Bowles. He and Andrew would play polo together, and Charles also became godfather to their son, Tom. It is said that in 1979, after the death of Lord Louis Mountbatten, Charles turned to Camilla for a comforting shoulder, and they rekindled the spark from many years previously. However, after his decision to marry Diana, he and Camilla ended any romantic connection until, as Charles himself said, the relationship with Diana became irretrievably broken down. In the years that followed, scandal after scandal would come to haunt both Charles and Camilla. The prince's marriage to Princess Diana began to fall apart as their incompatibilities came to the surface. Diana had done her duty producing the heir to the throne and his younger brother. But their differences were simply too much to bear for them both. Famously, one night at a birthday party for Camilla's sister, Diana confronted Camilla about her relationship with Charles. I think Diana was terrified. She says she was. And she looked for Charles. She was looking. They went to uh, uh, Annabelle Goldsmith's house, um, beautiful house in Richmond, and there was a, it was a big party on, on probably on three or four floors, and she looked around, where's Charles, where's Charles? And then she uh, 
realised that he must be downstairs on the, on the lower level in the sort of basement area. Not a basement like we knew, but a very glamorous downstairs rooms. And she went down there and there they were. And then, you know, she, she obviously got this real anger because you'd have to be very angry to do that and brave. And she just confronted Camilla and said, you know, don't, I'm not stupid, I know what's going on. So Camilla must have been completely taken aback. I mean, you don't expect that to happen. The couple had spent a month apart when they reunited to visit Welsh flood victims. But after a few hours together, Prince Charles went straight back to Scotland. The rumours about their marriage were now presented as fact. The prince was also absent during the princess's 30th birthday celebrations. The press were now calling the marriage a cause for concern. 1992 was the year that things changed in the eyes of the public. Whilst the marriage between Charles and Diana had been falling apart for some time, it would be the year that the nation discovered what was going on behind the palace doors. Diana was secretly working at arm's length with author Andrew Morton on the book Diana, Her True Story, which detailed Charles's relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. Diana, too, had begun extramarital affairs, and by the end of the year, the sad duty to announce their separation befell Prime Minister John Major. The press had a field day, and tapes, books and interviews that would be released one by one caused not only Charles and Diana to separate and later divorce, but also Andrew and Camilla Parker Bowles to go their separate ways. There were so-called secretly recorded tapes everywhere. First, Diana Gate, allegedly a conversation between the princess and a male companion she called Squidgy. Then Camilla Gate, allegedly between Charles and his lover. Then the Highgrove tapes, supposedly of arguments between the prince and princess at their country home. Joining me now in the studio is Andrew Morton, the author of Diana, Her True Story, which brought to the public's attention the state of the royal marriage. Mr Morton, the palace said today that no third party is involved. Can that be right? Ostensibly, no, but uh, uh, given the fact that the Princess of Wales believes that Prince Charles' friendship with another woman, Camilla Parker Bowles, has cast a long shadow over that marriage, uh, must be considered when you look at the failure of this 11-year union. Has the interest of the princess and the friends who fed you the information for your book been satisfied by the outcome of today? I think that we're seeing a situation where the Princess of Wales has everything now that, that um, she could possibly want for while staying inside the royal family. She still has custody of the children, she still has her royal position, she still has her royal duties that which should give her so much satisfaction. And now she's managed to ease out the man in her life, Prince Charles, the man who's given her over the years so much pain. And was your book part of the process? of getting her what you describe as satisfaction. I think that's rather Machiavellian. I set out to write a profile of the Princess of Wales, not just her married life, not just her royal life. I think the public were, were, were quite shocked when the separation was announced, because I think they just thought, well, you know, they, they'll, it's going get, to go on, you know, we're going to have more and more and more dramas and more and more stories. But I think we probably didn't think that, that there would be a separation. Tabloids contacted tonight by ITN, including The Express, The Star and The Sun, said they wouldn't publish the full text. Uh, the press in general is at the centre of a major debate over privacy, with a car cut report uh, looming and the controversy over that even today. So we have taken a decision today not to publish the full transcript of the Camilla Gate tapes. But with thousands of copies of the magazine now being faxed around Britain, some editors are uneasy. Those in the know in London and the chattering classes and those with fax machines to Australia can know what's in it, but the rest of the country doesn't. And that reminds me of the 1930s, when a few editors and posh people in the know knew about the abdication crisis, plain folk didn't. Buckingham Palace tonight declined to comment on the contents of the magazine. There's been no comment from Mrs. Parker Bowles. In the past, her husband has dismissed such allegations as rubbish. It was a conversation uh, uh, Charles and Camilla had um, previously, and it obviously was done by a radio hacker, but it was very intimate, regardless of the fact that Camilla was absolutely charming and said how wonderful he was and how much she loved him. I mean, you, you, you saw that this was a true love affair, but it was just awful. 
And I think all the foreign press was saying, you know, there's, there's no way this man can ever be king. It was that embarrassing. Would the princess be sad, relieved? How would she be tonight, now that all this is at? She is relieved that, at last, the lying is over, the masquerade is over, the, 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 the whole thing is out in the open. And Prince Charles? Well, for his part, obviously, it's a, it's a sad day, because he will have to soldier on, knowing that more revelations about his private life, his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles, may well come out in the future. You think that's a possibility, that there'll be more revelations about third parties, despite what the palace is? The fact that the Camilla Gate tapes, the so-called Camilla Gate tapes, have not yet been published remains a sword of Damocles hanging over Prince Charles's head and could fatally damage his position. I think Camilla was in a very, very unpleasant situation. She was almost became a prisoner in her own home. She was vilified. She was absolutely the hated by everyone. I mean, actually, the Queen felt very sorry for her. She called her that much maligned woman. Because, you know, they've known the Parker Bowles is all, you know, all their life. Whilst the 90s proved an extremely challenging decade for Charles and Camilla, with divorces and scandals, they were finally free to continue their relationship. But it turned out not to be quite so simple. The nation's sweetheart of the time, Diana, died in a tragic accident in August 1997. A grieving public would not take kindly to Charles and Camilla flaunting their relationship, and so the couple kept their relationship private and out of the public eye. Especially after Diana died. I mean, then she was even more of a prisoner. And so began a period where Camilla's life was reduced to being very much in the background and kept almost entirely from public view and, importantly, kept away from the prying eyes of the media. It was a challenging time for Charles and Camilla, but they patiently persevered. In an attempt to try and restore the prince's reputation, Mark Bolland was appointed to help with Charles's public image. Having lost Camilla once, Charles was not going to allow the courtiers to dissuade him from his relationship. He declared that Camilla was a non-negotiable part of his life, and though this was met with disapproval in some quarters, they continued their relationship. So Mark Bolland's task was to enhance both Charles and Camilla's profiles. As heir to the throne, he really needed the support of the public. Charles has not simply been a king in waiting. He has got on with his job and more than fulfilled his duty, focusing on his charitable pursuits and working extremely hard to have a meaningful and purposeful life. The Prince's Trust, the Environment and the Duchy of Cornwall have all made an enormous positive impact on the lives of millions of people. He has already more than done his duty to the nation. Although a monarch is not chosen by public vote, nonetheless, public opinion is extremely important in maintaining confidence in the institution of our monarchy. In the Queen's historic and record-breaking reign, she had ample time to prove her ability to fulfil the role of monarch. Until the end of her life, she was held in very high regard by the public, which was part of what made her reign such an enormous success. She embodied everything the people believed it means to be a Great Britain. Unfortunately for Charles, his public image was badly damaged after his marriage to Diana ended. He was vilified by the media and was struggling to rejuvenate his reputation. Some were calling for him not to take his place in the line of succession and to instead let Prince William take his place when the time came. Well, Charles is a great believer that, that time is a healer, and he, he is, in essence, right. And he thought, if we take it very gently, we, we'll get it right, and people will accept Camilla because she's wonderful. And people have accepted Camilla, but it did take a long time. And there's a lot of people that will never accept her. But it did take a long time, and they did it very gradually. Then they became under so much pressure for the first picture of them together. And they thought of all different ways of doing it. Maybe they just should release a picture of them together. Maybe they should arrange for them to be out somewhere and, and 
press would just happen to be there. But in the end, they decided to do it at Camilla's sister's birthday party at the Ritz. And they let everybody know, or their press officer let everybody know that they would be walking out of the party together. So there was an unbelievable bank of photographers. And even now, when they show this moment, they put a warning on television, flash photography. It was just like crazy. Um, but people got the picture of Charles and, and Camilla together, so that was the beginning. In 1999, Charles and Camilla decided enough time had passed since Diana's death that they would be happy to reveal their commitment to each other as a couple. Outside the Ritz, they're ready for one of the shots of the year, Charles and Camilla together at last. Tonight, it's expected the couple will leave a birthday party together, finally acknowledging in public a relationship that started back in the 70s. If you ask any photographer which the picture they want to take, it's Prince Charles with Camilla Parker Bowles. It's the one great picture left to take. How important is it not to miss the shot? Oh, it's, it's, you can't afford to miss it. You know, you've got to get the two of them together walking down those steps. If you get that, you're there. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles about to come out now. As they left the Ritz, the photographers crowded outside. The flashes of the cameras were blinding as the glamorous and smiling couple walked down the red carpet to their waiting car. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public quite clearly coming down the steps of the Ritz after the party for Cam the 50th birthday party for Camilla's sister. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The photograph that people have waited so long, the picture that people have waited so long to see. Quite brief, really, out of the doors, down the steps, into the car, and driving away. An absolute cascade of flash bulbs, only a few seconds, but the picture, the scene that says so much. Overnight, the press has rolled, turning 15 seconds on the steps of the Ritz into history. Once rumours gathered pace that the couple would appear together here at the Ritz Hotel, royal watchers were out in force in a type of media interest not seen since the days of Diana, Princess of Wales, and all to get that one important picture that shows the charade is finally over. Well, the public have been longing to see them together, so I think they, they, they liked that. But there was a huge, huge... Uh, animosity to Camilla, especially in America, where, where they love Diana and still do. You know, in America, everything's about glamour and how you look, and they just thought, well, she's not glamorous enough. And they didn't think that maybe this is, she was exactly the sort of woman that Prince Charles needed because they didn't really know him. This is good. This is what he should have done a long time ago. You know, obviously, they love each other. Now they can get on with their lives. And I think the press will afford them a, a fair degree of privacy now. I think that he had to suppress that love. He uh, isolated himself uh, from that relationship for the first five, six years of his marriage out of a, a sense of a duty to the decision that he had made. Did he always love her? Yes, and now you see the fruit of that. Slowly but surely, public perception began to warm, and so did relationships within the royal family. The Queen accepted an invitation to attend the 60th birthday party of the King of Greece at Highgrove, knowing that Camilla would also be in attendance. As the first public meeting between Camilla and the Queen, it was a strong signal that she was beginning to acknowledge and even accept their relationship. That year, Charles had also taken Camilla as an unofficial companion to various engagements in Scotland. Prince Charles was in the driving seat this morning as he left Highgrove, knowing the road is now officially clear for him to continue his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. He's said to be delighted that the Queen has finally acknowledged his long-term companion. It took until 2001, at an event for the National Osteoporosis Society, for us to catch a glimpse into the couple's affectionate side when they shared their first public kiss. Camilla greeted Charles with a kiss. It was the first time the couple had shown such affection in public. Also at the reception, some 300 guests, including ex-King Constantine of Greece and his wife Anne-Marie, whom Camilla knows well. 
the view has changed of Camilla, Dutch Cobble, because at one point she was vilified by the media. The, you know, that was always negative. It was, you know, home wrecker and all this kind of thing and having the affairs and the affair with the prince and everything. And, and so people just didn't want her, didn't like her. I remember that. I remember when I joined the household and somebody knew that I was the butler and just said, oh, I don't, don't like her, you know? And I remember thinking, wow, really? You don't know her, but you don't like her. Um, and that's changed to where today, I don't remember, do you? I don't remember the last time I read anything negative or bad about her. I can't remember. Uh, it's always positive, it's always good. As far as PR goes, you know, she's done an amazing job at, I think, at changing public opinion. So I remember one morning, the television was on in the other room. And suddenly we had breaking news. And it said the Prince of Wales has announced his engagement. And we worked for him, but we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. And I remember getting into the room and watching this, and we were all like, wow, they're engaged, and we didn't know. Sir, you said that you're right to be my wife, sir. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news, and when the Cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole government. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. If you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. 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 How are you feeling, ma'am? I'm just, about, I'm just coming down to work. Did he get down on one knee to propose? Of course. <laughs> what else? Good things come to those who wait. That was certainly true for Charles and Camilla. Having spent years building their public image and warming the hearts and minds of those closest to them, a very special announcement was made. In February 2005, Charles and Camilla were engaged to be married, 35 years after having first met. I think it's very difficult to know William and Harry's relationship with Camilla. I think that, that they certainly didn't. And then William was the first one to meet Camilla, which was slightly by accident. Uh, he met her at St James's Palace, where, where he, he, his father was living at the time. And he... Um, I think, you know, Camilla just didn't interfere in their lives and they and I think they really warmed to her. No, she is um she's she's a wonderful woman and she's made our father very, very happy, which is the most important thing. William and I love her to bits, get on really well with her. Um, and as far as I see it, nothing's changed. I'm not around that much, I'm at Sandhurst. William's just finished university, now he's doing a bit of work here and there. So um, we're not around that much anyway. But when we are around, everyone's happy, everyone's fine, you know. Your Royal Highness, uh, eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you, you are feeling? You've heard of it, have you? <laughs> Princess William and Harry are feeling yeah. at the prospect of the marriage. Very happy. Very pleased. Be a good day. Yeah. Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. Uh -huh. Prince William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. With one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. I think in the early days, in fairness to her, I think it was obviously slightly nerve-wracking as well because she was marrying into the family. She obviously knew the family very well, but suddenly she was marrying into the family and was going to become, well, one of the, the, the most senior members of the royal family. So I think there was quite a bit of pressure for her, but she's never, in all the years I was there, she never changed. She was always the same. It was not all smooth sailing. 
They scheduled their wedding for the 8th of April 2005, but unfortunately, Pope John Paul II died. Prince Charles was expected to attend the funeral on behalf of the Queen, so they had to postpone their wedding until the following day. As this was a last-minute change, much of the memorabilia from their wedding day was dated incorrectly. On the 9th of April 2005, Charles and Camilla married in a civil ceremony at Windsor Guildhall, with an approving Prince William as best man, and both William and Harry were delighted with their father's newfound happiness. Charles and Camilla were finally wet. Though a much more scaled-down event than Charles's first wedding, it was clear the day was a very happy one for the royal couple. I was busy working at Highgrove, a phone went. One of my colleagues got the phone and he said, oh, there's a phone call for you. And it was um, one of the prince's top aides, one of his top aides. And he said, I've, I've been asked to phone you by the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. He says, because they would like to personally invite you to the wedding. Because as a member of staff, you haven't completed the amount of time, but they're sending you a private invitation. I remember that as if it was yesterday. I remember exactly where the, the call took place. I remember my thoughts. I remember the phone. I remember everything. I remember I was trying not to get upset because I was so emotional and like, excited about this. And it was unbelievable. I mean, it was amazing because suddenly there I am as a guest to the Prince of Wales and Duck Cornwall and with all the celeb friends, with other royals, um, VIPs, dignitaries, prime ministers, and I'm there as a guest. The role of the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall was varied. Together and separately, Charles and Camilla took on hundreds of patronages, supporting causes to aid a greater awareness of important causes, and also to raise much needed funds for the charities concerned. Charles and Camilla did a great deal of work together. They became important ambassadors for the United Kingdom. In their overseas tours, requested by the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, they worked hard to maintain diplomatic ties with countries across the globe. I think she's, they're, they're wonderful together. In that royal world, you, you really can't be on your own. It's very, very difficult. You know, she is the, the perfect person to stand at Prince Charles's side. Their first official overseas tour together was to the USA in 2005. Many comparisons were being made to previous tours by Charles and Diana, but to the great relief of all concerned, the trip was enormously successful, with Camilla being warmly welcomed by the American public who really appreciated her down-to-earth attitude. Their first stop was at Ground Zero in New York. Last night saw the first true test of this royal visit, a high-profile reception at New York's Museum of Modern Art. A cross-section of people attended, including some celebrities and the city's elite. I think she's uh, got a great sense of humour and uh, she, you need it. So. Yesterday, they began their tour with a gesture that will be widely appreciated in America, a visit to Ground Zero. The Duchess on her inaugural foreign trip, laying flowers at the site where nearly 3,000 people died on that September day. In enduring memory of our shared grief, the royal couple wrote, and all around them, the memories of lives lost. 67 Britons were killed on September the 11th, and Prince Charles and Camilla dedicated a small garden to their memory. Both my wife and I were, were profoundly moved by what we saw there. And I think it is so fitting that their lives will be commemorated in this garden. If over the next week Americans tune in to this visit at all, their curiosity will be centered on Camilla. In recent years, following the height of the coronavirus pandemic, the Prince and Duchess were the first members of the royal family to undertake an overseas tour when they travelled to Jordan and Egypt and were welcomed by old friends, King Abdullah II and Queen Rania. On the 70th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's accession to the throne, Her Majesty released a statement saying, And when, in the fullness of time, my son Charles becomes king, 
I know you will give him and his wife Camilla the same support that you have given me, and it is my sincere wish that, when that time comes, Camilla will be known as Queen Consort as she continues her own loyal service. Having stated after their wedding that Camilla would be known as Princess Consort, this was a clear statement from the boss that Camilla had successfully won the hearts and minds of the nation, as well as her mother-in-law. The Queen has personally shown her appreciation for Camilla's work and her loyalty to the Crown, clearly expressing her wish that she take the title many thought she once did not deserve, Queen Consort. Following the death of her beloved husband, Prince Philip, in 2021, the Queen began to slow down in her royal duties. She has faced periods of illness, including catching coronavirus, and recovery took its toll on our remarkable Queen. Charles and Camilla began to take on more duties and engagements previously undertaken by the Queen. In that way, they have shown together that they are truly capable of stepping into her shoes. Which I think it's important to the Queen because I think she's a huge believer that as the wife of a king, that that lady should be Queen Consort. That's how she she sees it, and I think that's really important. So that's why she's what has asked all of us to acknowledge that wish and, and accept her as as the wife of Prince Charles as as a Queen Consort when he becomes king. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On the 8th of September 2022, Queen Elizabeth II died. And at that moment, Charles and Camilla became King and Queen a moment Charles would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen was under medical supervision, and one by one, members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. Charles and Anne made it to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second great Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. Broadcasters announced her death and stated the King and Queen will return to London the following day. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy and endeavouring to follow his mother's example of duty and service, Charles stepped up to his duties as King. After greeting crowds at Buckingham Palace, Charles and Camilla walked through the Golden Gates as King and Queen for the first time. On Saturday, the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace to undertake the vital and centuries-old tradition of proclaiming the new king. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. God save the king! For the first time in history, this historic ceremony was filmed and shown live on television around the world. The Privy Council proclaimed His Majesty as King Charles III. Camilla and William accompanied Charles as witnesses to the ceremony. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. In the days following his mother's death, King Charles, accompanied by Queen Camilla, visited the different nations of the United Kingdom, being mostly warmly welcomed. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles was very visible, following his mother's example of trying to connect with the nation's people. He met with the crowds waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state and visited those across the country who were grieving too. On the 19th of September, playing an important role in the late Queen's funeral, King Charles walked behind his mother's coffin, alongside his siblings and sons. A poignant moment indeed. 
Arriving at St. George's Chapel, a smaller funeral service took place. For the first time, the chorus sang, God Save the King. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. The first rendition in St. George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it. It was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. On May the 6th, 2023, the first crowning of a monarch in 70 years will take place. The coronation has been planned for many years, referred to as Operation Golden Orb. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, the pomp and tradition will still feature. Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he is no longer able to be outspoken, nor to speak so freely on his passions and opinions. Instead, he must be seen to remain unbiased and objective. After so many years in training, King Charles has taken on his duties and responsibilities with ease, dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents and state officials, and attending various state engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride, recently hosting South African President Ramaphosa at the first state visit and state banquet since his mother's death. Queen Camilla has begun to make her mark as queen. Speaking at an event at Buckingham Palace, she detailed her concern over the global pandemic of violence against women. Camilla also helped to retrieve the ubiquitous Paddington Bears left outside Buckingham Palace following the Queen's death and in cooperation with the Barnardo's children's charity, she made sure they each found new homes with young children. In a story of love and loss, heartbreak and happiness, Charles and Camilla remained united, king and queen. Their resilience following torment by the media has ultimately proved their determination and the overarching principle of duty and service which guides their lives. The, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty and she also saw her dedication to Charles because she, she so helps him. She's his soulmate, she's his best friend. And I think that's face face. I don't think that's one way. I think they both see that in each other. And, you know, when you see them together and they're on the same wavelength, I think the Queen and Prince Philip had it. I think Prince Charles and Camilla has, have got it. I think William and Kate have got it. And they're really lucky. They're really lucky that they've got that, that royal connection. Eventually, history will decide the successes and challenges for the new king and queen. But whatever they do in their new roles, they will do together. Your Royal Highness, uh, eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask Harry. you how you, you are you, feeling? Heard how in it, particular <laughs> Princess William and Harry are feeling at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy. Very pleased. Be a good day. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. Camilla was absolutely charming and said how wonderful he was and how much she loved him, and you, you, you saw that this was a true love affair. 
She's his soulmate, she's his best friend. And I think that's vice versa. I don't think that's one way. I think they both see that in each other. Did he get down on one knee to propose? <laughs> The Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty and she also saw her dedication to Charles because she she so helps him. Charles and Camilla, King and Queen. A new era has dawned. King Charles III inherits the heavy burden of the crown. At his side, dutiful, loving and stoic Camilla, Queen Consort. It is no secret that the road to their eventual marriage and very public commitment to each other was not an easy one for the couple. Charles and Camilla were, most probably unfairly, deemed the villains in a story that captivated the nation. Camilla Shand was born on the 17th of July 1947, daughter of Major Bruce Shand and Rosalind Cubitt. Growing up alongside her brother and sister, Mark and Annabelle. Charles was born the following year on the 14th of November, 1948. Radio gave no advantage to watchers at the palace. The glad tidings went out everywhere. This is the BBC Home Service. It has been announced officially from Buckingham Palace during the past hour that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. today and that Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. Their childhoods were very different, as Charles always knew that he was destined to become king, and he carried the great weight of responsibility and duty on his shoulders from a very young age. By comparison, Camilla led a much more relaxed and idyllic childhood, which many would compare to the blissful, innocent lives of the characters depicted in stories by Enid Blyton. In the 1970s, the then Prince Charles was known as one of the world's most eligible bachelors. It was a predestined part of his responsibility as heir to the throne to marry a suitable, aristocratic young woman and to continue the line of succession. Well, Charles is like very old fashioned, a very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater um, and he is also a people pleaser but he has got a very short temper and he's after if you know if he loses his temper he's then incredibly sorry and full of apologies so he's he's basically a very kind and thoughtful and very sensitive person lucia santa cruz his first brief love affair had decided that the bachelor prince would get on very well with a friend of hers, the young Camilla Shand. The couple was introduced, and it's reported that Camilla immediately said, my great-grandmother was the mistress of your great-great-grandfather. So how about it? She was referring to her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, who was allegedly the long-term mistress of Charles's great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII. A cheeky and humorous introduction that would mark the start of an epic romance. Charles and Camilla both felt a dangerous but beguiling and instant magnetic attraction, and they quickly struck up a romantic relationship. Camilla would attend Charles's polo matches in Windsor Great Park, and they became known as a couple at the exclusive members-only club, Annabelle's in Berkeley Square. However, in the 1970s, Charles had completed his education at Cambridge University and he was undergoing training to join the armed forces. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, a very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. 
I think responsibility is the, the most important thing. Is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people. And the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from a very early age. You know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She was funny. She was a great rider and she made him laugh. And I think that she's very, very attractive to both men and women because of her personality. She's got a wonderful personality. And, you know, when Charles first met her, I mean, she didn't care what she looked like, but, you know, she was a great horsewoman. She was really sporty. And I suppose she was a challenge, too, because, you know, she was basically in love with Andrew Parker Bowles. So I think she had a lot of ingredients that Charles really, really fell in love with, and um, he never really fell out of love with her. So it is, it is a very romantic story. Having trained as a jet pilot in the Royal Air Force, Charles went on to pursue his career in the Royal Navy, facing a fast-track six-week training course at Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. He was whisked away from Dartmouth, allegedly as a result of a plot by senior royals, to get him away from Camilla. He went on to serve on HMS Norfolk, HMS Minerva, and HMS Jupiter, which took him far away from the woman he loved. In steaming heat, Prince Charles's frigate, HMS Minerva, edged her way into Nassau Harbor. A few minutes before, he had formally ended his duties as one of the ship's navigation officers and taken on the role again of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, with his personal standard broken from the mast. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. To get to Rawson's place, where the welcome speeches would be made, the prince walked at speed through an aisle of shouting, yelling Bahamians, with security men running in front to clear a path for him. If it was all a bit confused, the prince showed no sign of being put out by it. The speeches were from a dais placed in front of the old Nassau landmark, the statue of the prince's great-great-great-grandmother, and were brief to the relief of those in full dress with the temperature in the 90s. Now we're looking forward to eager anticipation of visiting Nassau. There will be five days of ceremonial engagements before Prince Charles rejoins Minerva next Wednesday for two more months of Caribbean patrol as a naval lieutenant. At the time, Camilla was not deemed an appropriate choice for the wife of the future king and Charles was still quite young. He publicly stated he wished to marry by the age of 30, but they had not made that all-important commitment to each other. So, whilst Charles was away serving in the Navy, Camilla married her other great love at the time, Andrew Parker Bowles, an army officer, a man with whom she had had an on-off relationship for several years, and with whom Princess Anne had allegedly had a brief affair before she herself married and settled down. I think Charles was very, very hurt when Camilla and Andrew got married and he stayed well out of it. He was away at sea and um, he knew it was going to happen, but he just didn't want to be part of it. So he just stayed well out, well out of the way. And I think he was, uh, he was very, very sad, very sad about it, but he knew that Probably there was nothing he could do about it. Charles was said to have been extremely upset about their marriage. He felt he had completely lost someone who had such a special place in his life and in his heart. He was thousands of miles away at sea in a small cabin on board his ship. Charles remained close friends with the newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. Parker Bowles. He and Andrew would play polo together and Charles also became godfather to their son, Tom. It is said that in 1979, after the death of Lord Louis Mountbatten, Charles turned to Camilla for a comforting shoulder, and they rekindled the spark from many years previously. However, after his decision to marry Diana, he and Camilla ended any romantic connection until, as Charles himself said, the relationship with Diana became irretrievably broken down. In the years that followed, scandal after scandal would come to haunt both Charles and Camilla. The prince's marriage to Princess Diana began to fall apart as their incompatibilities came to the surface. 
Diana had done her duty, producing the heir to the throne and his younger brother. But their differences were simply too much to bear for them both. The couple had spent a month apart when they reunited to visit Welsh flood victims. But after a few hours together, Prince Charles went straight back to Scotland. The rumours about their marriage were now presented as fact. The prince was also absent during the princess's 30th birthday celebrations. The press were now calling the marriage a cause for concern. Famously, one night at a birthday party for Camilla's sister, Diana confronted Camilla about her relationship with Charles. I think Diana was terrified. She says she was. And she looked for Charles. She was looking. They went to uh, uh, Annabelle Goldsmith's house, um, beautiful house in Richmond, and there was a, it was a big party on, on probably on three or four floors, and she looked around, where's Charles, where's Charles? And then she uh, realised that he must be downstairs on the, on the lower level in the sort of basement area. Not a basement like we know, but a very glamorous downstairs rooms. And she went down there, and there they were. And then, you know, she, she obviously got this real anger because you'd have to be very angry to do that and brave. And she just confronted Camilla and said, you know, don't, I'm not stupid, I know what's going on. So Camilla must have been completely taken aback. I mean, you don't expect that to happen. 1992 was the year that things changed in the eyes of the public. Whilst the marriage between Charles and Diana had been falling apart for some time, it would be the year that the nation discovered what was going on behind the palace doors. Diana was secretly working at arm's length with author Andrew Morton on the book Diana, Her True Story, which detailed Charles's relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. Diana, too, had begun extramarital affairs, and by the end of the year, the sad duty to announce their separation befell Prime Minister John Major. The press had a field day, and tapes, books and interviews that would be released one by one caused not only Charles and Diana to separate and later divorce, but also Andrew and Camilla Parker Bowles to go their separate ways. Joining me now in the studio is Andrew Morton, the author of Diana, Her True Story, which brought to the public's attention the state of the royal marriage. Mr Morton, the palace said today that no third party is involved. Can that be right? Ostensibly, no, but uh, uh, given the fact that the Princess of Wales believes that Prince Charles's friendship with another woman, Camilla Parker Bowles, has cast a long shadow over that marriage, uh, must be considered when you look at the failure of this 11-year union. Has the interest of the princess and the friends who fed you the information for your book been satisfied by the outcome of today? I think that we're seeing a situation where the Princess of Wales has everything now that, that um, she could possibly want for while staying inside the royal family. She still has custody of the children, she still has her royal position, she still has her royal duties, that, which would give her so much satisfaction. And now she's managed to ease out the man in her life, Prince Charles, the man who's given her over the years so much pain. And was your book part of the process of getting her what you describe as satisfaction? I think that's rather Machiavellian. I set out to write a profile of the Princess of Wales, not just her married life, not just her royal life. Would the princess be sad, relieved? How would she be tonight, now that all this is out? She is relieved that, at last, the lying is over, the masquerade is over, the, 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 the whole thing is out in the open. And Prince Charles? Well, for his part, obviously, it's a, it's a sad day, because he will have to soldier on, knowing that more revelations about his private life, his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles, may well come out in the future. You think that's a possibility, that there'll be more revelations about third parties, despite what the palace says? The fact that the Camilla Gate tapes, the so-called Camilla Gate tapes, have not yet been published remains a sword of Damocles hanging over Prince Charles's head and could fatally damage his position. There were so-called secretly recorded tapes everywhere. First, Diana Gate, allegedly a conversation between the princess and a male companion she called Squidgy. Then Camilla Gate, allegedly between Charles and his lover. Then the Highgrove tapes, supposedly of arguments between the prince and princess at their country home. I think the public were, were, were quite shocked when the separation was announced because I think they just thought, 
well, you know, they, they'll, it's going to get uh, go on. You know, we're going to have more and more and more dramas and more and more stories. But I think we probably didn't think that that there would be a separation. So right after what the Queen called her Annus Horribilis of '92, when the fire of Windsor Castle, the separation of uh, Charles and Diana, um, the divorce of uh, or, or the separation of Andrew and Fergie. Princess Anne was already divorced and remarried. Um, everything, everything had gone wrong. And then right on top of that came what we called the Charles and Camilla tapes. And they were published in January 93. Tabloids contacted tonight by ITN, including The Express, The Star and The Sun, said they wouldn't publish the full text. Uh, the press in general is at the center of a major debate over privacy with the car cut report uh, looming and the controversy over that even today. So we have taken a decision today not to publish the full transcript of the Camilla Gate tapes. It was a conversation that uh, uh, Charles and Camilla had um, previously and it obviously was done by a radio hacker but it was very intimate regardless of the fact that Camilla was absolutely charming and said how wonderful he was and how much she loved him, and you, you, you saw that this was a true love affair, but it was just awful. And I think all the foreign press were saying, you know, there's, there's no way this man can ever be king. It was that embarrassing. But with thousands of copies of the magazine now being faxed around Britain, some editors are uneasy. Those in the know in London and the chattering classes and those with fax machines to Australia can know what's in it, but the rest of the country doesn't. And that reminds me of the 1930s, when a few editors and posh people in the know knew about the abdication crisis, plain folk didn't. Buckingham Palace tonight declined to comment on the contents of the magazine. There's been no comment from Mrs. Parker Bowles. In the past, her husband has dismissed such allegations as rubbish. And in a way, this interview with Dimbleby that, that, that Prince Charles did, it was to go with his biography. But when you actually speak to the royal person and they, they say things, they're taken out of context and that they should know that. And Dimbleby asked Prince Charles, really, when, when his affair with Camilla started, and he said, when his marriage had irrevocably broken down. Until it became irretrievably broken down. Us both having tried. Everyone was writing frantically, and it was an enormous story. And, you know, it, he'd admitted adultery, basically, on television, which was probably not a very sensible thing to do. But I think Charles felt also that maybe it was good to get it out there, and eventually uh, it would all be forgotten. But, I mean, sadly for Charles, it has never been forgotten. So you can imagine, it's, it's, not, it's not a very... Um, happy or encouraging thing when this sort of business happens. So obviously it would be nice if, you know, if it could be over and done with. I mean, it has happened. That is that, is that regrettably. The woman at the centre of these latest royal revelations, Camilla Parker Bowles, was today at home with her family in Wiltshire. It's claimed in the second extract from the Jonathan Dimbleby biography, which is published in today's Sunday Times, that she and the Prince of Wales have had three separate affairs. I think Camilla was in a very, very unpleasant situation. She was almost became a prisoner in her own home. She was vilified. She was absolutely the hated by everyone. I mean, actually, the Queen felt very sorry for her. She called her that much maligned woman. Because, you know, they, they've known the Parker Bowles is all, you know, all their life. You know, Andrew's father was a great friend of the Queen Mother, and they were all, uh, you, know, you know, acquaintances. So, um, so the Queen felt desperately sad for Camilla, and it was, it was a very, very, very difficult time for her, especially after Diana died. I mean, then she was even more of a prisoner. Whilst the 90s proved an extremely challenging decade for Charles and Camilla, with divorces and scandals, they were finally free to continue their relationship. But it turned out not to be quite so simple. The nation's sweetheart of the time, Diana, died in a tragic accident in August 1997. 
A grieving public would not take kindly to Charles and Camilla flaunting their relationship, and so the couple kept their relationship private and out of the public eye. And so began a period where Camilla's life was reduced to being very much in the background and kept almost entirely from public view and, importantly, kept away from the prying eyes of the media. It was a challenging time for Charles and Camilla, but they patiently persevered. And another one. Back in Stevenage, the prince himself was on message for romance. When handed a mug for Valentine's Day, he said, that'll be very useful. It's a Valentine's show. Is it? <laughs> Always see great with me. That's very kind. It'll be very useful. Charles has not simply been a king in waiting. He has got on with his job and more than fulfilled his duty, focusing on his charitable pursuits and working extremely hard to have a meaningful and purposeful life. The Prince's Trust, the environment, and the Duchy of Cornwall have all made an enormous positive impact on the lives of millions of people. He has already more than done his duty to the nation. However, Charles had a major problem. As heir to the throne, he really needed the support of the public. Although a monarch is not chosen by public vote, Nonetheless, public opinion is extremely important in maintaining confidence in the institution of our monarchy. In the Queen's historic and record-breaking reign, she had ample time to prove her ability to fulfill the role of monarch. Until the end of her life, she was held in very high regard by the public, which was part of what made her reign such an enormous success. She embodied everything the people believed it means to be a Great Britain. Unfortunately for Charles, his public image was badly damaged after his marriage to Diana ended. He was vilified by the media and was struggling to rejuvenate his reputation. Some were calling for him not to take his place in the line of succession and to instead let Prince William take his place when the time came. In an attempt to try and restore the prince's reputation, Mark Bolland was appointed to help with Charles's public image. Having lost Camilla once, Charles was not going to allow the courtiers to dissuade him from his relationship. He declared that Camilla was a non-negotiable part of his life, and though this was met with disapproval in some quarters, they continued their relationship. So Mark Bolland's task was to enhance both Charles and Camilla's profiles. In 1999, Charles and Camilla decided enough time had passed since Diana's death that they would be happy to reveal their commitment to each other as a couple. Well, Charles is a great believer that, that time is a healer, and he, he is, in essence, right. And he thought, if we take it very gently, um, we, we'll get it right, and people will accept Camilla because she's wonderful. And people have accepted Camilla, but it did take a long time. And there's a lot of people that will never accept her. But it did take a long time, and they did it very gradually. Then they became under so much pressure for the first picture of them together. And they thought of all different ways of doing it. Maybe they just should release a picture of them together. Maybe they should arrange for them to be out somewhere uh, and... and press would just happen to be there, but in the end they decided to do it at Camilla's sister's birthday party at the Ritz. And they let everybody know, or their press officer let everybody know, that they would be walking out of the party together. So there was an unbelievable bank of photographers, and even now when they show this moment, they put a warning on television, flash photography. It was just like crazy. Um, but people got the picture of Charles and, and Camilla together, so that was the beginning. Outside the Ritz, they're ready for one of the shots of the year. Charles and Camilla together at last. Tonight, it's expected the couple will leave a birthday party together 
finally acknowledging in public a relationship that started back in the 70s. If you ask any photographer which the picture they want to take, it's Prince Charles with Camilla Parker Bowles. It's the one great picture left to take. How important is it not to miss the shot? Oh, it's, it's, you can't afford to miss it. You know, you've got to get the two of them together walking down those steps. If you get that, you're there. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles about to come out now. As they left the Ritz, the photographers crowded outside. The flashes of the cameras were blinding as the glamorous and smiling couple walked down the red carpet to their waiting car. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public quite clearly coming down the steps of the Ritz after the party for Cam the 50th birthday party for Camilla's sister. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The photograph the people have waited so long, the picture the people have waited so long to see. Quite brief, really, out of the doors, down the steps, into the car, and driving away. An absolute cascade of flash bulbs, only a few seconds, but the picture, the scene that says so much. Overnight, the press has rolled, turning 15 seconds on the steps of the Ritz into history. Once rumours gathered pace that the couple would appear together here at the Ritz Hotel, royal watchers were out in force in a type of media interest not seen since the days of Diana, Princess of Wales, and all to get that one important picture that shows the charade is finally over. This is good. This is what he should have done a long time ago. You know, obviously, they love each other. Now they can get on with their lives. And I think the press will afford them a, a fair degree of privacy now. Well, the public have been longing to see them together, so I think they, they, they liked that. But there was a huge, huge uh, animosity to Camilla, especially in America, where, where they love Diana and still do. Um, and they... they you know, in America, everything's about glamour and how you look, and they just thought, well, she's not glamorous enough. And they didn't think that maybe this is, she was exactly the sort of woman that Prince Charles needed because they didn't really know him. Slowly but surely, public perception began to warm, and so did relationships within the royal family. The Queen accepted an invitation to attend the 60th birthday party of the King of Greece at Highgrove, knowing that Camilla would also be in attendance. As the first public meeting between Camilla and the Queen, it was a strong signal that she was beginning to acknowledge and even accept their relationship. That year, Charles had also taken Camilla as an unofficial companion to various engagements in Scotland. Prince Charles was in the driving seat this morning as he left Highgrove, knowing the road is now officially clear for him to continue his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. He's said to be delighted that the Queen has finally acknowledged his long-term companion. It took until 2001, at an event for the National Osteoporosis Society, for us to catch a glimpse into the couple's affectionate side, when they shared their first public kiss. Camilla greeted Charles with a kiss. It was the first time the couple had shown such affection in public. Also at the reception, some 300 guests, including ex-King Constantine of Greece and his wife Anne-Marie, whom Camilla knows well. I think that he had to suppress that love. He isolated himself uh, from that relationship for the first five, six years of his marriage out of a, a sense of a duty to the decision that he had made. Did he always love her? Yes, and now you see the fruit of that. The view has changed of Camilla, Dutch Como, because at one point she was vilified by the media. The, you know, it was always negative. It was, you know, home wrecker and all this kind of thing, and having the affairs and the affair with the prince and everything. And and so people just didn't want her, didn't like her. I remember that. I remember when I joined the household and somebody knew that I was the butler and just said, "Oh, I don't." don't like her, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, really? You don't know her, but you don't like her. Um, and that's changed to where today, I don't remember, do you? I don't remember the last time I read anything negative or bad about her. I can't remember. Uh, it's always positive, it's always good. As far as PR goes, you know, she's done an amazing job at, I think, at changing public opinion. As 
as he left, the prince was asked if he'd seen anything Mrs Parker Bowles might care for. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news, and when the Cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole government. So I remember one morning, the television was on in the other room, and suddenly we had breaking news, and it said the Prince of Wales has announced his engagement. and. We worked for him, but we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. And I remember getting into the room and watching this, and we were all like, wow, they're engaged, and we didn't know. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. If you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. Congratulations. How are you feeling, ma'am? Get down on one knee to propose. <laughs> Good things come to those who wait. That was certainly true for Charles and Camilla. Having spent years building their public image and warming the hearts and minds of those closest to them, a very special announcement was made. In February 2005, Charles and Camilla were engaged to be married. 35 years after having first met. I think the early days, in fairness to her, I think it was obviously slightly nerve-wracking as well because she was marrying into the family. She obviously knew the family very well, but suddenly she was marrying into the family and was going to become, well, one of the, the, the most senior members of the royal family. So I think there was quite a bit of pressure for her, but she's never... In all the years I was there, she never changed. She was always the same. Your Royal Highness, uh, mm -hmm. eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you, you are you, feeling? Heard how in particular, it, <laughs> Princess William and Harry are feeling at the prospect of the marriage. Very happy. Very pleased. Be a good day. Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. <laughs> Prince William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. The one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. I think it's very difficult to know William and Harry's relationship with Camilla. I think that, that they certainly didn't. And then when William was the first one to meet Camilla, which was slightly by accident. Uh, he met her at St James's Palace, where, where he, he, his father was living at the time. and. He, um, I think, you know, Camilla just didn't interfere in their lives, and they, and I think they really warmed to her. No, she is, um, she's, she's a wonderful woman, and she's made our father very, very happy, which is the most important thing. William and I love her to bits, get on really well with her, um, and as far as I see it, nothing's changed. I'm not around that much. I'm at Sandhurst. William's just finished university. Now he's doing a bit of work here and there, so um, we're not around that much anyway. But when we are around, everyone's happy, everyone's fine, you know. Well, of course, it's absolutely wonderful news. And all of us, the whole family, are delighted. Uh, I don't think one wants to say much more than that, but I'm very happy to reiterate this. Hmm? Princes William and Harry also said today in a statement that they were both very happy for their father and Camilla and wished them all the luck in the future. It was not all smooth sailing. They scheduled their wedding for the 8th of April 2005, but unfortunately, Pope John Paul II died. Prince Charles was expected to attend the funeral on behalf of the Queen, so they had to postpone their wedding until the following day. As this was a last minute change, much of the memorabilia from their wedding day was dated incorrectly. On the 9th of April 2005, Charles and Camilla married in a civil ceremony at Windsor Guildhall, with an approving Prince William as best man, 
and both William and Harry were delighted with their father's newfound happiness. Charles and Camilla were finally wet. Though a much more scaled down event than Charles's first wedding, it was clear the day was a very happy one for the royal couple. Well, the Queen felt that um, as the head of the church, she, she shouldn't be seen to be attending the ceremony. Um, they got married in the town hall in Windsor, and the Queen very wisely said she, she wouldn't attend the ceremony, but she would attend the blessing in the church and she would give a reception. Um, and the, but William and Harry were at the ceremony and other people supporting them there. It was very, very small and it was very intimate. I was busy working at Highgrove phone when one of my colleagues got the phone and he said, oh, there's a phone call for you. And it was um, one of the prince's top aides, one of his top aides. And he said, I've, I've been asked to phone you by the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. He says, because they would like to personally invite you to the wedding. Because as a member of staff, you haven't completed the amount of time, but they're sending you a private invitation. I remember that as if it was yesterday. I remember exactly where the, the call took place. I remember my thoughts. I remember the phone. I remember everything. I remember I was trying not to get upset because I was so emotional and like excited about this. And it was unbelievable. I mean, it was amazing because suddenly there I am as a guest to the Prince of Wales and Duncombe and with all the celeb friends, with other royals, um, VIPs, dignitaries, prime ministers, and I'm there as a guest. The role of the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall was varied. Together and separately, Charles and Camilla took on hundreds of patronages, supporting causes to aid a greater awareness of important causes, and also to raise much needed funds for the charities concerned. Well, I think Camilla's repaired her reputation by just being very patient and just taking it very slowly. She didn't do too many royal engagements to begin with. She walked, you know, she was always letting Prince Charles take the, the take the bow, if you like, and he was always in front. Uh, it's only really and probably in the last couple of years that she's really ranked up her engagements and her patronages and, and become much more high profile. But I think she's very much, we still feel that she is there for her husband. Charles and Camilla did a great deal of work together. They became important ambassadors for the United Kingdom. In their overseas tours, requested by the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, they worked hard to maintain diplomatic ties with countries across the globe. I think she's, they're, they're wonderful together. And you can see, you know, I think in that royal world, you, you really can't be on your own. It's very, very difficult. And, you know, she is the, the perfect um, person to stand at Prince Charles's side. Their first official overseas tour together was to the USA in 2005. Many comparisons were being made to previous tours by Charles and Diana, but to the great relief of all concerned, the trip was enormously successful, with Camilla being warmly welcomed by the American public, who really appreciated her down-to-earth attitude. Their first stop was at Ground Zero in New York. Last night saw the first true test of this royal visit, a high-profile reception at New York's Museum of Modern Art. A cross-section of people attended, including some celebrities and the city's elite. Well, I think she's uh, got a great sense of humour and uh, she, you need it. So. Yesterday they began their tour with a gesture that will be widely appreciated in America, a visit to Ground Zero. The Duchess on her inaugural foreign trip, laying flowers at the site where nearly 3,000 people died on that September day. In enduring memory of our shared grief, the royal couple wrote, and all around them, the memories of lives lost. <laughs> 67 Britons were killed on September the 11th, 
and Prince Charles and Camilla dedicated a small garden to their memory. Both my wife and I were, were profoundly moved by what we saw there. And I think it is so fitting that their lives will be commemorated in this garden. If over the next week Americans tune in to this visit at all, their curiosity will be centered on Camilla. In recent years, following the height of the coronavirus pandemic, the Prince and Duchess were the first members of the royal family to undertake an overseas tour when they traveled to Jordan and Egypt and were welcomed by old friends, King Abdullah II and Queen Rania. On the 70th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's succession to the throne, Her Majesty released a statement saying, and when, in the fullness of time, my son Charles becomes king, I know you will give him and his wife Camilla the same support that you have given me. And it is my sincere wish that, when that time comes, Camilla will be known as Queen Consort as she continues her own loyal service. Which I think is important to the Queen because I think she's a huge believer that as the wife of a king, that that lady should be Queen Consort. That's how she, she sees it and I think that's really important. So that's why she has asked all of us to acknowledge that wish and, and accept her as, as the wife of Prince Charles, as, as a queen consort when he becomes king. Having stated after their wedding that Camilla would be known as Princess Consort, this was a clear statement from the boss that Camilla had successfully won the hearts and minds of the nation, as well as her mother-in-law. The Queen has personally shown her appreciation for Camilla's work and her loyalty to the Crown, clearly expressing her wish that she take the title many thought she once did not deserve, Queen Consort. Following the death of her beloved husband, Prince Philip, in 2021, the Queen began to slow down in her royal duties. She has faced periods of illness, including catching coronavirus, and recovery took its toll on our remarkable Queen. Charles and Camilla began to take on more duties and engagements previously undertaken by the Queen. In that way, they have shown together that they are truly capable of stepping into her shoes. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On the 8th of September 2022, Queen Elizabeth II died. And at that moment, Charles and Camilla became King and Queen. A moment Charles would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen was under medical supervision. And one by one, members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. Charles and Anne made it to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second great Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. Broadcasters announced her death and stated the King and Queen will return to London the following day. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy and endeavouring to follow his mother's example of duty and service, Charles stepped up to his duties as king. After greeting crowds at Buckingham Palace, Charles and Camilla walked through the Golden Gates as king and queen for the first time. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered. Through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. 
Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. On Saturday, the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace to undertake the vital and centuries-old tradition of proclaiming the new king. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. Prince! George, save the king! For the first time in history, this historic ceremony was filmed and shown live on television around the world. The Privy Council proclaimed His Majesty as King Charles III. Camilla and William accompanied Charles as witnesses to the ceremony. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. In the days following his mother's death, King Charles, accompanied by Queen Camilla, visited the different nations of the United Kingdom, being mostly warmly welcomed. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles was very visible, following his mother's example of trying to connect with the nation's people. He met with the crowds waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state and visited those across the country who were grieving too. On the 19th of September, playing an important role in the late Queen's funeral, King Charles walked behind his mother's coffin, alongside his siblings and sons. A poignant moment indeed. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The the, you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds, you couldn't hear anything else, no sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. Arriving at St George's Chapel, a smaller funeral service took place. For the first time, chorus sang God Save the King. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. The first rendition in St. George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. On May the 6th, 2023, the first crowning of a monarch in 70 years will take place. The coronation has been planned for many years, referred to as Operation Golden Orb. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, 
the pomp and tradition will still feature. Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he is no longer able to be outspoken, nor to speak so freely on his passions and opinions. Instead, he must be seen to remain unbiased and objective. After so many years in training, King Charles has taken on his duties and responsibilities with ease, dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents and state officials, and attending various state engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride, recently hosting South African President Ramaphosa at the first state visit and state banquet since his mother's death. Queen Camilla has begun to make her mark as queen. Speaking at an event at Buckingham Palace, she detailed her concern over the global pandemic of violence against women. Camilla also helped to retrieve the ubiquitous Paddington Bears left outside Buckingham Palace following the Queen's death, and in cooperation with the Barnardo's children's charity, she made sure they each found new homes with young children. In a story of love and loss, heartbreak and happiness, Charles and Camilla remained united, king and queen. Their resilience following torment by the media has ultimately proved their determination and the overarching principle of duty and service which guides their lives. She's his soulmate, she's his best friend. And I think that's vice versa. I don't think that's one way. I think they both see that in each other. And, you know, when you see them together and they're on the same wavelength, I think the Queen and Prince Philip had it. I think Prince Charles and Camilla has, have got it. I think William and Kate have got it. And they're really lucky. They're really lucky that they've got that, that royal connection. The, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty. And she also saw her dedication to Charles because she, she so helps him. I don't think Charles would even attempt to live up to the legacy of his mother. He's not that sort of person. What he would want to do is be complimentary to his mother. In a way, he's the sandwich between his mother and his son. He is the sandwich king. Eventually, history will decide the successes and challenges for the new king and queen. But whatever they do in their new roles, they will do together. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. It has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, 
we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. We, therefore, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love as I have throughout my life. King Charles III has not had a life without challenges. Reaching the point as a cherished and accepted king was not simple. In fact, Charles holds the title as longest heir apparent in British history. His great journey towards kingship is one unparalleled in British history. Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The salute is fired, and in the monarch's home lies the infant boy who will one day be king. On Saturday, the eminent gynaecologist Sir William Gilliatt was called to the palace for the most responsible case in even his career. By his advice, Sister H.M. Rowe was chosen midwife. The whole country knew that the baby would soon be born. All day on Sunday, people waited outside the palace, including phlegmatic pressmen, with whom it is a point of honor to show no excitement. And all day there was no announcement. It was after 10 at night that those who waited, and they were very many, heard the tremendous news, a royal baby and a boy. Radio gave no advantage to watchers at the palace. The glad tidings went out everywhere. This is the BBC Home Service. It has been announced officially from Buckingham Palace during the past hour that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. today and that Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. The press agencies were covering the world. The miracles of modern communication spanned the globe. Unto us a child is born, and no ordinary child, a prince. For the moment, all other news took second place. The morning newspapers went to press with one of those rare, warm stories that touch every heart. The early years of marriage have set the seal on the happiness of the princess and her husband. The blessing of children has come not only to enrich their lives, but also to establish securely the line of succession. In Prince Charles, the public has acquired a new popular subject of interest, of whom some delightful pictures have been taken. We should like to see more of him, but the insatiable demand of the public has had to bow to the princess's very proper determination that her son shall not be spoilt by publicity. From a young age, Charles was very well aware of his own destiny. The lives of his mother and father changed radically upon the death of King George VI. Princess Elizabeth ascended to the throne and became Queen Elizabeth II. In the city that was so long an independent and powerful part of the realm, hers by right of succession, the Princess Elizabeth has agreed to accept the crown and rule as queen. Of Elizabeth and Philip's children, the young Prince Charles was the only one to attend the coronation, as Princess Anne was considered too young at the time. Charles, sat beside the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret, looked eagerly over the balcony, watching his mother solemnly take the coronation oath and the crown 
bestowed upon her head, a moment he would treasure as he became heir apparent. His childhood is said to have been a solitary and lonely one, his mother and father busy with their duties, an endless round of royal engagements, official visits, and tours across the globe. The royal couple proceeded up Broadway, the Canyon of Heroes, bombarded by tons of ticker tape, millions of cheers, and what was the most enthusiastic reception anywhere in Elizabeth's 10-day North American tour. His relationship with the Queen, his mother, was said to be detached, and with his father, Prince Philip, it was particularly difficult. It is said that the young Charles often felt he disappointed his father, not quite living up to his father's strong personality. Prince Philip did take a particular interest in teaching Charles the outdoor life, getting him to fish and hunt. A running theme throughout their relationship was the aim to get Charles to become more of a man, perhaps more of a leader, knowing the nation's future expectations for the then monarch in waiting. Focus on a famous prep school. Cheam is in the news on the first day of a new term, and young hopefuls arrive with their parents and relatives to carry on with that exhausting process called education. Accent on luggage, not forgetting tuck boxes and toys. Uh, toys, well, super yachts and jet-propelled planes, one should say, perhaps. It's a wizard idea to bag your place in the classroom at once. Everybody here? Call over by Mr. Beck, joint headmaster of the school. Now there's one new boy still to arrive, and here he comes with his mother and father. The headmaster receives the royal party. What, no tuck box? Well, there's plenty of room in that trunk, no doubt. Prince Philip was a pupil here, his son looks happy to be following in father's footsteps. Even in his education, Prince Philip was more determined than ever to toughen up young Charles, and he forced the Queen's hand, deciding to send Prince Charles to Gordonston. It was a tough and competitive school, but it was also extremely caring in Philip's day, and he believed strongly that it made him into the man he was, the man who had married the Queen of England so he believed it must make Charles a man who could be king. Charles broke a royal tradition, and instead of going straight into the armed forces after finishing school, he decided to pursue higher education straight away and accepted a place at Cambridge University. The great court of Trinity College, Cambridge, and the royal procession arrived. The minis serve to underline Prince Charles' hope that his time at Cambridge will be uncluttered by deference to his royal status. Lord Butler, the Master of Trinity, set a precedent by meeting him, but otherwise the college, founded by Henry VIII, welcomed him with the informality he obviously hoped for. The prince, who will be 19 next month, will be reading archaeology and anthropology. The first Prince of Wales to attend the university for a hundred years, he'll be living in a room in New Court, and it was here he met a friend of his, third-year student Robert Woods, son of the Dean of Windsor. A stroll to the backs for a look at the gently flowing camp. In the Elizabethan dining hall, lunch three bob. There he saw windows dedicated to his great-great-grandfather and his grandfather, who were both up at Trinity. Prince Charles, the future King of England, becomes a college freshman. Lord Butler, Master of Trinity, greets the Prince, who will major in archaeology and anthropology. The heir to the throne looks like his mother and walks like his father. He quickly found his feet and particularly enjoyed performing on stage, a useful skill for a future king. Uh, I'm letting out a little slack, uh, a little slack now. Uh, yes, uh, taking up the strain, taking up the strain. This is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's really very large indeed. I, I, I...
During his time at Cambridge University, Charles was introduced to his first love, Lucia Santa Cruz, daughter of the Chilean ambassador. There was an instant attraction between the two of them, though the romance did not last. Lucia told Charles she had just the girl for him, and so it was that she went on to introduce him to Camilla Shand, later Camilla Parker Bowles, and now the Queen Consort, the great love of his life. A very personal and publicly significant moment in Charles's life was when he was 20 years old in the summer of 1969. After intense instruction in the Welsh language and many months of preparation, his mother, Her Majesty the Queen, invested him as Prince of Wales. At the main college building on the seafront, Prince Charles has done most of his work. In the language laboratory, he spent an hour each day perfecting his Welsh grammar and pronunciation. His tutor is Mr. Edward Millwood, a former vice president of the Welsh Nationalist Party. Well, this has been a crash course. It's been only part of a crash course amongst other studies. And in the short time that he's been working, he's developed a very good accent, and uh, I'm sure it's going to stand him in very good stead from now on. Is he fluent in Welsh? Within the limits, yes, he is fluent within the limits of the lessons that he's learned, but he's not completely fluent, of course. If we had Prince Charles for a year here in Aberystwyth, there's no doubt in my mind that he would be completely fluent at the end of that year. Mr. Millwood, to what extent do you think Prince Charles has helped to popularize the Welsh language? I've had letters from, um, from many people in Wales and from outside Wales. I've had letters from the United States of America, for example, from uh, Welsh Americans uh, who have um, Welsh predecessors and um, ancestors and uh, they want to learn Welsh as well. There seems to be a worldwide interest as well as a very keen and added interest in Wales today. During the nine weeks, the Prince's home has been room number 95 in Pantacallan Hall of Residence. In an identical room next door is third-year student Geraint Evans, who was given the job of looking after Prince Charles. As to what sort of student he is, he's a very uh, hard-working student, which perhaps is unusual in this place. He's also a very um, natural student, you know. This might sound strange, you wouldn't describe a student as natural, but you would have to describe him as being natural. He's been made a very hard effort to get on with people, and it's um, been very easy for all concerned, I think, this term. Has it been possible for you to make a friend of him? Um, as far, yes, as far as it was ever possible, I think it uh, made it. There's been certain friendship between us. Perhaps it'd be fair to call it, uh, call him an acquaintance. Uh, the only occasion where um, perhaps it could go further than this, he did uh, about uh, four weeks ago come home to tea with me, and uh, you know, he's very natural and very easy going. Then, Mr. Evans, you're a committed nationalist and one of those who would not support the investiture. But has your opinion of Prince Charles been changed, been modified during his nine weeks here? To the ceremony, no, um, but uh, to, to the person, yes. I certainly have considerable respect and considerable sympathy with him in this ceremony. But uh, the rest of the paraphernalia, my attitude hasn't changed. Carnarvon waits like a bride for her wedding, gaily dressed for the big moment, but anxious too that something could go wrong, though every precaution has been taken to make sure that it doesn't. As traffic jams block the town, army bomb disposal experts are on the alert. To prepare for the ceremony, five years' local work has been crammed into 12 months. £5,000 worth of paint has been given away free, and all the shops in the town centre have been given a facelift. Along the side streets, which the Queen and Prince will never see, the bunting is out. Although Charles had been Prince of Wales for some years, it wasn't until the 1st of July 1969 that he was invested by the Queen. Every shop window proclaims the investiture and every shopkeeper has been doing good business. Although there are 160 officially approved souvenirs, shoppers can choose among hundreds of other investiture trinkets. Carnarvon expects a quarter of a million people by Tuesday. Carnarvon has gone to a lot of trouble. Rates went up last year by one and sixpence. What kind of return can the town expect? I asked the mayor, Alderman Ivor Bowen Griffith. 
And the return is that we've created this kind of spirit where we now have a people, I think, who will act as a pressure group on us councillors and tell us, look, boys, you've started, you can't stop. You've started creating the new Carnarvon. Carry on, boys, and create the new Carnarvon. This is what we want. When the time came for his investiture, he pledged his allegiance to the Queen at Carnarvon Castle and made an address to the nation in Welsh. For the most part, the ceremony was very well received by the Welsh people. The monarch is head of the armed forces, and it has always been a great tradition of the royal family that each and every member should engage in active service and lead by example, playing more than just a symbolic role. Famously, the Queen was the first female member of the royal family to serve full-time on active service as a member of the ATS during World War II. And at the King's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Now visited by her parents and sister Margaret Rose at a training station in southern England, she shows them she knows a fan belt from a spark plug, all right, and isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Her father gave her an officer's commission early in March. Papa and Mama seem to approve, too. Daughter is the first woman member of the royal family to join the services full time. Prince Philip II was an active member of the Royal Navy during World War II. So for Charles, it was an important next step for him as heir to the throne and future head of the armed forces. During his time studying at Cambridge University, Charles received flying lessons from the RAF. He went on to RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire to train as a jet pilot with his passing out parade in September 1971. Just as his great-grandfathers, his grandfather and his father, he went on to pursue a naval career, taking on a six-week course at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. Charles served on the guided missile destroyer HMS Norfolk and then went on to serve on two frigates, the HMS Minerva from 1972 to 1973 and the HMS Jupiter in 1974. In steaming heat, Prince Charles's frigate, HMS Minerva, edged her way into Nassau Harbour. A few minutes before, he had formally ended his duties as one of the ship's navigation officers and taken on the role again of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, with his personal standard broken from the mast. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. To get to Rawson's place where the welcome speeches would be made, the Prince walked at speed through an aisle of shouting, yelling Bahamians, with security men running in front to clear a path for him. If it was all a bit confused, the Prince showed no sign of being put out by it. The speeches were from a dais placed in front of the old Nassau landmark, the statue of the prince's great-great-great-grandmother, and were brief to the relief of those in full dress with the temperature in the 90s. There will be five days of ceremonial engagements before Prince Charles rejoins Minerva next Wednesday for two more months of Caribbean patrol as a naval lieutenant. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. With his instructor, Lieutenant Commander Alan McGregor, the Prince inspected the helicopter before climbing inside. He seemed already familiar with the controls and was relaxed and cheerful before this, his first dual control training flight. After about 18 hours of instruction, Lieutenant the Prince of Wales, as he's officially known, will make his first solo flight. He'll also do mountain flying, armaments training, including the firing of guided missiles and emergency escape drill from a cockpit that's immersed in water and turned upside down. For the last 10 months of his active service in the Navy, on the 9th of February 1976, Charles took command of the coastal mine hunter, HMS Bronnington. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment to each one. 
I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the, the most important thing. Is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. On the 11th of June 1977, when appointed Colonel-in-Chief of the Parachute Regiment, Charles asked to take part in the parachute training course. He felt he could not look them in the eye or wear the regiment's beret and wings badge unless he had completed the course. Charles said, I felt I should lead from the front or at least be able to do some of the things that one expects others to do for the country. It really is a great privilege to be with you today in my 40th year as your Colonel-in-Chief. When appointed to the position, I felt I couldn't look your predecessors in the eye or even dream of wearing the red berry without doing the parachute course. This threw the cap among the proverbial pigeons, but in the end, I was allowed to join parachute training course 841A at Bryce North. On the 16th of June, 2012, Charles was appointed the most senior ranks of Field Marshal, Admiral of the Fleet and Marshal of the RAF in the three UK armed services. As future King, Charles was focused on finding an appropriate wife. He was determined to marry by the age of 30 and continue the noble and ancient lineage through his own heirs. In the 1970s, Charles was referred to as the most eligible bachelor in the world, and after searching far and wide for the perfect match, he met his future wife when his ex-girlfriend, Sarah, introduced him to Lady Diana Spencer in 1977. Quite famously, Sarah takes credit for the introduction, saying, I introduced them. I'm Cupid. At the time, he thought she was a very jolly and amusing and attractive 16-year-old. They met again a year after the death of Lord Mountbatten in 1980. Diana, now a couple of years older, was very sympathetic to Charles about his loss, which is said to have made him consider her as a possible wife. Charles invited Diana to Balmoral, where the Queen, Prince Philip and the Queen Mother all received Diana very well. Even Camilla gave Prince Charles the nod of approval. She thought Diana was an ideal candidate. Their courtship attracted a lot of attention from the press, the media chasing Diana wherever she went. She now faced possibly the most daunting initiation test for would-be members of the royal family, ordeal by the media. Her flat came under siege. She was followed wherever she went. Even under this pressure, she stayed calm, and in doing so, she won respect. How well are you coping with all the press attention? Well, as you can, you can see, you can tell. <laughs> are, you, are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us. Are. Well, it is, naturally. And you, you're coping with it all right, though? You seem to be doing very well. Well, I'm still ran. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any possibility of any announcements of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me uh, if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Okay. Right, but Prince sorry. Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> In February 1981, the waiting was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. The ring was a sapphire surrounded by diamonds. The couple looked happy and relaxed, delighted, like everyone else, that a wedding would take place. Earl Spencer and Lady Diana's stepmother celebrated among the crowds outside the palace gates. Inside, Lady Diana was facing up to a future she could hardly have dreamt of. Yesterday you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would, all I know like it, would be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, I know I can't go wrong. He's there with me. 
The months between the engagement and the wedding were hectic, often exhilarating, sometimes trying. She had to learn the restrictions of royal life. Never again would she be able to walk quietly down to the shops. Prince Charles had to keep the engagements he'd accepted before the announcement of the engagement, and this meant some separation. Diana had to accept this and do her best to hide her feelings. Now, if you watch that, that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? Princess Diana is beaming and she's giggling, saying, yes, yes, yes. And he says, whatever love is. And she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know? what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. Charles didn't really know what love was. And I suppose in love. Of course. course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> well, it you obviously your means, own interpretation. obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Thank Thank you again, you congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Be kind. before the wedding were happy ones. The couple attended many events as wedding fever gripped the nation. The more she attended, the better she coped. In July that year, Charles and Diana would enter a marriage that would have the whole world besotted. They made their way to St. Paul's Cathedral with a congregation of 3,500 people and two million people lining Diana's route from Clarence House. A quick look all along the route, see what it looks like as more and more people, as you've been telling us, are out and about. The best places are filling up and everyone's making sure it's going to be a great day. Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal brides since the young Queen Victoria was its first, marrying Prince Albert 141 years ago. The royal carriages, the Queen's procession and Prince Charles's little procession will drive down the leafy mall to Admiralty Arch in the distance. And five minutes after the Prince of Wales has passed, Lady Diana and her father will come out from Clarence House in the glass coach, just with police outriders, for she's not royal yet, and will follow her husband-to-be to St Paul's. Once through Admiralty Arch into Trafalgar Square, and next, the carriages will bowl past St. Clement Danes, the Air Force Church, and Gladstone's statue. And though Temple Bar is the border between the city of Westminster and the city of London, the Queen won't stop for any ceremony there today. She'll just drive straight on into Fleet Street, which has done its best, though not perhaps a spectacular best with the bunting. It'll be keeping its most colourful words for tomorrow morning's papers. All the troops along the way from here will be from regiments of which Prince Charles is Colonel-in-Chief. The Cheshire Regiment, the Gordon Highlanders, the Parachute Regiment. All will be here in half companies. And from the Commonwealth too, from Canada, the Winnipeg Rifles and the Royal Regiment of Canada. From Australia, the Royal Australian Armoured Corps. They'll be lining the route all the way to St Paul's. To the steps and the west doorway of St Paul's and the red carpet. Just a little while to go before this St. Paul's meets its first royal bride, Lady Diana. And the great door is not yet open. She was still Lady Di, but only just. She was about to become the first English girl in 500 years to marry a Prince of Wales. The eyes of the world were on her and she knew it. It was a day full of anticipation and excitement. Accompanied by her father, John Spencer, Diana travelled to St Paul's Cathedral in the glass carriage. With father on her arm, she then walked the three and a half minutes up the aisle. She seemed remarkably free from nerves, at the age of 20, beginning a new and very different life. He said, you look wonderful. She said, 
wonderful for you. The service was followed by the crowd outside in the sunshine. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. It went without a hitch, almost. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. She was no longer a children's helper. She was the Princess of Wales, married to the heir to the throne. Another chapter in the thousand-year history of the British royal family had been written. Charles and Diana were keen to start a family and in 1982, Prince William was born. A couple of years later, in 1984, Prince Harry was born. Diana was well known to be a very hands-on mother, but Charles was a supportive parent too. Charles and Diana's marriage was not entirely a successful one. Whilst they built a family together with sons William and Harry, the relationship between Charles and Diana was not destined to last. The couple separated in 1992, divorcing in 1996. After Diana's death, Charles had to step up and take more responsibility for William and Harry. Though the young princes were growing up and becoming more independent, it was undoubtedly a very challenging time for both of them. William and Harry have praised their father publicly, and it is clear he has successfully set a strong example of the importance of hard work and generosity to others. Some of my earliest memories relate to times that my parents spoke to me, um, or even better, showed me what it meant to have both privilege and responsibilities. From my father, I learned how central charity was, or how central charity was to his life and his sense of purpose. The Prince's Trust is not an arm's length organization for my father. He cares deeply about the Prince's Trust because it is a living projection of his values. As a young child, I recall evening after evening my father's diligence and compassion as he applied himself to answering thousands of letters and reading endless reports in order to stay on top of his ambition to do all he could to help the underprivileged. Without my realizing it, what my parents were doing was instilling in me and Harry a lifelong habit to put charity at the heart of our lives. Many of the issues William and I now work on are subjects we were introduced to by our father growing up. His passion and dedication are remarkable, and seeing so many of you here today, I cannot fail but to be in awe of the drive he has had for so many years to contribute to the enrichment of society, both in this country and around the world. So, Pa, while I know that you've asked that today not be about you, you must forgive me if I don't listen to you, much like when I was younger. And instead, I ask everyone here to say a huge thank you to you for your incredible work over nearly 50 years. Charles had rekindled an old spark with former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles, much to the dismay and disapproval of royal courtiers. But they went on to marry in 2005, and their partnership has endured, becoming widely accepted by the public.
when it comes to things he cares about, he cares about the country. You know, he cares about the young. Um, he cares about the environment. You know, the, these are big passions for him. King Charles has been no stranger to hard work. In the reporting year 2017 to 2018, he undertook over 600 engagements in the UK and around the world, which is not unusual for Charles's working year. He has visited 44 Commonwealth countries, many more than once, and has visited over 100 countries worldwide. Since leaving the armed forces, Charles very carefully carved out his role as heir apparent and did not simply wait for his final role. It's all about timings. That's the important bit. That's what we were drummed into us, that whether it be meals, meetings, uh, whatever it might be, you've got to make sure that things are done by a certain point so that he's able to then um, carry on doing his job. Charles took his title as Prince of Wales very seriously, maintaining a close and enduring relationship with Wales. Charles and Camilla made a visit to Wales every summer for a busy week packed full of engagements, often linked with his charities. Charles is always ready to get stuck in. So on a visit to BBC Scotland, with his usual charm, the then prince became a weatherman for the day. I'm delighted to say we've got a new member of our weather team tonight. Uh, let me hand over to him now, Your Highness. Well, it's an unsettled picture as we head towards the end of the week. Uh, this afternoon, it'll be cold, wet and windy across most of Scotland. We're under the influence of uh, low pressure and this weather uh, front pushing northwards is bringing cloud and outbreaks of rain. The rain, of course, will be heaviest over the borders and uh, around Edinburgh, where it could lead to difficult conditions on the roads. Uh, in the west, rain will be lighter and patchier. There will maybe a few drier interludes over Dumfries House in Ayrshire. Aha! There'll be snow for the higher ground of the Highlands and Aberdeenshire. The potential for a few flurries over Balmoral. Who the hell wrote this script? Uh, as the afternoon goes on. The best of the drier and brighter weather will, of course, be over the Northern Isles and the far north of the mainland. So, a little hazy sunshine to the Castle of Maine, Caithness. But a cold day everywhere with temperatures of just eight Celsius and a brisk northeasterly wind. Thank God it isn't a bank holiday. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> yes. Your, your, your Royal Highness, how, how do you feel he did? I think it's a very good weather forecast. Yes, you, yes you... he's always been longing to do it. He watches it every night. And um, people always thought it should be rather good. <laughs> no, I never thought that at all. Yes. <laughs> His official duties do not always run smoothly, however. While visiting Australia in January 1994, Two shots from a starting pistol were fired at him on Australia Day by David Kang in protest of the treatment of several hundred Cambodian asylum seekers held in detention camps. Darling Harbour brimmed with anticipation of what was to be the highlight of Australia Day celebrations. Prince Charles was about to present awards to the state's top HSC students, but before he could utter a word, chaos. Dignitaries assembled on the stage were the first to the Prince's rescue, with no less than the Premier John Fay and Australian of the Year Ian Kiernan tackling the man. The Prince was shielded by his personal bodyguard, who kicked a starter's pistol out of the man's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everything is totally under control. Unharmed, His Royal Highness remained remarkably composed, continuing his official duties as the man was taken away for questioning. Within two hours of the attack, Police Minister Terry Griffiths was playing it down. Let's not dramatise it by suggesting that there was an attempted assassination. There was not. It was a stunt. But the charges were serious. 23-year-old David Kang was taken to the Sydney Police Centre and charged with attacking an international protected person, threatening to attack him, common assault, a fray, possession of a firearm and using a firearm. This morning, the Macquarie University student appeared in central local court applying for bail. The court heard the attack on Prince Charles was deliberate and planned by Kang to the extent that he bought the pistol and secured an itinerary for the royal visit. So when I, when I 
created the Prince's Trust in 1976 to help improve the lives of disadvantaged young people, it was because I was so acutely aware of the challenges that they faced. And over the years, some of the um, challenges have changed, but the overall mission uh, of giving people self-confidence, self-esteem and better opportunities remains the same. And in that time, we have helped over one million young people. And I always get, used to get so annoyed that it hadn't got to one million long ago because we had to keep counting people who were still going through the system, even though we were actually helping 50,000 people a year. I thought, I know my maths is bad, <laughs> but... So we've helped over one million young people transform their lives, and the Prince's Trust now works in 18 countries across the Commonwealth and, and beyond. In 1976, Charles founded the Prince's Trust, a charitable organization to help vulnerable young people. Originally started using funds from his own Royal Navy severance pay, amounting to just over 7,000 pounds, the charity has gone on to help over one million people. It remains one of the biggest successes during his career as Prince of Wales. You can't teach confidence. You have to try and you have to give confidence to kids. This is really what the Prince's Trust is about, I think, at base level. It's about giving people the confidence to try something that their peer group might not think is cool or interesting. But if they think it's if they if they think it's interesting, if they think it has value, then they should be given the confidence to go and do it. And it's about getting to these kids when they're in environments that aren't conducive to those sorts of things and pulling them out of that environment and saying, now come over here, let's do this, because I can show you something that's better. The charity helps those aged between 11 and 30 with issues such as homelessness, mental health problems, or trouble with the law. I would like to take this opportunity to say to you, Charles, how proud I am of everything you have accomplished with the Trust and the way you personally have inspired this organisation. It is a very great pleasure for me, therefore, to present a Royal Charter to the Prince's Trust in recognition of its outstanding achievements over nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, none of this, after 40 years, and I hope we'll keep it going for a bit, uh, would be possible. But I'm only as good as the people who do all the marvellous things around the country, all the fantastic staff and all our young ambassadors and celebrity ambassadors and so many others. And, and I've said year after year just how proud I am of those young ambassadors and how they've totally changed their lives and now are doing all sorts of wonderful things. And as long as I've got a few marbles left remaining, <laughs> I should do my best to go on investing in the future of this remarkable country. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Charles's father, Prince Philip, was a keen environmentalist. His activism saved a species from extinction and raised unparalleled awareness on the blight of environmental pollution. Inspired by his father's mission, Charles too has dedicated his life to protecting our environment. It's um, totally useless for a lot of well-meaning people to wring their hands in conference and to point out the dangers of pollution or destruction of the country's countryside if no one is willing or capable of taking any action. The impassioned speeches will be so much effluent under the bridge unless it is followed by drastic political action. Well, sir, time is fast running out and it remains to be seen whether those in political authority can shoulder their responsibilities in time and act quickly enough to relieve a situation which grows more serious every day. Charles first spoke publicly about his concerns with the current environmental situation in terms of pollution and use of plastics in 1970 and had frequently been ridiculed for his opinions and interests, which he is now praised for and believed to have been forward-thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, the battle against climate change is surely the most defining and pivotal challenge of our times. 
Even in a world full of daunting perils and crises, it is hard to imagine anything that poses a greater challenge and opportunity for humanity. We are running out of time. How many times have I found myself saying this over recent years? We cannot delay, regroup, prevaricate, or wait for more and better information. We should compare the planet under threat of climate change to a sick patient. No doctor would wait for 100% certainty while a dying patient slipped away. We cannot ignore the symptoms and should act now to restore the health of the planet before it is too late. The Queen herself has acknowledged the great impact of the work carried out by Prince Philip, the then Prince Charles and Prince William in environmental causes and climate change. This is a duty I'm especially happy to discharge, as the impact of the environment on human progress was a subject close to the heart of my dear late husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I remember well that in 1969, he told an academic gathering, if the world pollution situation is not critical at the moment, it is as certain as anything can be that the situation will become increasingly intolerable within a very short time. It is a source of great pride to me that the leading role my husband played in encouraging people to protect our fragile planet lives on through the work of our eldest son, Charles, and his eldest son, William. I could not be more proud of them. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On the 8th of September 2022, Charles's life would change forever. A moment he would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen was under medical supervision and one by one, members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. Charles and Anne made it back to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second great Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy and following his mother's example, Charles stepped into his duties as king. After greeting crowds at Buckingham Palace, Charles and Camilla walked through the Golden Gates as king and queen for the first time. The following day, Charles made his first televised broadcast as king, making a tribute to his beloved late mother, Queen Elizabeth II. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept. And she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service, I renew to you all today. On Saturday the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace. It was time to proclaim the new king. 
the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. God save the king! For the first time in history, this historic ceremony was filmed. The Privy Council proclaimed His Majesty as King Charles III. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. In the days following his mother's death, Charles visited the different nations. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles made himself very visible just like his mother did. He met with people waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state and visited people across the country who were grieving too. Charles, along with his brothers and sister, solemnly held a vigil at St. Giles's Cathedral and later at Westminster Hall. A touching and difficult moment for the siblings. On the 19th of September, Charles played an important part in the late Queen's funeral King Charles walked behind the coffin, alongside his siblings and sons. A poignant moment. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. Arriving at St. George's Chapel, a smaller funeral service commenced. For the first time, the chorus sang, God Save the King. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. He is the sovereign. He is the king. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. The first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God save the king. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. On May the 6th, the first coronation in 70 years will take place. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, the pomp and tradition will still feature Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he is no longer able to speak so freely on his passions and opinions. He instead has to remain unbiased. King Charles has taken on his responsibilities with ease, dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents and state officials, and attending various engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride. King Charles III, a king in waiting for so much of his life, 
Charles has been able to learn from one of the greatest monarchs Britain has ever known. Following in the footsteps of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles's sense of duty and dedication to service will likely define his reign too, as it has for so much of his life. In his own right, Charles has given so much of his working life to helping people and to protecting and conserving the environment. A compassionate and considerate king, Charles will continue the great legacy of the House of Windsor. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love as I have throughout my life. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. It has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. We, therefore, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love as I have throughout my life.
King Charles III has not had a life without challenges. Reaching the point as a cherished and accepted king was not simple. In fact, Charles holds the title as longest heir apparent in British history. His great journey towards kingship is one unparalleled in British history. Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The salute is fired, and in the monarch's home lies the infant boy who will one day be king. On Saturday, the eminent gynaecologist Sir William Gilliatt was called to the palace for the most responsible case in even his career. By his advice, Sister H.M. Rowe was chosen midwife. The whole country knew that the baby would soon be born. All day on Sunday, people waited outside the palace, including phlegmatic pressmen, with whom it is a point of honor to show no excitement. And all day there was no announcement. It was after 10 at night that those who waited, and they were very many, heard the tremendous news, a royal baby and a boy. Radio gave no advantage to watchers at the palace. The glad tidings went out everywhere. This is the BBC Home Service. It has been announced officially from Buckingham Palace during the past hour that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. today. And that Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. The press agencies were covering the world. The miracles of modern communication span the globe. Unto us a child is born. And no ordinary child, a prince. For the moment all other news took second place. The morning newspapers went to press with one of those rare, warm stories that touch every heart. The early years of marriage have set the seal on the happiness of the princess and her husband. The blessing of children has come not only to enrich their lives, but also to establish securely the line of succession. In Prince Charles, the public has acquired a new popular subject of interest, of whom some delightful pictures have been taken. We should like to see more of him, but the insatiable demand of the public has had to bow to the princess's very proper determination that her son shall not be spoilt by publicity. From a young age, Charles was very well aware of his own destiny. The lives of his mother and father changed radically upon the death of King George VI. Princess Elizabeth ascended to the throne and became Queen Elizabeth II. In the city that was so long an independent and powerful part of the realm, hers by right of succession, the Princess Elizabeth has agreed to accept the crown and rule as queen. Of Elizabeth and Philip's children, the young Prince Charles was the only one to attend the coronation, as Princess Anne was considered too young at the time. Charles, sat beside the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret, looked eagerly over the balcony, watching his mother solemnly take the coronation oath and the crown bestowed upon her head. A moment he would treasure as he became heir apparent. His childhood is said to have been a solitary and lonely one, his mother and father busy with their duties, an endless round of royal engagements, official visits, and tours across the globe. The royal couple proceeded up Broadway, the Canyon of Heroes, bombarded by tons of ticker tape, millions of cheers, and what was the most enthusiastic reception anywhere in Elizabeth's 10-day North American tour. His relationship with the Queen his mother was said to be detached, and with his father, Prince Philip, it was particularly difficult. It is said that the young Charles often felt he disappointed his father, not quite living up to his father's strong personality. Prince Philip did take a particular interest in teaching Charles the outdoor life, getting him to fish and hunt. A running theme throughout their relationship was the aim to get Charles to become more of a man perhaps more of a leader, knowing the nation's future expectations for the then monarch in waiting. Focus on a famous prep school. Cheam is in the news on the first day of a new term, and young hopefuls arrive with their parents and relatives to carry on with that exhausting process called education. Accent on luggage, not forgetting tuck boxes and toys. 
Uh, toys, well, super yachts and jet-propelled planes, one should say, perhaps. It's a wizard idea to bag your place in the classroom at once. Everybody here, call over by Mr. Beck, joint headmaster of the school. Now there's one new boy still to arrive, and here he comes with his mother and father. The headmaster receives the royal party. What, no tuck box? Well, there's plenty of room in that trunk, no doubt. Prince Philip was a pupil here. His son looks happy to be following in father's footsteps. Even in his education, Prince Philip was more determined than ever to toughen up young Charles, and he forced the Queen's hand, deciding to send Prince Charles to Gordonston. It was a tough and competitive school, but it was also extremely caring in Philip's day, and he believed strongly that it made him into the man he was, the man who had married the Queen of England. So he believed it must make Charles a man who could be king. Charles broke a royal tradition, and instead of going straight into the armed forces after finishing school, he decided to pursue higher education straight away and accepted a place at Cambridge University. The great court of Trinity College, Cambridge, and the royal procession arrived. The minis serve to underline Prince Charles' hope that his time at Cambridge will be uncluttered by deference to his royal status. Lord Butler, the master of Trinity, set a precedent by meeting him, but otherwise the college, founded by Henry VIII, welcomed him with the informality he obviously hoped for. The prince, who'll be 19 next month, will be reading archaeology and anthropology. The first Prince of Wales to attend the university for a hundred years, he'll be living in a room in New Court, and it was here he met a friend of his, third-year student Robert Woods, son of the Dean of Windsor. A stroll to the backs for a look at the gently flowing cab. In the Elizabethan dining hall, lunch three bob. There he saw windows dedicated to his great-great-grandfather and his grandfather, who were both up at Trinity. Prince Charles, the future King of England, becomes a college freshman. Lord Butler, Master of Trinity, greets the Prince, who will major in archaeology and anthropology. The heir to the throne looks like his mother and walks like his father. He quickly found his feet and particularly enjoyed performing on stage, a useful skill for a future king. Uh, I'm letting out a little slack, uh, a little slack now. Uh, yes, uh, taking up the strain, taking up the strain. This is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's very, very large indeed. I, I, I... During his time at Cambridge University, Charles was introduced to his first love, Lucia Santa Cruz, daughter of the Chilean ambassador. There was an instant attraction between the two of them, though the romance did not last. Lucia told Charles she had just the girl for him, and so it was that she went on to introduce him to Camilla Shand, later Camilla Parker Bowles, and now the Queen Consort, the great love of his life. A very personal and publicly significant moment in Charles's life was when he was 20 years old in the summer of 1969. After intense instruction in the Welsh language and many months of preparation, his mother, Her Majesty the Queen, invested him as Prince of Wales. At the main college building on the seafront, Prince Charles has done most of his work. In the language laboratory, he spent an hour each day perfecting his Welsh grammar and pronunciation. His tutor is Mr. Edward Millwood, a former vice president of the Welsh Nationalist Party. Well, this has been a crash course. It's been only part of a crash course amongst other studies. And in the short time that he's been working, he's developed a very good accent 
and uh, I'm sure it's going to stand him in very good stead from now on. Is he fluent in Welsh? Within the limits, yes, he is fluent within the limits of the lessons that he's learned, but he's not completely fluent, of course. If we had Prince Charles for a year here in Aberystwyth, there's no doubt in my mind that he would be completely fluent at the end of that year. Mr Millwood, to what extent do you think Prince Charles has helped to popularise the Welsh language? I've had letters from, um, from many people in Wales and from outside Wales. I've had letters from the United States of America, for example, from uh, Welsh Americans uh, who have um, Welsh predecessors and um, ancestors, and uh, they want to learn Welsh as well. There seems to be a worldwide interest as well as a very keen and added interest in Wales today. During the nine weeks, the Prince's home has been room number 95 in Pantacallan Hall of Residence. In an identical room next door is third-year student Geraint Evans, who was given the job of looking after Prince Charles. As to what sort of student he is, he's a very uh, hard-working student, which perhaps is unusual in this place. He's also a very um, natural student. You know, this may sound strange, you wouldn't describe students natural, but you have to describe him as being natural. He's been made a very hard effort to get on with people, and it's um, been very easy for all concerned, I think, this term. Has it been possible for you to make a friend of him? Um, as far, yes, as far as it was ever possible, I think it uh, made uh, there being a certain friendship between us. Perhaps it would be fair to call, it, uh, call him an acquaintance. Uh, the only occasion where um, perhaps it could go further than this, he did uh, about uh, four weeks ago come home to tea with me and, uh, you know, it's very natural and very easy going then. Mr Evans, you're a committed nationalist and one of those who would not support the investiture, but has your opinion of Prince Charles been changed, been modified during his nine weeks here? To the ceremony, no, um, but uh, to, to the person, yes. I certainly have considerable respect and considerable sympathy with him in this ceremony, but uh, the rest of the paraphernalia, my attitude hasn't changed. Carnarvon waits like a bride for her wedding, gaily dressed for the big moment, but anxious too that something could go wrong, though every precaution has been taken to make sure that it doesn't. As traffic jams block the town, army bomb disposal experts are on the alert. To prepare for the ceremony, five years local work has been crammed into 12 months. 5,000 pounds worth of paint has been given away free, and all the shops in the town centre have been given a facelift. Along the side streets, which the Queen and Prince will never see, the bunting is out. Although Charles had been Prince of Wales for some years, it wasn't until the 1st of July 1969 that he was invested by the Queen. Every shop window proclaims the investiture, and every shopkeeper has been doing good business. Although there are 160 officially approved souvenirs, shoppers can choose among hundreds of other investiture trinkets. Carnarvon expects a quarter of a million people by Tuesday. Carnarvon has gone to a lot of trouble. Rates went up last year by one and sixpence. What kind of return can the town expect? I asked the mayor, Alderman Ivo Bowen Griffith. And the return is that we've created this kind of spirit where we now have a people, I think, who will act as a pressure group on us councillors and tell us, look, boys, you've started, you can't stop. You've started creating the new Carnarvon. Carry on, boys, and create the new Carnarvon. This is what we want. When the time came for his investiture, he pledged his allegiance to the Queen at Carnarvon Castle and made an address to the nation in Welsh. For the most part, the ceremony was very well received by the Welsh people. The monarch is head of the armed forces, and it has always been a great tradition of the royal family that each and every member should engage in active service and lead by example, playing more than just a symbolic role. Famously, the Queen was the first female member of the royal family to serve full-time on active service as a member of the ATS during World War II. And at the King's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Now visited by her parents and sister Margaret Rose at a training station in southern England, 
she shows them she knows a fan belt from a spark plug, all right, and isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Her father gave her an officer's commission early in March. Papa and Mama seem to approve, too. Daughter is the first woman member of the royal family to join the services full time. Prince Philip II was an active member of the Royal Navy during World War II. So for Charles, it was an important next step for him as heir to the throne and future head of the armed forces. During his time studying at Cambridge University, Charles received flying lessons from the RAF. He went on to RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire to train as a jet pilot with his passing out parade in September 1971. Just as his great-grandfathers, his grandfather and his father, he went on to pursue a naval career, taking on a six-week course at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. Charles served on the guided missile destroyer HMS Norfolk and then went on to serve on two frigates, the HMS Minerva from 1972 to 1973 and the HMS Jupiter in 1974. In steaming heat, Prince Charles's frigate, HMS Minerva, edged her way into Nassau Harbour. A few minutes before, he had formally ended his duties as one of the ship's navigation officers and taken on the role again of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, with his personal standard broken from the mast. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. To get to Rawson's place, where the welcome speeches would be made, the prince walked at speed through an aisle of shouting, yelling Bahamians, with security men running in front to clear a path for him. If it was all a bit confused, the prince showed no sign of being put out by it. The speeches were from a dais placed in front of the old Nassau landmark, the statue of the prince's great-great-great-grandmother, and were brief to the relief of those in full dress with the temperature in the 90s. It will be five days of ceremonial engagements before Prince Charles rejoins Minerva next Wednesday for two more months of Caribbean patrol as a naval lieutenant. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. With his instructor, Lieutenant Commander Alan McGregor, the Prince inspected the helicopter before climbing inside. He seemed already familiar with the controls and was relaxed and cheerful before this, his first dual control training flight. After about 18 hours of instruction, Lieutenant the Prince of Wales, as he's officially known, will make his first solo flight. He'll also do mountain flying, armaments training, including the firing of guided missiles and emergency escape drill from a cockpit that's immersed in water and turned upside down. For the last 10 months of his active service in the Navy, on the 9th of February 1976, Charles took command of the coastal mine hunter, HMS Bronington. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the, the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people, and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. On the 11th of June, 1977, when appointed Colonel-in-Chief of the Parachute Regiment, Charles asked to take part in the parachute training course. He felt he could not look them in the eye or wear the regiment's beret and wings badge unless he had completed the course. Charles said, I felt I should lead from the front or at least be able to do some of the things that one expects others to do for the country. It really is a great privilege to be with you today in my 40th year as your Colonel-in-Chief. When appointed, to the position, I felt I couldn't look your predecessors in the eye or even dream of wearing the red berry without doing the parachute course. This threw the cap among the proverbial pigeons, but in the end, I was allowed to join parachute training course 841A at Bryce North. 
On the 16th of June 2012, Charles was appointed the most senior ranks of Field Marshal, Admiral of the Fleet and Marshal of the RAF in the three UK armed services. As future king, Charles was focused on finding an appropriate wife. He was determined to marry by the age of 30 and continue the noble and ancient lineage through his own heirs. In the 1970s, Charles was referred to as the most eligible bachelor in the world, and after searching far and wide for the perfect match, he met his future wife when his ex-girlfriend, Sarah, introduced him to Lady Diana Spencer in 1977. Quite famously, Sarah takes credit for the introduction, saying, I introduce them, I'm Cupid. At the time, he thought she was a very jolly and amusing and attractive 16-year-old. They met again a year after the death of Lord Mountbatten in 1980. Diana, now a couple of years older, was very sympathetic to Charles about his loss, which is said to have made him consider her as a possible wife. Charles invited Diana to Balmoral, where the Queen, Prince Philip, and the Queen Mother all received Diana very well. Even Camilla gave Prince Charles the nod of approval. She thought Diana was an ideal candidate. Their courtship attracted a lot of attention from the press, the media chasing Diana wherever she went. She now faced possibly the most daunting initiation test for would-be members of the royal family, ordeal by the media. Her flat came under siege. She was followed wherever she went. Even under this pressure, she stayed calm, and in doing so, she won respect. How well you're coping with all the press attention? Well, as you can, you can see, you can tell. <laughs> are, you, are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us. Are. Well, it is, naturally. And you, you're coping with it all right, though? You seem to be doing very well. Well, I'm still ran. <laughs> <laughs> can it, is there any possibility of any announcements of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me if there's any possibility? But I'm not going to say anything, but... Right, but oh, Prince sorry. Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> In February 1981, the waiting was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. The ring was a sapphire surrounded by diamonds. The couple looked happy and relaxed, delighted, like everyone else, that a wedding would take place. <laughs> Earl Spencer and Lady Diana's stepmother celebrated among the crowds outside the palace gates. Inside, Lady Diana was facing up to a future she could hardly have dreamt of. Yesterday you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would all I know like you would be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, I know I can't go wrong. He's there with me. The months between the engagement and the wedding were hectic, often exhilarating, sometimes trying. Oh, camera! She had to learn the restrictions of royal life. Never again would she be able to walk quietly down to the shops. Prince Charles had to keep the engagements he'd accepted before the announcement of the engagement, and this meant some separation. Diana had to accept this and do her best to hide her feelings. Now, if you watch that, that piece of footage, when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? Princess Diana's beaming, and she's giggling, saying, yes, yes, yes. And he says, whatever love is. And she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know? what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. 
Charles didn't really know what love was. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> yes. so. Well, it you obviously your means, own interpretation. Uh, obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Thank Thank you again, you congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank, you, Thank very you very much. much. Big time. before the wedding were happy ones. The couple attended many events as wedding fever gripped the nation. The more she attended, the better she coped. In July that year, Charles and Diana would enter a marriage that would have the whole world besotted. They made their way to St. Paul's Cathedral with a congregation of 3,500 people and two million people lining Diana's route from Clarence House. A quick look all along the route, see what it looks like as more and more people, as you've been telling us, are out and about. The best places are filling up and everyone's making sure it's going to be a great day. Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal brides since the young Queen Victoria was its first, marrying Prince Albert 141 years ago. The royal carriages, the Queen's procession and Prince Charles's little procession will drive down the leafy mall to Admiralty Arch in the distance. And five minutes after the Prince of Wales has passed, Lady Diana and her father will come out from Clarence House in the glass coach, just with police outriders, for she's not royal yet, and will follow her husband-to-be to St Paul's. Once through Admiralty Arch into Trafalgar Square, and next, the carriages will bowl past St. Clement Danes, the Air Force Church, and Gladstone's statue. And though Temple Bar is the border between the city of Westminster and the city of London, the Queen won't stop for any ceremony there today. She'll just drive straight on into Fleet Street, which has done its best, though not perhaps a spectacular best with the bunting. It'll be keeping its most colourful words for tomorrow morning's papers. All the troops along the way from here will be from regiments of which Prince Charles is Colonel-in-Chief. The Cheshire Regiment, the Gordon Highlanders, the Parachute Regiment. All will be here in half companies. And from the Commonwealth too, from Canada, the Winnipeg Rifles and the Royal Regiment of Canada. From Australia, the Royal Australian Armoured Corps. They'll be lining the route all the way to St Paul's. To the steps and the west doorway of St Paul's and the red carpet. Just a little while to go before this St. Paul's meets its first royal bride, Lady Diana. And the great door is not yet open. She was still Lady Di, but only just. She was about to become the first English girl in 500 years to marry a Prince of Wales. The eyes of the world were on her and she knew it. It was a day full of anticipation and excitement. Accompanied by her father, John Spencer, Diana travelled to St Paul's Cathedral in the glass carriage. With father on her arm, she then walked the three and a half minutes up the aisle. She seemed remarkably free from nerves, at the age of 20, beginning a new and very different life. He said, you look wonderful. She said, wonderful for you. The service was followed by the crowd outside in the sunshine. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. It went without a hitch, almost. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And there too, I give thee my trace. She was no longer a children's helper. She was the Princess of Wales, married to the heir to the throne. Another chapter in the thousand-year history of the British royal family had been written.
Charles and Diana were keen to start a family, and in 1982, Prince William was born. A couple of years later, in 1984, Prince Harry was born. Diana was well known to be a very hands-on mother, but Charles was a supportive parent too. Charles and Diana's marriage was not entirely a successful one. Whilst they built a family together with sons William and Harry, the relationship between Charles and Diana was not destined to last. The couple separated in 1992, divorcing in 1996. After Diana's death, Charles had to step up and take more responsibility for William and Harry. Though the young princes were growing up and becoming more independent, it was undoubtedly a very challenging time for both of them. William and Harry have praised their father publicly, and it is clear he has successfully set a strong example of the importance of hard work and generosity to others. Some of my earliest memories relate to times that my parents spoke to me, um, or even better, showed me what it meant to have both privilege and responsibilities. From my father, I learned how central charity was, or how central charity was to his life and his sense of purpose. The Prince's Trust is not an arm's length organization for my father. He cares deeply about the Prince's Trust because it is a living projection of his values. As a young child, I recall evening after evening my father's diligence and compassion as he applied himself to answering thousands of letters and reading endless reports in order to stay on top of his ambition to do all he could to help the underprivileged. Without my realizing it, what my parents were doing was instilling in me and Harry a lifelong habit to put charity at the heart of our lives. Many of the issues William and I now work on are subjects we were introduced to by our father growing up. His passion and dedication are remarkable, and seeing so many of you here today, I cannot fail but to be in awe of the drive he has had for so many years to contribute to the enrichment of society, both in this country and around the world. So, Pa, while I know that you've asked that today not be about you, you must forgive me if I don't listen to you, much like when I was younger. And instead, I ask everyone here to say a huge thank you to you for your incredible work over nearly 50 years. Charles had rekindled an old spark with former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles, much to the dismay and disapproval of royal courtiers. But they went on to marry in 2005, and their partnership has endured, becoming widely accepted by the public. When it comes to things he cares about, he cares about the country. You know, he cares about the young. Um, he cares about the environment. You know, the, these are big passions for him. King Charles has been no stranger to hard work. In the reporting year 2017 to 2018, he undertook over 600 engagements in the UK and around the world, which is not unusual for Charles's working year. He has visited 44 Commonwealth countries, many more than once, and has visited over 100 countries worldwide. Since leaving the armed forces, Charles very carefully carved out his role as heir apparent and did not simply wait for his final role. It's all about timings. That's the important bit. That's what we were drummed into us, that whether it be meals, meetings, uh, whatever it might be, you've got to make sure that things are done by a certain point so that he's able to then um, carry on doing his job. Charles took his title as Prince of Wales very seriously, maintaining a close and enduring relationship with Wales. Charles and Camilla made a visit to Wales every summer for a busy week packed full of engagements, often linked with his charities. 
Charles is always ready to get stuck in. So on a visit to BBC Scotland, with his usual charm, the then prince became a weatherman for the day. I'm delighted to say we've got a new member of our weather team tonight. Uh, let me hand over to him now. Your Highness. Well, it's an unsettled picture as we head towards the end of the week. Uh, this afternoon it'll be cold, wet and windy across most of Scotland. We're under the influence of uh, low pressure and this weather uh, front pushing northwards is bringing cloud and outbreaks of rain. The rain, of course, will be heaviest over the borders and uh, around Edinburgh where it could lead to difficult conditions on the roads. Uh, in the west, rain will be lighter and patchier. There will maybe a few drier interludes over Dumfries House in Ayrshire. Aha! There'll be snow for the higher ground of the Highlands and Aberdeenshire. The potential for a few flurries over Balmoral. Who the hell wrote this script? Uh, as the afternoon goes on. The best of the drier and brighter weather will, of course, be over the Northern Isles and the far north of the mainland. So. A little hazy sunshine to the Castle of May in Caithness, but a cold day everywhere with temperatures of just eight Celsius and a brisk northeasterly wind. Thank God it isn't a bank holiday. <laughs> and, uh, yes. you're, you're, you're right, and how, how do you feel he did? I think it's a very good weather forecast. Yes, you, yes you... he's always been longing to do it. He watches it every night. Um, we've always thought it would be rather good. I never thought that at all. Yes. <laughs> His official duties do not always run smoothly, however. While visiting Australia in January 1994, two shots from a starting pistol were fired at him on Australia Day by David Kang in protest of the treatment of several hundred Cambodian asylum seekers held in detention camps. Darling Harbour brimmed with anticipation of what was to be the highlight of Australia Day celebrations. Prince Charles was about to present awards to the state's top HSC students, but before he could utter a word, chaos. Dignitaries assembled on the stage were the first to the Prince's rescue, with no less than the Premier John Fay and Australian of the Year Ian Kiernan tackling the man. The Prince was shielded by his personal bodyguard, who kicked a starter's pistol out of the man's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everything is totally under control. Unharmed, His Royal Highness remained remarkably composed, continuing his official duties as the man was taken away for questioning. Within two hours of the attack, Police Minister Terry Griffiths was playing it down. Let's not dramatise it by suggesting that there was an attempted assassination. There was not. It was a stunt. But the charges were serious. 23-year-old David Kang was taken to the Sydney Police Centre and charged with attacking an international protected person, threatening to attack him, common assault, a fray, possession of a firearm and using a firearm. This morning, the Macquarie University student appeared in central local court applying for bail. The court heard the attack on Prince Charles was deliberate and planned by Kang to the extent that he bought the pistol and secured an itinerary for the royal visit. So when I, when I created the Prince's Trust in 1976 to help improve the lives of disadvantaged young people, it was because I was so acutely aware of the challenges that they faced. And over the years, some of the um, challenges have changed, but the overall mission uh, of giving people self-confidence, self-esteem and better opportunities remains the same. And in that time, we have helped over one million young people. And I always get, used to get so annoyed that it hadn't got to one million long ago because we had to keep counting people who were still going through the system. Even though we were actually helping 50,000 people a year, I thought, I know my maths is bad, <laughs> but... So we've helped over one million young people transform their lives, and the Prince's Trust now works in 18 countries across the Commonwealth and, and beyond. In 1976, Charles founded the Prince's Trust, a charitable organization to help vulnerable young people. Originally started using funds from his own Royal Navy severance pay, amounting to just over £7,000, the charity has gone on to help over one million people. It remains one of the biggest successes during his career as Prince of Wales. 
you can't teach confidence. You have to try and you have to give confidence to kids. This is really what the Princess Trust is about, I think, at base level. It's about giving people the confidence to try something that their peer group might not think is cool or interesting, but if they think it's if they if they think it's interesting, if they think it has value, then they should be given the confidence to go and do it. And it's about getting to these kids when they're in environments that aren't conducive to those sorts of things and pulling them out of that environment and saying, now, come over here, let's do this because I can show you something that's better. The charity helps those aged between 11 and 30 with issues such as homelessness, mental health problems or trouble with the law. I would like to take this opportunity to say to you, Charles, how proud I am of everything you have accomplished with the Trust and the way you personally have inspired this organisation. It is a very great pleasure for me, therefore, to present a Royal Charter to the Prince's Trust in recognition of its outstanding achievements over nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, none of this, after 40 years, and I hope we'll keep it going for a bit, uh, would be possible. But I'm only as good as the people who do all the marvellous things around the country, all the fantastic staff and all our young ambassadors and celebrity ambassadors and so many others. And, and I've said year after year just how proud I am of those young ambassadors and how they've totally changed their lives and now are doing all sorts of wonderful things. And as long as I've got a few marbles left remaining, <laughs> I should do my best to go on investing in the future of this remarkable country. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Charles's father, Prince Philip, was a keen environmentalist. His activism saved a species from extinction and raised unparalleled awareness on the blight of environmental pollution. Inspired by his father's mission, Charles too has dedicated his life to protecting our environment. It's um, totally useless for a lot of well-meaning people to wring their hands in conference and to point out the dangers of pollution or destruction of the country's countryside if no one is willing or capable of taking any action. The impassioned speeches will be so much effluent under the bridge unless it is followed by drastic political action. Well, sir, time is fast running out and it remains to be seen whether those in political authority can shoulder their responsibilities in time and act quickly enough to relieve a situation which grows more serious every day. Charles first spoke publicly about his concerns with the current environmental situation in terms of pollution and use of plastics in 1970 and had frequently been ridiculed for his opinions and interests, which he is now praised for and believed to have been forward-thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, the battle against climate change is surely the most defining and pivotal challenge of our times. Even in a world full of daunting perils and crises, it is hard to imagine anything that poses a greater challenge and opportunity for humanity. We are running out of time. How many times have I found myself saying this over recent years? We cannot delay, regroup, prevaricate, or wait for more and better information. We should compare the planet under threat of climate change to a sick patient. No doctor would wait for 100% certainty while a dying patient slipped away. We cannot ignore the symptoms and should act now to restore the health of the planet before it is too late. The Queen herself has acknowledged the great impact of the work carried out by Prince Philip, the then Prince Charles and Prince William in environmental causes and climate change. This is a duty I'm especially happy to discharge, as the impact of the environment on human progress was a subject close to the heart of my dear late husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I remember well that in 1969, he told an academic gathering, if the world pollution situation 
is not critical at the moment. It is as certain as anything can be that the situation will become increasingly intolerable within a very short time. It is a source of great pride to me that the leading role my husband played in encouraging people to protect our fragile planet lives on through the work of our eldest son, Charles, and his eldest son, William. I could not be more proud of them. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On the 8th of September 2022, Charles's life would change forever. A moment he would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen was under medical supervision and one by one, members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. Charles and Anne made it back to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second great Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy and following his mother's example, Charles stepped into his duties as king. After greeting crowds at Buckingham Palace, Charles and Camilla walked through the Golden Gates as King and Queen for the first time. The following day, Charles made his first televised broadcast as King, making a tribute to his beloved late mother, Queen Elizabeth II. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered. Through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service, I renew to you all today. On Saturday the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace. It was time to proclaim the new king. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles the Third. God save the king! For the first time in history, this historic ceremony was filmed. The Privy Council proclaimed His Majesty as King Charles the Third. My mother's reign was unequalled in its duration, its dedication, and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. In the days following his mother's death, Charles visited the different nations. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles made himself very visible, just like his mother did. He met with people waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state and visited people across the country who were grieving too. Charles, along with his brothers and sister, solemnly held a vigil at St. Giles's Cathedral and later at Westminster Hall. A touching and difficult moment for the siblings. 
On the 19th of September, Charles played an important part in the late Queen's funeral. King Charles walked behind the coffin, alongside his siblings and sons. A poignant moment. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death. It was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. Arriving at St George's Chapel, a smaller funeral service commenced. For the first time, the chorus sang, God save the King. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. He is the sovereign. He is the king. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. The first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. On May the 6th, the first coronation in 70 years will take place. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, the pomp and tradition will still feature. Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he is no longer able to speak so freely on his passions and opinions. He instead has to remain unbiased. King Charles has taken on his responsibilities with ease dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents and state officials, and attending various engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride. King Charles III. A king in waiting for so much of his life, Charles has been able to learn from one of the greatest monarchs Britain has ever known. Following in the footsteps of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles' sense of duty and dedication to service will likely define his reign too, as it has for so much of his life. In his own right, Charles has given so much of his working life to helping people and to protecting and conserving the environment. A compassionate and considerate king, Charles will continue the great legacy of the House of Windsor. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live, in the United Kingdom, or in the realms and territories across the world. And whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor 
to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love, as I have throughout my life. I, too, now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. I think he'll be a very good king. I think he'll be a compassionate king. He cares about the country. What you can see in Charles is genuine desire to make things better for people. I mean, he genuinely is somebody who has said, I worry about the fate of my subjects. Well, I always thought that Charles would make a wonderful king because he cares so much. He cares about his country. He cares about its heritage. He cares about the planet. And he cares about the people. The king served the longest apprenticeship, I think, in history as Prince of Wales. I don't think, I know he'll be a good king. He'll be a caring king, a compassionate king. He'll be a king for the people. Charles has always wanted to be king. I think it's fair to say that for decades he has been waiting to become king because he's seen this as his consummation of what he's been doing all his life. I shall endeavour to serve you with loyalty, respect and love as I have throughout my life. He was seen as somebody who was quite austere and quite cold. And I think that now, thankfully, there has been a narrowing between the public perception of the public king and indeed the private man. With Camilla at his side, I think he is going to be uh, wonderful and compassionate and understanding and all the things that he needs to be. Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to. And to feel this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders. And I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. It was very surreal the day after his mother's death to see the King and the Queen's concert return to London. It was very surreal, because um, he was returning as a king. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On the 8th of September 2022, Charles's life would change forever. At the exact moment of his mother's death, the Prince of Wales became King Charles III. The extraordinary reign of Queen Elizabeth II ended, and the day he had spent a lifetime preparing for had arrived, a moment he would later say he had dreaded his whole life. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen was under medical supervision, and one by one, members of the royal family were making their way to Balmoral to see the Queen. 
Charles and Anne made it back to Balmoral to be with their beloved mother as she peacefully passed away. The end of the second great Elizabethan era and a time of tremendous sadness for the family. I think that probably the shock of the mother's, his mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king it, it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you, in a way. So I think he he wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level, which would be really the only way to deal with something of that enormity happening to you. Broadcasters announced her death and stated the king and queen will return to London the following day. There is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy, and following his mother's example, Charles stepped into his duties as king. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. Born in 1948, King Charles III is said to have had a lonely childhood and his parents were often too busy with their royal duties, an endless round of royal engagements, official visits and tours across the globe. His childhood was anything but ordinary. Well, he was a very studious child. I mean, he was somebody who was quite unlike Prince Philip, who was a much more boisterous character. He was unlike his mother as well. Who, from, his mother was somebody who was very serious from a very young age, and Charles, I think, inherited this seriousness. But what he had, which she didn't have, was a real interest in learning and a real interest in books and things like that. This is seen as quite anomalous, because members of the royal family are not traditionally seen as intellectuals, but Charles, I think, was seen as somebody who had intellectual ideas and interests, possibly inculcated in him from his nanny a very young age. Well, Queen Elizabeth was a very dutiful mother. And if you think that she, she, she became queen aged 25, she had, you know, Prince Charles was, I think he was four, nearly, and, and Princess Anne was only, well, she was born in 1950. So she was only th just three when, she, when the queen was crowned. So basically her children were taken away from her. She just didn't have time to be with them. Uh, so she would see them in the morning, you know, for 15 minutes, and she would see them at night for half an hour. But again, you have to judge it by the moors of the time. That was how aristocratic families worked. When the coronation took place in 1953, it was quite interesting because Charles was obviously just about old enough to be at the coronation and to have an understanding of what was going on in a way that none of his siblings who are currently born did. And I suspect that for a very young boy, it would have been an overwhelming experience. I mean, the pageantry, the noise, the sheer number of people. But it would also have been, probably by then, in the back of his mind, this thought percolating about, it's going to be me one day. This is all going to happen for me. It was a three-hour ceremony. It was, everybody recalls, the coldest June day that had ever happened. And it was pouring with rain. And people, you know, there, there was, if you go back, this is 1953. So the ceremony itself was very, very serious and very religious and very dramatic. And it's impossible to speculate exactly how he would have felt because we have no record of his thoughts of the time and I doubt very much he remembers exactly how it was. But certainly, it must have been a sense of absolutely terrifying pressure being put on you as a young child to see all this at such a young age and to think, one day, unless something horrible happens or unexpected, this will all be for me as well. Well, obviously he was the eldest sibling of four. And I think it's fair to say that because he was the first sibling, and because he was going to be Prince of Wales and then eventually he was going to become king, there was always a sense that he was the one who was given the most attention and the most focus. So I think there is something that he, on the one hand, he thrived on, because who wouldn't thrive in a situation where you're always told that you're the most important one? 
The young king suffered from bullying at school and bouts of homesickness as he was sent to Gordonston in Scotland, the alma mater of his father, Prince Philip, a school his father had hoped would make a man out of his boy and instill in him the qualities required in a young man who would one day be king. While Charles was sent to public school in Scotland at Gordonston, which is an infamously tough school where essentially the attitude is spare the rod and spoil the child, it made Charles embittered, it made him, I think, somebody quite closed in terms of his emotions because he had to keep so much to himself. And he actually thought that Gordonston would be good for Charles because it was up in the north of Scotland, away from the press. Uh, it was, you know, it was meant to be wonderful outdoor life and, and, and you know, great emphasis was placed upon the training of the mind as well as the training of the brain. And Philip thought it would be perfect. I think the Queen and the Queen Mother probably thought that it, he would be, being such a sensitive young man, he probably would have been better to go to Eton. Prince Philip wanted his son to be uh, an image of himself. He wanted him to be macho and he wanted him to be sporty and he wanted him to have a sort of very strong personality. Well, Charles wasn't like that at all. He was very timid. He wasn't particularly sporty. He, 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 you know, he was a little awkward and he wasn't really the son that Philip hoped he'd have. So as Charles grew, their relationship was, just didn't work. After finishing school, Charles decided to go against royal tradition and study at Cambridge University instead of joining the armed forces. Unlike his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles always knew he would one day become king. In his own way, he had defined the role of heir apparent. It was quite common but before Charles for monarchs to go up to Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, Edward, Edward VIII, when he was Prince of Wales, went to Magdalen College, Oxford. But most people went to universities simply to acquire a, kind of a, a tick box, whereas Charles actually went to Cambridge with the intention of studying. He was the first member of the royal family to have actually gone to university with the intention of doing a three-year course and having a degree. But he had a very good time at Cambridge, because I think after the privations of prep school and boarding school, he found people he was comfortable with, he found an academic environment that he enjoyed, and he managed to act a lot as well. So I think you can say that Cambridge was in many respects the making of, of, of Prince Charles, and then of course when he became King Charles, he still being that somebody who had very strong links to his old university. And he got a 2-2 two, two in history in the end, which actually, for somebody who came from a non-academic background, was quite an achievement. Uh, I'm letting out a little slack, uh, a little slack now. Uh, yes, uh, taking up the strain, taking up the strain. This is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's very, very large indeed. I, I, I... A significant moment in Charles's life was his investiture as Prince of Wales at the age of 20. As he was nearing the end of his education and becoming an adult, he would soon take a more active role within the royal family. Well, Charles had his investiture as Prince of Wales at Carnarvon Castle on July 1st, 1969, and it was a hugely symbolic occasion because he was being given the title of Prince of Wales publicly. It was very much a sense that after a decade in which the royal family had had a quite difficult time reputationally, it was an attempt to take back control, if you like. It was an attempt to take back the idea that pageantry and pomp and this kind of big formal ceremony could show, first of all, what the future of monarchy was going to be, and secondly, exactly what he could expect when he was going to be Prince of Wales. Although Charles had been Prince of Wales for some years, it wasn't until the 1st of July 1969 that he was invested by the Queen. Before the ceremony, he had left Cambridge University to spend a term at the University College of Wales at Aberystwyth. His investiture was obviously quite a big, a big thing. Uh, it was obviously broadcast, televised, which was a would be a fast. From that, I want to say from that day forward, but probably even before then, the the kind of the training and the preparation of one day becoming king began, and I think, you know, he took this very seriously his whole life. During his term in Wales, he had spent his time learning about Welsh history and culture, as well as learning to speak the language. Maioch anerchiad, wedi fy nghyfor, ynddwys. 
a gallaf a sicrhai fy mod wedi cymryd sylwi o'r gobeithion am lygywyd and the new. Charles's attitude towards every kind of formal event of his stage in his life, I think, could be best summarised as fear. If you look at him and you look at his face and the pictures and the film that exists, he looks frightened. He looks like he's not confident about the situation. And he looks as if he's finding it quite difficult to cope with all the attention placed upon him. Because there's always a sense, I think, that having to live up to not just your mother's example, but examples of every single monarch who's gone before you. What's really nice is I noticed when I was working for him at Highgrove, he was very much training his son, Prince William. And I believe in how he would become a Prince of Wales and he was teaching him all the things that he had learned. So he's passed it on to Prince William, who is now the Prince of Wales. After completing his degree, Charles joined the army. It was an important next step for him as heir to the throne and future head of the armed forces. It has always been a great tradition of the royal family that each member should engage in active service and lead by example, playing more than just a symbolic role. It's been traditional that any member, any male member of a royal family would be expected to spend time in the army. And Charles was not an obvious fit to spend time in the armed forces, but the fact that he served in the RAF for several years in the 1970s was an indication that, first of all, he could put his mind to something like this and do it with, I don't think it's, I think it's true to say that compared to, say, Prince Andrew, who was quite a distinguished pilot, Charles was not exactly out of a top drawer in the RAF, but it was still an invaluable time for him because he found himself mixing with his men on much more equal terms than he ever had been able to when he was at school. The King has maintained very close links to the armed forces throughout his life and can be spotted in military uniform with an array of medals. At the Queen's state funeral, he boasted the uniform during a procession of the cortege carrying the Queen's coffin from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. I think that it was actually probably a character-forming experience for him because it did give him a sense of working with the armed forces and that's something that he's had a lifelong respect for. So while it's fair to say that Charles was not the most distinguished member of the RF has ever been, it was certainly an important time for him and something that I think affected and led to the man that he's become. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, because experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Challenges have also arisen from the reporting of the media, who have chosen to focus on the ups and downs of Charles's personal and romantic life. His days as the most eligible bachelor prince saw great speculation as to who would be his future wife. I think the family generally thought with Charles that he shouldn't marry before he was 30, that he should date as many people as he could and see what came of that. And on the one hand, he wasn't necessarily the most outgoing of men. He wasn't necessarily somebody who was going to be a lady killer. But on the other hand, he was a prince of Wales. There was no shortage of people who would have married him. Well, Charles is like... Um... Uh, a very old-fashioned, uh, very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater. Um, and he is also a people pleaser. Well, he met Lady Diana Spencer in 1977 because he'd actually been dating her elder sister, Sarah, for a while. And when he first met Diana, she was 16. And it was an unequal relationship because she was still a girl. But there was obviously a spark between them, a spark of interest. And of course, at this stage, Charles was still seeing Camilla Shand, who later became Camilla Parker Bowles. So I think it's fair to say that on the one hand, the relationship with Diana was not necessarily an obvious love match from the beginning, but on the other hand, there was very much an, in an interest on both sides. And she was somebody, perhaps because of her youth, who was not phased by responsibilities that she'd have to take on if she became Princess of Wales. Yesterday you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would well, I know like it would be Queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, uh, I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. 
The eventual marriage to Lady Diana Spencer was just the fairy tale the world had been waiting for. A dashing prince with his blushing bride. Of a royal wedding was by far the biggest event for the royal family that there'd been since the coronation nearly 30 years before. And it was something that people were queuing up on the streets to see it. There were millions and hundreds of millions of people watching it worldwide because it was bringing glamour to the royal family. It was the idea, I mean, the famous picture of kissing on Buckingham Palace balcony, one of the most reproduced images of the royal family of the 20th century. And it was one of those days that was freighted with pageantry, freighted with pomp, and it was designed to show at the, at the beginning of the 1980s, at the start of Thatcherism, that Britain could still put on this kind of event that would still excite people, it would still show off what soft power could do. The best places are filling up, and everyone's making sure it's going to be a great day. Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal brides since the young Queen Victoria was its first, marrying Prince Albert 141 years ago. Together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony, Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honour and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. And I feel rather sorry for Diana, actually, because she was caught in the middle of it, and she was still so young at this stage, when she's only 20 years old. And the idea of being placed in front of the world's cameras and the world's media and essentially told to perform must have been absolutely terrifying. I mean, Charles had more experience of it, of course, he'd been doing it for longer, but it still must have been overwhelming for him as well. When Charles and Diana were asked in their engagement interview if they were in love, she replied, of course, and Charles more or less shrugged and said, whatever love means. Each of those answers is disingenuous. Diana is answering, of course, because she doesn't want to try and get into any kind of deeper question. She wants to brush away the answer. Charles's whatever love means is, I think, an attempt on his part to try and say, that's a ridiculous question. Why are you asking me that? I'm not interested in responding to it. However, it was the worst possible thing he could have said because for decades afterwards, that has been taken to mean he doesn't love Diana, he's doing this because he feels he has to, he's been forced into it, he couldn't care less, she could be anyone. And I think that a lot of the public ill will towards Charles comes about because it was felt he wasn't in love with Diana. And that response, I think, has led to a lot of it. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously, means, your own interpretation. obviously means to very happy people. Yes. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank you very much. Family has always been very important to Charles. And when it came to his own family, Diana was known to be a very hands-on mother. But Charles was a supportive parent too. William and Harry have praised their father publicly, and it is clear that he has successfully set a strong example of the importance of hard work and generosity to others. As we now know, whilst they built a family unit together with sons William and Harry, the relationship between Charles and Diana was not one destined to last. I think that their relationship was troubled after the birth of Prince Harry, and one of the reasons why it was troubled was simply because Diana was essentially running her own show. She was getting a lot of attention, but her husband wasn't. She was somebody who was being fated. She was being seen increasingly as a fashion icon. Things were starting to unravel a bit because I don't think it, it, it matched what Diana had expected. She had this vision of uh, being like a fairy princess and being carried away into the sunset. But the minute she was married, her husband was off working. I mean, it was, you know, he, he's always been a very hard worker and he was devoted to his duty. Camilla Parker Bowles was the great love of Charles's life and he met her in the 1970s and she was a debutante. She was not from the highest aristocratic background, but she was sort of comfortable country gentry background. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from 
a very early age, you know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She was funny, she was a great rider, and she made him laugh. And I think that Camilla has this, she, she's very, very attractive to both men and women because of her personality. She's got a wonderful personality. She wasn't felt to be suitable as wife for him precisely for this reason. I mean, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, felt that one of the Spencer daughters was far more suitable. And so you can see that if, he, if Charles had been allowed to marry Camilla when he wanted to marry Camilla, the whole trajectory of the royal family would have been entirely different because they got on very well, they shared a similar sense of humour, similar interests, they obviously found each other very attractive. And this was, I think, one of the tragedies of the, the latter day royal family that Charles was simply not allowed to marry the woman he wanted to. Charles' reaction to Diana's death in August 1997 was absolute horror. I mean, there's no two ways of describing it. The mother of your children has been killed very suddenly. There's no possibility of preparing for it. He was in a state of shock, and I think all of his actions throughout that time have to be seen as epitomizing of Charles at his best, actually. He went to Paris straight away. He was a person who was responsible for bringing her back. He was very much somebody who was lobbying her to be given every single state funeral and all the rest of it against, I think, his mother's and grandmother's wishes because they saw her as somebody who'd left the royal family and wasn't entitled to this kind of treatment. Whereas he, with half an eye on his public reputation, took the argument she is going, she's the mother of the future King of England. She deserves this. And I think that you can see, I mean, we have no idea what their relationship was like after their divorce. We don't know for certain if they ever met or what the, what the correspondence was like, if they dealt with each other very much, if they were communicating through third parties. But certainly, I mean, it must have been the most awful shock for him, as it was for everybody else in the country. After Diana's death, Charles had to step up and take more responsibility for William and Harry. The young princes were growing up and becoming more independent. It was undoubtedly a very challenging time for both of them. One family relationship that has been of significant interest to the public is his bond with the Duke of Windsor, King Edward VIII, notoriously the king who was never crowned. It is unusual for a former king to get to meet a future king, as abdications are quite rare. But Charles gained so much insight from his uncle about the role and responsibility of being king. Visiting him was said to have been a turning point in the prince's life realizing the demands of the role and what it means to be a king. Charles later rekindled an old spark with former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles. Their love story has faced so many challenges, but 35 years after they first met, they finally married, together at last. Charles had declared that Camilla was a non-negotiable part of his life. And so, against the advice and approval of the royal courtiers, they began a relationship that, in time, the world would come to accept. Well, Charles's marriage to Camilla in 2005 was, it was a civil ceremony rather than a religious ceremony. And it was very much felt, I think, by everybody in the country that they'd finally managed to make each other happy. And I think that if they had been allowed to marry 25 years before, the world would have been a much, much better place for it. But I think that what had been done so cleverly was that Camilla had been seen during Diana's lifetime as a rather villainous figure, which she really isn't. She's a very charming, very lovely woman. And what happened was this the PR campaign you know, a year or so after Diana's death that Camilla and Charles were seen together in public. She was very much acknowledged as his companion. And eventually after, I mean, it was quite a long time. I mean, it was eight years between Diana's death and their marriage. I mean, he could not be accused of rushing into it. The, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty. And she also saw her dedication to Charles because she... She so helps him and he wants her at his side and she will be at his side. So she's got, she's almost in a queen mother type of role. 
You know, Queen Mother was there for her husband in his weaker moments, and I think Camilla will be there for Charles. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news, and when the Cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole government. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. If you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Can I say a ring? You can have a How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, just all right. I'm just, I'm, I'm just coming down to earth. Did he get down on one knee to propose? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Did you get it, right? I'll just do another picture of us. The King's relationship with his wife is, is fantastic. They are the best of friends. There is no question on that. I've, I've witnessed that. They're the best of friends. They're a team. They work well together, they support each other, they laugh together. It's it's wonderful to, to see and, and to have been part of to be part of that, you know, to witness that. Your Royal Highness, uh, mm -hmm. eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you are you, feeling? Heard how in particular <laughs> Princess William and Harry are feeling at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy. Very pleased. Be a good day. Yeah. Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it, anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> Prince William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. The one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. The wedding was amazing. We went to the wedding uh, 9th of April, uh, 2005, it was... An amazing day. It was at Windsor Castle. Uh, we were at the castle for the the, the reception. Queen, Queen did a speech. Uh, you had all members of the royal family there. There was a real party atmosphere. It was fun. William and Harry were there. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. Watch William and Harry chase after the the car as the car drives off with the the Prince William and Dutch Kong was so much fun. Really funny. I think they decorated the back of the car and everything. It was a, it was absolutely wonderful, and, and she's always been a support to him. She's always been absolutely wonderful. They have now become widely accepted as a couple, and their journey has been dogged by the media and the resistance of the grey suits at the palace. The fight for their relationship has proved worthwhile in one of history's greatest love stories. In 1976, Charles founded the Prince's Trust, a charitable organization to help vulnerable young people. The charity has gone on to help one million people. It remains one of the biggest successes of his career as Prince of Wales. So the, the King served the longest apprenticeship, I think, in history as Prince of Wales. And I suppose you might think that he was frustrated maybe or you get to a point where you want to do the job and and from my view that was never the case he he enjoyed being prince of wales he did a an amazing job they'd never been the prince of wales that had more or less created it into an actual job and that's what he did he made it an actual job i'm delighted to say we've got a new member of our weather team tonight uh, let me hand over to you now your highness well it's an unsettled picture as we head towards the end of the week uh, this afternoon it'll be cold, wet and windy across most of Scotland. We're under the influence of uh, low pressure and this weather uh, front pushing northwards is bringing... King Charles has been no stranger to hard work. In the reporting year 2017-18, he undertook over 600 engagements in the UK and around the world, which is not unusual for the future king's working year. He has visited 44 Commonwealth countries, many more than once, and visited over 100 countries worldwide. Since leaving the armed forces, 
Charles has very carefully carved out his role as heir apparent. Charles took his title as Prince of Wales very seriously, maintaining a close and enduring relationship with Wales. The Prince and Duchess visited Wales every summer for a busy week packed full of engagements, often linked with his charities. Well, what, what Charles has done throughout his life is in addition to his conventional royal responsibilities, he's had a real interest in making a difference in the lives of younger people. And so the major thing he's known for is the Prince's Trust, which is this organisation which specialises in giving out funding to disadvantaged organisations and individuals and trying to make their lives better. I think the thing about the Prince's Trust is that it's a brilliant idea. He's had the public persona and the ability to actually make it work. And so it's one of those things that even people who don't like the royal family and even people who have Republican sentiments would usually agree that Prince's Trust has been a force for good. And I think that what you can see in Charles is genuine desire to make things better for people. I mean, he genuinely is somebody who has said, I worry about the fate of my subjects. And I think that's true. I think he does. I mean, he doesn't always get it right, but none of us would. And I think that the Prince's Trust and the Prince's Foundation are real concrete steps to actually helping people's lives. So when I, when I created the Prince's Trust in 1976 to help improve the lives of disadvantaged young people, it was because I was so acutely aware of the challenges that they faced. And over the years, some of the um, challenges have changed, but the overall mission uh, of giving people self-confidence, self-esteem and better opportunities remains the same. And in that time, we have helped over one million young people. And I always get, used to get so annoyed that it hadn't got to one million long ago because we had to keep counting people who were still going through the system, even though we were actually helping 50,000 people a year. I thought, I know my maths is bad, <laughs> but... So we've helped over one million young people transform their lives, and the Prince's Trust now works in 18 countries across the Commonwealth and, and beyond. I would like to take this opportunity to say to you, Charles, how proud I am of everything you have accomplished with the Trust and the way you personally have inspired this organization. It is a very great pleasure for me, therefore, to present a Royal Charter to the Prince's Trust in recognition of its outstanding achievements over nearly a quarter of a century. Led in the job, you know, he, he, he lent the job from his, his, his mother and, and father. The, his education was always about preparing him for the day that he became king. I don't think anyone ever imagined that he'd been Prince of Wales for as long as he, as he was, but it's put him in a really good place of understanding the country and the world we're in today. So I think if you would say to me, is he, is he, is he the, the best man for the job? I think it's safe to say yes, he is, because he has done uh, an, an amazing uh, bit of training. And as the Queen once said, famously said that training is everything. At the end of the day, that's the answer to everything. And it's true. It is the answer to everything, as that training that her son had has now put him into a job that he can, that he can undertake. It is quite endearing to watch the relationship that has evolved between Charles and his mother, the Queen. The late Queen and the King were very, were very close. Her, her son, she had a, 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 a wonderful relationship with him. Again, a fun relationship, which we all saw. We used to see different events in London when he would suddenly call her mummy and she'd pull a face at him. And, you know, there was a, a, a wonderful relationship. Mummy. <laughs> but, but they respected each other. I mean, he really respected his mother. He respected the fact that she was queen and everything that stood for. Outside the royal court, the state trumpets sound. Before rolling news, the role of this part of the ceremony was to spread the word to a waiting nation.
the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles the Third. God save the king! On Saturday, the 10th of September, the Accession Council gathered at St. James's Palace. It was time to proclaim the new king. For the first time in history, the historic ceremony was filmed. Charles made a personal declaration. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. So the proclamation was quite special because the proclamation's always been, well, part of it is always private. The actual part that you saw outside on the balcony of St. James's Palace has been televised or recorded before. But what goes on indoors, you never see. So the fact we actually got to see him um, actually doing the, the signing and everything was quite, was quite special. Even if there was one or two little funny moments, but it was quite an important, a historical uh, important moment uh, for him and for us to all be allowed to watch that, which was, I, could, I mean, I was amazed that we got to see it. And, and again, it's one of those um, memories, I think, that we we'll always, we'll always have. You know, it was, it was quite special seeing that. In the days following his mother's death, Charles visited the different nations. In a time where families would ordinarily grieve together in private, Charles made himself very visible, just like his mother did. He met with people waiting in the famous queue to see the Queen lying in state, and visited people across the country who were grieving too. Charles, along with his brothers and sister, solemnly held vigil at St. Giles's Cathedral and later at Westminster Hall, a touching and difficult moment for the siblings. On the 19th of September, Charles played an important part in the late Queen's funeral. King Charles walked behind the coffin alongside his siblings and sons, a poignant moment. Arriving at St. George's Chapel, a smaller service commenced. For the first time, the chorus sang, God Save the King. Charles, obviously so moved by the moment, struggled to hold back his tears. He is the sovereign. He is the king. The weight of the crown is now on his shoulders. It must be the most extraordinary experience to walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace as king, something you've done untold times before as Prince of Wales, and to feel this garment of this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders, because you start to think to yourself, well, what am I taking on? What is this responsibility? I mean, what does the future hold for me? So Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to, and I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. And so I think that a lot of people found that much more affecting than they were expecting to, because just as the Queen was a kind of grandmother to the nation, 
he was very explicitly offering himself as a substitute. And I think that many people who wouldn't expect we were going to be moved by it were moved by it. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. On May the 6th, the first coronation in 70 years will take place. Though said to be scaled down compared to Queen Elizabeth's ceremony, the pomp and tradition will still feature. Charles and Camilla will be crowned king and queen. Following his mother's death, Charles's life and responsibilities have changed. As king, he is no longer able to speak so freely on his passions and opinions. He instead has to remain unbiased. King Charles has taken on his responsibilities with ease, dealing with the famous red box each day, meeting with prime ministers, presidents, and state officials, and attending various engagements. He has taken his new role in his stride. The proclamation of King Charles was something that took place just after his announcement as king, and it's something that was announced in every major city and every major town in Britain, and something that, because it hadn't happened in so long, it hadn't happened since the 1950s, there was a real interest in it, because people hadn't seen a proclamation before, but of course now they are seeing this man being proclaimed king, which is, again, it's something that's been going on for centuries, but it's still got a hugely symbolic role that we are seeing before our very eyes. The reassertion of monarchy, the reassertion of kingship, because not a lot of people alive today are going to remember King George VI, his grandfather. So having a king again is really quite a novelty. The role King Charles III played at his mother's funeral was very much head of the family and also king of the nation. And I'm sure it was quite a difficult time, mainly because, you know, the eyes of the world are watching you. It's not a private thing at all, and he's aware of that. Everything he does, every, every action, every tear, everything has been watched and listened to and, and discussed. Well, Charles was obviously responsible for making sure that the, fu that the funeral went as smoothly as it did because he was obviously the focus of attention. He was the person that most people were looking at in terms of how it was going to be for him. And he's somebody who I think was on the day, he walked behind the coffin, he was very much, you know, the, the focus of public interest, the focus of public attention. And he did everything exceptionally well. I mean, the funeral was very well organised. It had been, of course, organised. It had been planned for years, but it went off without a hitch and Charles' involvement that has to be seen as testament to the fact that everything worked well. There was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because 
it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. It must have been a very strange experience because you hear this song, which you've heard, which you've heard a million times before, when it's about your mother and God save the Queen, and it's about the King and it's about you. And it must have been a very extraordinarily cathartic experience in a lot of regards, but also an overwhelming one. It was very surreal the day after his mother's death to see the King and the Queen's concert return to London. It was very surreal because um, he was returning as a King. I don't think, I know he'll be a good King. He'll be a caring King, a compassionate King. He'll be a King for the people. Well, I always thought that Charles would make a wonderful King because he cares so much. He cares about his country, he cares about its heritage, he cares about the planet, and he cares about the people. And I think that he, that's really the attributes you need for a king. He is perfect. I suspect that Charles will be a modernising monarch. I suspect that he'll be somebody who tries to fulfil his own interests. And so far he's been popular, so far you look at all the polls and there seems to be general approval for what he's doing. But he's still very much of a honeymoon period. I mean, we're not going to see yet, for quite a while, as to how he really is as king. I mean, he's only been king a matter of a few months. So his king's speech at Christmas was very well received. It was short, it was very well delivered, it dealt with social issues again. I mean, it was something that was quite close to the first term of New Labour in terms of its emphasis. So we'll see. I mean, we'll see what he's like. I mean, he's got everyone's given him the benefit of the doubt. He has his flaws, but everybody knows him. His flaws are, don't come as a surprise. But with Camilla at his side, I think he is going to be uh, wonderful and compassionate and understanding and all the things that he needs to be. The King's public persona and private persona are very similar. Obviously there has to be a, it's slightly different because I've always said that it doesn't matter what you do in life, you, you act it, you always have to act and do it. But, but more or less what you see is, is very much how he is behind closed doors. He's, he's very similar. I've noticed recently the prince or the king that we see in public is very similar to the, the prince or king that I knew. So that's what's so interesting is seeing the, how they're becoming more uh, confident in, in showing how they are in, in private, which is fantastic. And we get so much inside footage now that we never used to get. So we see private audiences and meetings and all sorts of things that we would never have, have seen, what, 20, 30 years ago. So it's, we, so that's why it makes it easier to say to people, well, the man, the king that I knew or know is the same as the king that you see because that is what you see is, is how he is. When King Charles III took over the crown after the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, there was much discussion about which name he would take when he was declared king. Charles could have chosen any of his four names, but his decision to stick to Charles signifies that he plans to carry on the legacy behind the historical name. 
Charles III was the longest serving heir apparent in British history, having acted as the Prince of Wales for a staggering 64 years. It is a role that he came to embrace ever since his investiture and ultimately redefine it in his own way. Now, as the Commonwealth enters a new era with a new monarch, there is no doubt in everyone's mind that the new king is well suited to take up the crown. After all, Charles has spent his entire life waiting for it. It must have been a sense of absolutely terrifying pressure being put on you as a young child to see all this at such a young age and to think one day, unless something horrible happens or unexpected, this will all be for me as well. His mother, the late Queen Elizabeth II, was crowned at Westminster Abbey in 1953, and she remained the head of the royal family and the monarchy for more than 70 years. And I suspect that for a very young boy, it would have been an overwhelming experience, I mean, the pageantry, the noise, the sheer number of people. But there had also been, probably by then, at the back of his mind, this thought percolating about, it's going to be me one day, this is all going to happen for me. While Charles's reign as king is overshadowed by that of his mother, his legacy as Prince of Wales is... But with a great name comes great responsibility. The name Charles has a special place in history. During the reign of Kings Charles I and II, England, Scotland and Ireland witnessed the culmination of numerous long-standing religious, political and social disputes into a climax, resulting in civil wars, the Irish Rebellion and the infamous Cromwell Rule. While Charles I was an unpopular monarch who spent his life as king in conflict with Parliament, his son, Charles II, was adored by the public because of his role in the Protestant Restoration in England. But there's a lot more to it. Let's start at the beginning. Born to King James VI of Scotland and Anne of Denmark on November the 19th, 1600, Charles I lived in the Dunfermline Palace in Fife, Scotland, for the first few years of his life. As an infant, Charles was weak and fragile, and while the rest of his family left for England when his father was proclaimed king, Charles stayed in Scotland with a guardian. As his health improved and his constitution became stronger, Charles was finally allowed to travel to England at the age of four to be reunited with his family. But his speech never fully developed and Charles had a stammer for the rest of his life. To walk, Charles wore special boots made of Spanish leather and brass to strengthen his ankles. He soon took up riding and other sports, proving himself adequately skilled. His public profile was still not as high as his brother, Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales, who was much stronger and taller and the heir apparent to the three kingdoms. His elder brother, Prince Henry, was very charismatic. People were looking forward to his accession to the throne, whereas Charles was very much a background figure in his childhood. He was essentially treated as the runt of the litter. He was very short. He was very conscious all his life, but his exceptionally short stature. I mean, he was barely five foot high. And the fact is, is that he, he suffered from rickets as a boy. This always made him un unathletic. He felt that he was ungainly. For the fact that he often had to you know, endure bed rest meant that he was able to read and he was able to write, he was able to study literature and the classics in a way that most monarchs simply weren't able to because he was not somebody who was going to be going out and having a sort of, you know, a wild life of parties and a wild life of horse riding and things like that. He had to have a much more insular, much more sedate existence. And I think that's what made him a much more thoughtful king than many people before and since. But in November 1612, Henry died at the age of 18, possibly of typhoid. Charles was 12 at the time, and as the eldest surviving son of King James, he was next in line to the throne and was soon proclaimed the Duke of Cornwall and Duke of Rothsay. The 
The Stuart era was a remarkably complicated era because it came between the Elizabethan era and the Georgian era. And during this time, there was a huge amount of upheaval, both social and political. And I think it's fair to say that when we talk about early modern England, the Stuart era is perhaps the first true indication of what England became. And if you look at the way in which the artistic scene, the cultural scene, the role of women changed over this period. I think it's fair to say that the Stuart era was one of the most consequential areas in English history, and that actually when you look at what was achieved in this remarkably short space of time, we can only look at its legacy as being one of the most important things that English history ever produced. Across the English Channel, the Thirty Years' War had broken out. First, confined to Bohemia, then spiralling into a much wider European war. King James decided that a marriage between his son Charles and Maria Anna of Spain would be a diplomatic way of achieving peace in Europe. But negotiations with Spain didn't go as planned, and the English Parliament turned against King James for proposing that the heir apparent marry a Catholic princess. Largely, it's the aftermath of the Reformation um, so there's a lot of dissent, um, a lot of people don't necessarily buy into the national churches. Um, in England, there's certainly a great deal of criticism of the Church of England, which was Elizabeth I's compromise position on the church. It's a Protestant settlement, but it doesn't go as far as many Protestants at her court wanted. James continued quarrelling with the ministers and dissolved the parliament, making matters worse. In 1625, James died, and Charles was crowned king. And he very much follows his father's view that he is ruling by the divine right of God, that God has placed him on the throne as King of England and King of Scots. The same year, King Charles I married Princess Henrietta Maria of France. He was 25 and she was 14. Well, Charles's marriage to Henrietta Maria was one that was done explicitly to, to bring about peace with Spain because it was felt for such a long time that Spain was the great threat, not just to national stability, but to international stability. And also given the fact that the country was impoverished, nobody had any desire to convert an expensive and time-consuming war. And so the obvious way of dealing with this was to bring about a match between Charles I and Henry and Henrietta Maria, who was the Spanish princess. And this was seen as pragmatism, this was seen as a very good way of finally bringing about what's obviously been longed for between Elizabeth I and Philip of Spain. And it was felt that it was going to become a marriage of convenience. That it became a love match of some intensity between the two parties was an unexpected development to the greatest extent. But we can look at Charles' relationship with Henrietta as being one that was vital to his happiness and vital to his own success as king. The two married in front of Notre Dame in Paris by proxy, after which they met for the first time in Canterbury. Many members of the House of Commons opposed this union, as Henrietta was a Roman Catholic. And there was growing concern over whether King Charles would uphold the establishment of the reformed Church of England. Charles marries Henrietta Maria of France, who is, of course, a Catholic. And it's agreed that she will be permitted to worship as a Catholic in England, even though, of course, it's illegal to attend Catholic worship and has been since the 1550s. His coronation occurred at Westminster Abbey in February 1626, but his new wife refused to attend the ceremony because it was a Protestant religious service. So this immediately makes her quite unpopular and Catholics are really everyone's favorite bogeyman in 17th century Britain. Um, they are seen as agents of the Antichrist. They are seen as, you know, evil um, figures. So Henrietta Maria immediately gets off on the wrong foot by, um, just by being a Catholic. The ministers were not wrong in questioning Charles's ability to retain Protestantism in England, because, as it was so, Charles had secretly promised his brother-in-law, Louis XIII of France, that he would relax religious restrictions against Catholics. 
And of course, Catholicism in Britain at this time was regarded with great suspicion after the reign of Elizabeth and the reign of James. Charles was not somebody who was himself a Catholic, but he was a lot more Catholic adjacent, both literally and symbolically, than either James or Elizabeth had been. And it's certainly the case that what he did at court was not to permit Catholicism exactly or to bring about a time where Catholics were going to be welcomed, but he did, you know, stop the persecution of them. He did stop the absolute sense that if you were Catholic, you were going to find yourself strung up. During Charles's reign, there were various theologies followed by people. There are large numbers of people who worship outside these structures. There are, of course, Catholics, and it's illegal to worship as a Catholic. But there are Protestants as well who don't find their place within the Church of England. For example, Puritans. Puritans are Calvinist in approach and much more staunch in their religion than the Church of England, which is very much a compromised settlement. Um, they particularly are not in favour of church hierarchies, so um, in general don't want bishops, and prefer a much plainer form of worship. They consider themselves to be the godly. They are the ones who will be saved, who will go to heaven. In Scotland, we have the Kirk, which is a national church. It's very Presbyterian, so quite similar to Puritans in a lot of ways. Um, again, not at all keen on bishops, not at all keen on the king being the head of the church. Meanwhile, disputes between Charles and Henrietta continued. Since Henrietta was both French and Catholic, the British public was deeply suspicious of her identity. Despite living in a Protestant country, Henrietta maintained her religious devotion. She also spent an excessive amount of money on luxury items. This angered Charles, who ended up expelling most of her French attendants, leading to diplomatic turmoil. With the help of the Duke of Buckingham, Charles also went against his agreement with Louis XIII and attacked the French coasts unsuccessfully, leading to international embarrassment and discordance. Buckingham's a fascinating figure because he's somebody who I don't feel has been quite, given quite enough attention by history. I mean, he was murdered at the age of 35, but, bef but before then he became extraordinarily powerful at court. He became somebody who was influential in a way that perhaps the king wasn't. He was somebody who was essentially ruling the country in all but name. He was almost a regent. And, but Charles deferred to him because he would have grown up seeing Buckingham as this man who was controlling his father. And essentially, I don't think there's any sexual relationship between Buckingham and, and Charles I, but there was certainly this very strong homosocial relationship. Buckingham's charismatic, he used this charisma to get what he wanted out of Charles. And so he was seen as a man who was actually making the decisions in the kingdom, much more than the king was. To make matters worse, in 1626, Charles introduced a forced loan, a tax levied on the public without the consent of Parliament. In 1628, Parliament called upon the King to acknowledge that he could not undertake such actions without their permission. Well, the difficulty with his relationship with Parliament is that he never had any money, and Parliament didn't have any money either. So what he would do was he would say to Parliament, you are going to loan me X amount of money on these occasions, I'm going to prorogue you. And by proroguing Parliament, not allowing them to sit, Charles was trying to take back the absolutist power that his own father had wanted. But the difficulty is that the Parliament were not particularly happy with the idea of being forced to loan the King money on regular intervals, because they saw it as being not their role to be catering to a profligate King who was far too much in fraud to a small number of, of, of men around him. Even though Charles agreed to the petition, he immediately went against it and discontinued the Parliament. As an absolute monarch, Charles asserted his right to collect dues without authorization from anyone. When you become king, and you never particularly wanted to become king, you've got two choices. First is to do a very, very, very bad job of it, as Edward VIII did, and try and, try and abdicate. In the 17th century, this was not really an option, because you can't abdicate. The only way you're going to be abdicating is if somebody cuts your head off. And Charles knew that if he was going to make any kind of success out of being king, he had to tone down his own impulses towards literature, creativity, the arts. He had to make peace of Parliament. 
He had to try and unite the warring aristocrats around him. But he wasn't the sort of character of person who could do all this stuff. He was not committed enough to the kind of nitty gritty of political machinations. So what he wanted to do instead was essentially to rule much the same way that his father had, ignoring Parliament, asking them for money, and then essentially shutting them down as soon as they wouldn't do so. In January 1629, Charles finally reassembled Parliament, but it only led to more ministers voicing their opposition to his laws and the monarchy's power. When Charles tried to adjourn the Parliament in March, the Speaker, Sir John Finch, was held down in his chair so that the session would go on long enough for the members to pass resolutions against Catholicism, Arminianism and other pertinent issues. This move angered King Charles, who dissolved the Parliament and imprisoned nine parliamentary leaders. Charles is an absolute ruler. The advantage of absolutism is you can do what you like. You're not hemmed in by anyone apart from your advisers. You don't have parliament to be answerable. However, Charles is very much on a collision course with his parliament. They are divided in religion. The vast majority of the English parliament are Puritan by inclination. And they also have a growing sense of indignation about the way they perceive the king as governing. After this, King Charles ruled without a parliament for 11 years, a time known in history as personal rule, or the 11 years of tyranny. While legally Charles could rule without a parliament, he could not raise taxes. This meant his capacity to acquire funds was limited, and he had to find other revenue sources. During the personal rule, King Charles I resurrected ancient laws and even granted monopolies to raise funds, all of which were unpopular among the public and led to widespread unrest. Religious conflicts also grew at this time, with the English Reformation being a hot topic of discussion. While some thought him to be too sympathetic to Arminianism, others thought he was not sympathetic enough to the cause and urged him to show his support to the Protestant cause abroad. So Charles ploughs on with his religious policies in spite of mounting criticism. He has always favoured the Church of England over the Scottish Kirk because it places a monarch in control and he would like to see this replicated in Scotland. And as part of that, he attempts to impose effectively the English prayer book on the Scottish Kirk. In 1633, Charles tried to impose his religious policies in Scotland, but faced many hurdles, as the Scots viewed this move as a forceful introduction of Anglicanism to Scotland. Riots erupted, ultimately leading to the first Bishop's War in 1639. The problem? To fight a war, you need funds, which Charles did not have, which meant it was time to call Parliament into session. So he is forced to recall Parliament, and this is the Short Parliament. In 1640, the Short Parliament was convened, but it grew critical of Charles I, leading to its dissolution again within a month. He hasn't got his subsidy, so he hasn't got any extra money to pay for his troops. This move bolstered the Scots, who announced they could govern themselves without the King's consent. Charles realised that he did need Parliament at this point and convened what is termed the Long Parliament. And this is the Parliament that sits throughout the Civil War period. Once again, Charles is subject to considerable criticism by Parliament. They are very much trying to force him to take action, to change what they see as his abuses, um, and in exchange they then may grant him his subsidy. But it continues to spiral out of control and eventually both sides begin raising troops. Of the 493 members of the Commons, over 350 were opposed to the King. In 1640, Parliament tried to impeach the leading councillors of King Charles for high treason and passed the Triennial Act, allowing Parliament to be summoned at least every three years. Grudgingly, Charles granted the Act royal assent. In 1642, 
Charles led a group of soldiers into the House of Commons to arrest five MPs on the grounds of high treason. But they were not there, as they were tipped off and had fled the city. This move by Charles was unprecedented in British history, and to this date, no other monarch has entered the House of Commons since. Charles entering the House of Commons has often been seen as the symbolic beginning of a civil war, because what it was was that there were various elements within the Commons, including Oliver Cromwell and Francis Pym, who were hostile to the King and would not vote him the money that he was asking for. So he, going against set precedent that had existed since the foundation of Parliament, went in to arrest these people himself. And of course, they'd been tipped off by various conspirators who were sympathetic to their aims. And Charles famously said as he walked in to find these people gone, ah, the birds have flown. But the problem with that was that it was very much the sense that it showed Charles's impotence, it showed the way in which Parliament, even as he did something which was catastrophically against any kind of precedent, he didn't even achieve what he wanted to. I mean, if he'd come and executed them on the spot, it would have been a brutal and dreadful thing to have done, but at least it would have shown that he was capable of doing it. But as it was, it just made him look even more pathetic than he already was. As the relationship between the King and Parliament deteriorated, Charles fled London and soon set up court at Oxford. Lines were drawn and the King's army clashed with the Parliaments at Edge Hill in 1642. The battle ended inconclusively and peace talks led to no resolution. The war between the Royalists and the Parliamentarians continued for the next couple of years, becoming known as the First English Civil War. The First Civil War was a war essentially waged between the Royalist side and the Parliament Parliamentarian side over the sovereignty of Parliament and sovereignty of the King. Had the King and the Royalist side won, but it would have reduced Parliament to nothing more than the most basic rump, and it would have made them nothing less than the servile, ob the servile object of the king. It was therefore absolutely crucial to both sides from an existential level that they won. So. When the Civil War begins, um, nobody has it in mind that they want to remove the king or even execute him. That's simply not in anybody's minds. And it's really something that develops over time. For a long time, after Charles has surrendered to the Scots and been placed in the hands of the English Parliament, he is negotiating with the English Parliament, but they find him a very, very difficult person to negotiate with. He doesn't really want to give anything away. Finally, Charles escapes from Hampton Court and flees the Isle of Wight, and he's quickly recaptured, but it's really at this point that the parliamentarians, led at this stage by Oliver Cromwell, start to envisage a future without the king as head of state. Parliament partnered with the Scots, who were against King Charles as well. The two sides created the new model army, led by Oliver Cromwell and Thomas Fairfax. Together, they captured Charles and delivered him to Parliament. Charles was imprisoned and accused of treason against England for using his power for personal interest. The trial of Charles I is one of the most bizarre and yet extraordinary things that ever took place in English history. I mean, a king being put on trial for high treason. And this is hugely controversial and absolutely revolutionary because, of course, treason is a crime of conspiring against the king. So how can the king be guilty of treason? You have to really sort of, you have to change the definition of the crime itself to see treason as being guilty of a crime against the state. So it's very, very revolutionary, very unusual, and it makes a lot of people in Parliament quite uneasy. However, Charles claimed that no court had jurisdiction over him, as his authority as king had been given to him by God himself. At his trial, Charles says, no earthly power can justly call me in question as a delinquent. It wasn't something that was actually looked for, but it, become, it becomes a point where Parliament consider that they can't, they can't do a deal with Charles. And there's a danger, of course, that if you keep the king in place, he will at some point come back and take revenge on you. And again, it was said in Parliament, you know, that if you, if you fight the king 100 times and he loses 99 times, he will still be the king. But if Parliament loses just once, they can face disaster. On January the 26th, 1649, 
Charles was condemned to death, and on January the 30th, he was executed at the Palace of Whitehall, making him the first and only king in British history to be put to death by his subjects. Charles was very, very brave. He, in fact, wore two shirts to his execution because it was a cold day and he was concerned that he would shiver and it would look as though he was fearful. He very much portrayed himself as a martyr and this is how he wanted people to remember him. He had a final meeting with some of his children, for example, before his execution, where you know he really set out his advice for the future, um, told them how to behave. He made a short speech in which he talks about going from a corruptible world into an incorruptible one, but he knelt down on the scaffold and was beheaded. And what happened is that his head was held up and the executioner said, behold, the head of a traitor. And Samuel Pepys, who was present that day, said, I never heard such a great groan amongst, amongst my fellow man as I ever heard that day. Because there was a real sense, not of celebration or of jubilation that he'd been executed, but of fear. What comes now? What's going to happen? What have we done? After the death of Charles I, things in England took a turn. England was declared a republic for the first time, and Oliver Cromwell was appointed Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland in 1653. During this time, Charles II, the eldest surviving son of Charles I, escaped to Europe. Oliver Cromwell didn't set out to get rid of the monarchy or to execute Charles I, but he quickly came to realize that he couldn't negotiate with Charles and that Charles was very much a bar to the godly settlement that he was hoping for. Although he's only the third name to sign Charles's um, death warrant, he is absolutely the man behind the execution of Charles I and the removal of the monarchy. And it's, of course, Cromwell who presides over England's only period without a monarch, the interregnum. A lot of people come up as a traitor, perhaps the most evil man that's ever been in English history, a man dictated by religious extremism that makes him look like a precursor to the Taliban, somebody of absolutely uncompromising, immoral views which were covered by a thin veneer of hypocrisy. Cromwell is not somebody who you can have no, no opinion about. He was a vital figure to English history. He's somebody whose people will always celebrate or condemn, depending on inclination. In Ireland, he is a folk villain. To some people, he is a hero. But who was Oliver Cromwell? That's always going to be a di difficult question to answer. Because what was so interesting is it was a very rule-bound society in which theatres were shut, you could be whipped if you played football on Sundays, there were women were seen, were seen and not heard. It was incredibly restrictive on every kind of lib level of personal liberty imaginable. And Cromwell became increasingly paranoid as the Commonwealth wore on, and it became kind of police state. The post office was turned into a giant intelligence gathering operation. People were watched by their neighbours. You were rewarded if you told the powers that be about these things. And it was a very, very difficult place in which to live. Some people would argue it was brilliant because you didn't have a monarchy. The parliament was all powerful. And it is the only time that England has ever truly embraced republicanism. But I also feel that as it went on, Cromwell acquired more and more of his own monarchical powers. He called himself Lord Protector, and he had himself essentially crowned Lord Protector in a ceremony where he made a big symbolic deal of refusing the crown. But it was said of by at least one observer by the last time he was looking at it, there was a real sense of wanting it. Charles is forced to flee. There are actually many, many legends about him hiding in an oak tree to make his escape. It's a romantic period, but also really the lowest point in Charles II's life. It's the point where he has to abandon his attempt to retake the English throne, and he also loses his newly acquired Scottish crown because the Scots are unable to maintain him as their king. Born on the 29th of May, 1630, Charles II was Henrietta and the king's second child, the first being a son who died within a day of his birth. He was a huge, healthy baby when he was born, although his parents complained that he was very ugly, um, wasn't the cute baby they'd been expecting. He is very, very different to his father in character. 
So actually, when Charles II was on the run at one point, he was known as Black Man because he was so tall and so dark, such a sort of swarthy complexion that he was seen as very, very different to his father, who also had dark hair, but was seen as much more effete and much more of a, of a, of a much more withdrawn figure. And the relationship between the two of them was one of difficulty because Charles II was more headstrong, he was more impetuous, he was somebody who was essentially out for pleasure, whereas his father was more cautious. Ironically enough, he was more puritanical in his personal life. And I think there's the classic thing between the king and his son, that there was an uncertainty as to what he'd be like, except, of course, this was rather overwhelmed as soon as the Civil War came along and then Charles had to prove himself militarily. After his father's death, Charles joined his mother in France who was living under the protection of his cousin, Louis XIV. Here, Charles tried to find aid for the royalist cause so he could return to England and restore the monarchy. But he couldn't find enough support to challenge Cromwell's leadership, and soon France allied with England, forcing Charles to flee the country. He then travelled to The Hague in 1648 to live with his sister Mary and his brother-in-law William II, Prince of Orange, where the Spanish rulers of southern Netherlands agreed to help Charles raise an army. For the future Charles II, his life in exile was very, very difficult um, because, of course, there's no guarantee that he will win the English throne again. It's a very, very difficult period for him, and he's focused on regaining the English throne. But actually, there really is no certainty that he will do this, particularly during Oliver Cromwell's life. Charles' life in, in, in The Hague in the Second Civil War was a difficult one because his primary purpose there was to try and conjure up both money and support. But increasingly he found people were unsympathetic towards his, his father, him and his aims. So what he was essentially being reduced to was begging. It was something that he found personally humiliating because he was somebody who was a proud man, understandably, and he did not like the idea of having to go cap in hand to various European rulers and say, we need money for the English war, especially because it was largely not forthcoming. Finally, he confronted the Commonwealth Army at the Battle of the Dunes in 1658, but he was forced to retreat. That same year, Cromwell was struck by a sudden bout of malarial fever and died, leaving his son Richard to take over as Lord Protector. But with no experience or power base in Parliament and the army, he was forced to resign. Richard Cromwell was not the man that his father had been and certainly didn't command the loyalty of the army as his father had done. His protectorate quickly collapses and amidst this vacuum, the army take control once more and this time they want the king back. And so Charles is invited to return as King of England in 1660. They invited Charles II to become King of England, Scotland and Ireland, but with a few conditions to avoid past mistakes. Charles agreed to be lenient and reached London on May the 29th, 1660, his 30th birthday. The general reaction to Charles's return was jubilation. His arrival was absolutely celebrated. It was seen as a return to normality because the protectorate and the um, period before it was, was a difficult period in England. It was a period of experimental government. The rulers, particularly Oliver Cromwell, weren't necessarily very widely loved. Charles, however, was seen as a return to what had always gone before. He was seen, he was a popular monarch, and people were really, really pleased to have him back. Essentially, a deal was offered to Charles that if he came back and was proclaimed as king, he would have to rule as a constitutional monarch with the understanding of parliament. He was not able to, to carry on his father or his grandfather's extravagances. And, and this is the crucial part, he wasn't allowed to seek revenge for his father's murder. And Charles was quite happy with this, except there was one, it sounds minor, but it was actually rather major distinction. He said, okay, fine, I will come back, I will assume the throne on the basis that you're offering it to me, but the people who are actively responsible for my father's execution, the regicides, they are not going to be exempted from any act of oblivion. They are going to be hunted down, they're going to be killed. As one of his first acts as king, Charles executed 50 of Cromwell's supporters and Cromwell's head was decapitated posthumously. His corpse was dug up, hung, drawn and quartered, and his head 
was put in a prominent place in London. And it's a really macabre, really ghoulish thing to have done. But on the other hand, it was a real sense of a symbolic vengeance being taken years after his death. And I, you can just imagine how Cromwell would have felt about this, that he's laid to rest and a few years later his body was dug up and all these revolting things done to it. And of course, there's a great story that his head was actually lost for a while and is now today the keeping of his old college at Sydney Sussex. The Stuarts were a close family. He loved his father, um, he would revere his father and certainly viewed his father's death as murder. And we can see this in Charles's attempt to track down and execute the regicides, the men who signed his father's death warrant. Charles never forgave the men who were involved in his father's death. He is a very active king, but he also is an absolute monarch. Um, although Parliament has triumphed in the Civil War and has executed his father, when Charles comes back, there are no strings attached, really. So he is able to rule in the same way that his father did before him. So it is quite a troubled period. And I think Charles always does have the shadow of his father's death hanging over him. After King Charles II's coronation, a second parliament was assembled and came to be known as the Cavalier Parliament, as it mainly comprised of royalists and Anglicans. This parliament passed many acts to secure Anglican dominance and a lot of social change accompanies it. Soon, Puritanism lost momentum and Charles overturned many of Cromwell's laws. Charles was known infamously as a great lover of women, but it was during his reign that the playhouses not only reopened, but allowed women to act on stage for the first time. And although you can't see women being allowed to have any kind of proper role in society in terms of writing or in terms of science or anything like that, but certain people such as Margaret Cavendish who were given an opportunity under his reign to be these more eccentric figures and to have a greater say. And so you can see that there was an excitement, there was also a fear, because what's going to happen next? What is going, is the legislation going to last? Can it last? And of course, the fact that Charles hadn't produced an heir was seen as a similar problem as well. As Charles continued his restoration of the monarchy, he faced two of the biggest disasters in British history, both out of his control. These were the Great Plague of London in 1665 and the Great Fire of London in 1666. It kills many, many people. It's actually, and it's, it's one of the sort of first really well-documented periods of plague. And we, of course, have accounts of people being locked up in their houses and then breaking through the walls of their house to try and escape because they've been locked in with people who have the plague. And we have accounts of people trying to flee. We have accounts of villages shutting themselves off from the world when the plague reaches them. So it's a really dark period. Of course, we know that bubonic plague is carried by rats, by the fleas on the rats. But in the, in the 17th century, people had no idea what was causing it. They thought perhaps it was bad air. So we see the plague doctors with their sort of beak-like masks, which were filled with herbs and spices and were intended to stop the bad airs getting in and giving them the plague. The plague killed about 100,000 people in 18 months. As the death rate slowed, the Great Fire started in Pudding Lane, destroying more than 13,000 houses and 87 churches, including St Paul's Cathedral. It burns old St Paul's to the ground. Um, in fact, the fire is so hot that actually the lead on the roof melts and um, sort of creates a treacherous um, molten lead raining down on the streets below. London is a rabbit warren of small streets with overhanging upper floors. Um, the streets are almost tunnel-like. They're also um, they're quite dirty, there's a lot of rubbish, and it's very easy for the fire to quickly jump from house to house. It burns for several days, and in fact, the king himself is observed helping out with the bucket chains, trying to put the fire out with water. Eventually, the fire is stopped by a concerted effort to create fire breaks. So they take the gunpowder from the Tower of London and blow up houses in the path of the fire to create this fire break. Incidentally, the fire brings the Great Plague to an end, um, but it, of course, causes major problems. The city is um, largely destroyed. And in fact, when you walk around the city of London today, you'll see very few buildings older than the 17th century. But it's also seen as an opportunity. 
Although it's an absolute disaster, it does mean that London can be planned on a much more modern street system, so the streets are wider, um, more grid-like in many places. And also very grand monuments can be built, particularly the new St Paul's Cathedral with its great dome, which is designed by Sir Christopher Wren. So it does help London become a more modern city, but a great cost. During his exile in Europe, Charles II was said to have had numerous affairs and fathered many illegitimate children who later became prominent in British society. After he became king, England and Portugal aimed to create an alliance leading to a marriage treaty between King Charles II and Catherine of Braganza. Both countries received support from each other through the treaty, including England's acquisition of Tangier and Bombay. Charles II was known as the Merry Monarch, and there's probably no English king or queen who's been more associated with gaiety, jollity, and mirth. This is, however, a rather one-sided view of his character. He was a man who was also given to great depression, great fear, and great uncertainty. The licentiousness of the Restoration period, which he presided over, should therefore not be seen merely as the explosion of colour and literature and life that people have often seen it as, but also as a determined reaction against the Commonwealth, ruled over by a man whose character was a very complex and very difficult one. The couple were married at Portsmouth in two ceremonies, a secret Catholic and a public Anglican service. But Queen Catherine was unable to produce an heir. All her pregnancies ended in miscarriages and stillbirths. It's a rare example, in fact, where it's clearly the queen who is at fault rather than the king um, in a case of infertility. Catherine cannot have children, and so Charles doesn't have an heir to follow him. Because they had no heir, Charles's heir presumptive was his brother, James, Duke of York. Since James was a Catholic, the public feared that James would overturn the Reformation and revert England to a Catholic nation. To assuage these fears, Charles agreed that James's daughter, Mary II, would marry William III of Orange, who was a Protestant. One of Charles's many interests was science. He had studied physics, chemistry, and mathematics during his exile, and when he returned to England, he was already knowledgeable on many subjects, including naval architecture. He was also a competent chemist. In 1662, he granted a royal charter to a group of scientists who established a formal society to focus on a more academic approach to science. Charles continued to be interested in academia and experimentation well into his old age and supported many causes to advance research. What he would do, I think this is to Charles's credit, is that if somebody had an idea, Charles would give them the space, the time and the money, most importantly, to be able to develop these ideas. And so it was little wonder that during his reign we have everything from Robert Hooke, discovering circulation, we have the first microscopes, we have the beginnings of astronomy, and so we have a real sense that the Royal Society was coming together and actually achieving things in a way that hadn't really been done before or since. As he grew older, he developed painful gout, which restricted his movement. He ultimately resorted to experimenting with alchemy. King Charles II supposedly spent many hours every day trying to distill mercury, but without proper precautions, he regularly inhaled the mercury vapor, which led to his deteriorating health. Well, Charles, by the end of his reign, was, he wasn't an old man, but he was worn out. Like James I, he was a worn out man. He was unhappy. He was unfulfilled. He was somebody who had no clear idea as to what he wanted his, king, his, his reign to be. And actually, the, the best story about him probably is on his deathbed, where he's dying in agony. He's taking days about it. And as his physicians and his court are all about him, he says, I must apologize, gentlemen, for being so long in dying. I think that you can see even at the end of his life, there's still that wit, there's still that individuality that made people like him. But you do also see the fact that he was this, he was this diminished figure. He was somebody whose reign began with such excitement and such vitality that it ended with a sad old man dying before his time, you know, surrounded by people who didn't like him very much. 
Charles tried many techniques to cure himself, including bloodletting, purging, and cupping. But he died of a sudden apoplectic fit on February the 2nd, 1685, at 54. It's hard to dislike Charles II. He did things for his country and for society that we still celebrate today. I mean, it was him who gave patronage to Christopher Wren, for instance, for handing me the Charles II who wouldn't have St Paul's Cathedral. He was somebody who brought about artistic and scientific innovations in a great way. In many respects, he carried on his father's legacy in terms of his interest in culture and the arts. We have the idea of his being a licentious monarch, a merry monarch, and there's countless stories, some of which are true, some of which are untrue, about his seducing everyone from the great ladies of court to then, of course, were very influential to, to parliaments. But we can also see that Britain became, a, a, in many respects, a, a rather conflicted country during the Restoration because its international standing did not strengthen. Financially, it was in a dire position, and there was no sense that Charles was really this dynamic, exciting figure that he promised to be. Interestingly, there was another Charles III in British history, but he never became king. After Charles II died, his brother, James, became king, but he was soon exiled, leaving his eldest daughter Mary and her husband William to become co-monarchs. Mary's brother, James III, was raised in continental Europe, but he believed that he was the rightful heir to the throne as he was part of the Stuart dynasty. His son, Charles III, continued his father's efforts to restore the monarchy in their name and even led an invasion of England, but he was defeated. Charles continued living in Europe and left no heirs. While he proclaimed himself the King of England, he was never recognized by the French and Spanish monarchy and was called the Young Pretender and Bonnie Prince Charlie. His reputation was damaged due to his alcoholism and separation from his wife over allegations of physical abuse. Charles III became increasingly isolated and led a fairly unhappy life. He died in Rome at the age of 67 in 1788, the same day as the execution of his great-grandfather, 139 years before. As the world welcomes a new monarch, King Charles III's reign will oversee a completely different society. Born in 1948, King Charles is said to have had a lonely childhood, as his parents were often too busy with their royal duties, an endless round of royal engagements, official visits and tours across the globe. Well, Queen Elizabeth was a very dutiful mother, and she became queen age 25. You know, Prince Charles was, I think, he was four, nearly, and, and Princess Anne was only, well, she was born in 1950, and she was only th just three when the Queen was crowned. So, basically, her children were taken away from her. She just didn't have time to be with them. So she would see them in the morning, you know, for 15 minutes, and she would see them at night for half an hour. But, again, you have to judge it by the moors of the time. That was how aristocratic families worked. So there's a real sense, I think, from, from the outset that Prince Charles was always being treated in a certain way. I think this, if not estranged him from his parents, I think it gave him a very different kind of expectation to what it would be like for him to be a royal child. After finishing school, Charles decided to go against royal tradition and study at Cambridge University instead of joining the armed forces. He was somebody who was quite unlike Prince Philip, who was a much more boisterous character. He was unlike his mother as well. Who, from, his mother was somebody who was very serious from a very young age, and Charles, I think, inherited this seriousness. But what he had, which she didn't have, was a real interest in learning and a real interest in books and things like that. At the age of 20, he was formally invested with the title of the Prince of Wales, signifying the launch of Charles as a more active figure in the royal family. After completing his degree, Charles joined the army and carefully carved out his role as heir apparent. With a strong sense of duty and responsibility, it is clear Charles has not just been waiting for his next job. In the fiscal year 2021-22 alone, he undertook over 350 engagements 
and has been one of the most visible members of the royal family. Charles has also had a highly accomplished diplomatic career, having visited 44 Commonwealth countries and over 100 countries worldwide. It must be a truly awful experience from a very, very young age to know that you are going to have to become king because I think just about every single member of the royal family who has been monarch has never said it's a privilege. They've always said it's, it's a duty and it's a duty that you have to live up to because there's such impossibly high pressure. And to take this for a young child must be an absolutely overwhelming idea because Charles was somebody who was sensitive, he was not necessarily the most outgoing of people. And to be told from a very, very young age by your parents, this is what you're going to do, this is the destiny that you've been born into, you have no choice or agency in the matter, it must have been absolutely terrifying. But his coronation comes at a time when the image of the monarchy has changed, and so have the expectations. While the first and second kings, Charles, fought for their political ideologies, the modern-day royal family is apolitical. But Charles has famously gone against this policy, having often written letters to politicians and ministers, suggesting policy changes and proposing amendments. Charles is somebody who has been politically active for most of his life, and although he hasn't been a party political figure, he sent these notorious things called the Black Spider Memos, so-called because his handwriting on them was like an angry black spider crawling in ink. And what he's done throughout his life is he's written to, to governments, successive Labour and Conservative governments, and said, I don't think X is right, I don't believe in Y. And certainly, I mean, he was present for the, to the Hong Kong handover to, to China in 1997. And it's become quite clear that he wasn't very happy about that and he felt it shouldn't have taken place. And there have been many examples of where his political beliefs have, because obviously he can't vote in an election, he has no conventional means of influencing any government. What he can do is go to, right to the top of it and he can say to the Prime Minister or the Home Secretary or the Foreign Secretary or whoever else, I don't believe in this, I want something to be done about it. And of course, we have an interventionist Prince of Wales, it's quite a frightening one, because you think to yourself, well, he's not been elected by anyone, why should he have any say in what's going on in the country when we've actually elected this government? So on the one hand, a lot of people might just wish he'd shut up and stay out of these things, which of course, as King, he has now said he will, whether he will or not, we don't know. But on the other hand, most of the causes that he has espoused have been quite rational ones. I mean, if you look at the things that he's argued for, most of them you think, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, that's sensible. So I think it's fair to say that his heart is in the right place, even if his methods can be quite blunt. Charles has grown up in the public eye, and his life has not been without controversies. For the first few years, it seemed this royal honeymoon would never end. But behind the scenes, it was all very different. The admission made the front pages and prompted this question. This was emphasised when details of an intimate phone conversation between them, the so-called Camilla Gate tape, leaked out. Throughout her marriage, the Princess of Wales suspected that her husband never really renounced his attachment to his great friend. In the latest extract from Jonathan Dimbleby's biography, in today's Sunday Times, it's claimed that he's had three separate affairs with Camilla Parker Bowles. It's a disclosure which has apparently left the princess numbed and devastated. The book is also seen as an unprecedented attack on Prince Philip, who's portrayed as a bully and is reported to have given Prince Charles an ultimatum to marry Diana or break off his relationship to the then 19-year-old. Many believe that this latest book of revelations is by far the most damaging, as it further destroys the already badly tarnished mystique of royalty. It also makes virtually impossible the notion of Prince Charles and Diana jointly ascending the throne together. Most of the coverage centred on Diana's revelations, especially her admission of adultery, and then moved to the British public's reaction. But shortly after this visit to Korea, he decided to initiate the separation from his wife. The Princess of Wales has agreed to Prince Charles's request for a divorce. A spokeswoman for the Princess said that Diana will continue to be involved in all decisions relating to the couple's children and she will continue to live at Kensington Palace. Your Royal Highness, can you still be king following your confession? I think that Charles was popular up to a point as Prince of Wales, and I think this popularity was always something that was a constant for him as Prince of Wales. I mean, he was the longest serving Prince of Wales has ever been. And I think that if you look at his popularity, I mean, of course, it ebbed and flowed depending on what was happening in the wider world. 
He was never an unpopular figure, although I think the times with Diana, he came close to it. But he was never as popular as his mother either. And I think that rankled. I think that he always knew that following on from somebody as universally beloved as Queen Elizabeth II meant that he would never be able, truly, to be his own person. His ascension to the throne will determine how he plans to shape the royal household to manage current public expectations. Many are also questioning the relevance of a constitutional monarchy in the 21st century. In 2020 to 2021, the royal family was paid about £86 million by the UK government, an amount that has been criticised by members of parliament, especially as Britain struggles with the cost of living crisis, rising inflation and a global climate emergency. I think what we're now seeing with monarchy is a slimmed down monarchy. There'll be a lot of emphasis on value for money in terms of giving taxpayers what they want in terms of, of, of monarchy actually serving a, a public purpose. And I think Charles will be at the head of that because he knows that when he hands over the throne to William, he has to leave it in a good state. He has to leave it in a position that people actually still believe in the monarchy because we don't have a strong Republican movement in Britain. We have always accepted that monarchy exists. We haven't been trying to get rid of it. But King Charles knows that it's always delicate. If there ever was to be an upsurge in Republican sentiment and you are the last king of Great Britain, that's on you, that's your responsibility. Nobody wants to go down with that. The new king will have to plan a roadmap to modernize the monarchy, to adapt to changing times. But despite all these challenges, Charles is expected to serve the country with the same strength and stability that the royal family has symbolized for the last four centuries. The third Carolean era awaits. Doing a job like this is worthwhile, valuable, um, and to me, there's an element of duty about it. Some of my earliest memories relate to times that my parents spoke to me, um, or even better, showed me what it meant to have both privilege and responsibilities. Charles sort of set out almost what everybody's role would be, and he named that William and Catherine would be the new Prince and Princess of Wales. I think he will be very much a king who knows his own mind. William is a very determined man. I think he takes the role very seriously. I think he believes in monarchy. At the moment, they are the golden couple. The royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol, but actually in William and Kate, you see a future king and queen who are driving it forward and taking it on to the next step. It goes on and on and on, doesn't it? There's <laughs> queues of people. Right? This family has service sort of, you know, running through them. William has got it, his father's got it, his grandmother's got it. But I think he's also very much, much more a man of the modern age and of the people. He will be very much more modern uh, than, than his grandmother or, or his father. And I think he'll be much more the people's king. To me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said a lot of times before, mollycoddled or treated any different. Every day you come in to work and you don't quite know what's going to happen. It's quite exciting in that sense. It's unpredictable. 
I think as a future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was get, you get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. And that was the point at which I think William went from being a young man to a future king. Following the death of his dearest and most revered grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II, Prince William's father, now Charles III, ascended to the throne, and Prince William took the title of Prince of Wales. His Royal Highness, Prince William, is now second in line to the throne, but he has his work cut out, following in his father's footsteps and keeping up the tradition of duty and hard work. His destiny is to inherit the crown and succeed to the throne but how does a prince prepare to become king? Crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace throughout the evening. Then at 10.25, their patience was rewarded with the formal notice of the birth. It was signed by Mr. George Pinker, the Queen's gynecologist, and other doctors who attended the princess. Prince William, now Prince of Wales, first-born son of King Charles III and Diana, Princess of Wales, has always been in the spotlight. Born second in line to the throne, he was destined for a life of duty and of service. The fact that Diana produced a little boy, an heir, um, I think just further endeared her to the British public. People loved her even more. And when she came out holding Prince William with Prince Charles, images that really just melted, I think, even the most hardened hearts around the country. And uh, it, was, it was a cause for great celebration. Um, Britain had come through a difficult time, and I think the royal family were giving the country something to look forward to. The skies were clear this morning as the Royal Australian Air Force jet made its approach. Prince and Princess emerged showing no sign of the long flight and obviously well educated in the right sort of clothes to wear in Central Australia. And then the moment more than a hundred reporters and cameramen flew from all over the world to see the public debut of nine month old Prince William, second in line to the throne. Of course, for Prince William, he would have been able to understand little of what was going on around him at the time, as his nanny carried him carefully down the steps of the aircraft onto Australian soil. Diana's decision to take her baby, Prince William, with her on their tour of Australia and New Zealand in 1983 was criticised in some corners of the media, but it was a turning point for Diana and the catalyst for her to grow in popularity with the public. Later, to protect the young princes, William and Harry, from the excesses of the press and paparazzi, the royal family came to an agreement with the media that the boys would be free from press intrusion whilst they were being educated. And in exchange, the family undertook to give regular updates to the mainstream media. Exactly on time, the family emerged from the house, one prince carrying another. Everyone agreed that Prince William had grown a lot in the five weeks since he arrived in Australia at Alice Springs. The princess, wisely hedging her bets a little, had told us she would not guarantee that the 10-month-old prince would crawl. So what did Prince William do immediately? William had a, a fairly traditional aristocratic childhood in as much as he was taken care of by nannies. His parents were, were, you know, Diana particularly was a modern parent, but she was a modern aristocratic parent and she did use nannies and the nannies really were the people that William spent most of his time with. He had been a very outgoing little boy. He, at his first school, he was known as Basher, Basher Wills or Basher Wales, because um, he was, you know, quite stroppy and confident. After his early years at Ludgrove School, the young Prince William entered the gates of Eton College, where he fitted in easily to its centuries-old traditions and where he found like-minded people. For their eldest son's big day, the Princess of Wales was in the driving seat. With the Prince of Wales at her side, Eton's most famous new boy was with his younger brother Harry in the back. 
William's education was at Eton College. Eton College is probably the leading public school in England, and it's very traditional. Uh, William's mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, insisted that he went to Eton, as did her father and her younger brother, Charles. Prince Charles acceded to this. Uh, he went to Gordonston, where he was thoroughly miserable and cried almost every time he had to go back to, to school, even as a teenager. And he allowed his sons both to go to a very elitist school. It's very elite, it's very expensive, it's very posh, if you will, but it also has a degree of freedom for the, for the pupils. They are encouraged to be self-confident and to find themselves. And when William came there after being at Ludgrove, the prep school, people realized as he had to sign in, every pupil signs into the, uh, the book when they come, that he was left-handed. First time people realized it, he was a Southpaw. William threw himself enthusiastically into school life. But if there was one area in which he really excelled, it would be sport, an arena in which he continues to devote his energies to this day, seeming to naturally embrace all the principles of sportsmanship and teamwork which make it so important in our lives. Unfortunately, although William enjoyed his time at Eton, it was of course blighted by the tragic death of his mother. Charles. Charles. Shut up. Charles. Thank you so much. Thank you. How are you? William. William. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, God. Thank you very much. Thank you. William. William, we love you. You know, how does any 15 year old and 12 year old cope with that? Um, uh, uh, it was devastating for them, obviously. On the day of the funeral, William and Harry walked behind the cortege. Um, it was a long walk, and the, the, there were crowds sobbing and, and wailing, and um, hundreds, thousands and thousands of people lining the route. Uh, and they walked with their father, uh, their grandfather and Charles Spencer. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. William and Harry, we all care desperately for you today. We're all chewed up with sadness at the loss of a woman who wasn't even our mother. How great your suffering is, we cannot even imagine. Above all, we give thanks for the life of a woman. I'm so proud to be able to call my sister. The unique, the complex, the extraordinary and irreplaceable Diana, whose beauty, both internal and external, will never be extinguished 
from our minds. After graduating from Eton, like many young men of his generation, Prince William decided on a gap year. Now he's off to the plains of Patagonia for a 10-week expedition. I wanted to do something constructive um, in my gap year rather than, um, I mean, uh, I could do quite a lot of work, but I thought this was a, a bit more of a way of um, making, uh, trying to help people out and uh, meet a whole range of other different people from um, different countries and at the same time uh, helping people um, in remote areas of Chile. I think we're very much seeing a royal for the new century. Very relaxed, not stage managed, um, happy to josh a bit uh, with his father in an informal way, but not scared to say exactly what he's feeling and uh, certainly not prepared to dodge the difficult issues. The clearest example of that, his challenge to the press today to let his mother rest in peace. Through his early voluntary work with Rally International, the young prince set off for Chile, where he spent three months working on various community projects, painting, chopping wood, and even cleaning the loos just like everybody else. There was no question in any of the gap here, actually, that he was a prince and treated differently. He mucked in, he slept in sleeping bags, you know, he... he cooked food around a campfire. He did everything that everyone else did. A few weeks later, a young Kate Middleton also undertook a similar voluntary role, and on that occasion, they just missed each other. Prince William loves Scotland, and it didn't take him long to decide to continue his education at the University of St Andrews. He did well enough to get not a place at Oxbridge, which could have been fixed for him, there was speculation that he would go to Trinity College, Cambridge, as his father did. But he was sufficient of his own man to say, no, I want to go to Scotland, I like Scotland. He chose St Andrews University, a very ancient university in the Kingdom of Fife. And so, by chance, did Kate Middleton. And that, of course, where they were both first-year students, freshers, that's where they met. It was at St Andrews where that friendship, because it was initially a friendship, flourished. Um, William and Kate were at the same halls of residence at St Salvador's. They were on the same course in the same year. I mean, some people say, wasn't that just too much of a coincidence? Um, but it was how things worked out. And they spent the first year as undergraduates really getting to know each other. William was not particularly happy in his course. They were both doing history of art. And uh, Kate was, was really great, actually, at trying to keep him focused, keep him incentivized, and actually stop him from leaving St Andrews, which was at one point what he wanted to do. Um, he didn't leave, he switched course, and they spent the next four years living together and falling in love. The people of St Andrews are a very close-knit sort of society, and they welcomed William with open arms, and they were very protective of him. And as a result, you know, he he spent life, he spent four years there as a pretty normal student. I think the wonderful thing about St Andrews was it was a bubble away from reality. It was, it was a life that Prince William had never been able to enjoy, whether it was going to the local shops, going to a local bar, going for his morning swim. He could get on with his life and his relationship in private. At all times, they were highly discreet. They were almost never seen together. They were, even with their friends, they didn't allow any gossip to start. People speculated, but there was nothing uh, definite which proved that they were an item. And I think the pair of them absolutely loved those years. They look upon those St Andrews years with, with great fondness, and uh, they are patrons of St Andrews University because they feel such a strong connection to that place. In his own words, it is time now for the big wide world. But today, William's family, like any other, well, almost, came to say a proud farewell to a place that has allowed him a more normal life than any royal in history. That he is deeply grateful is not in doubt. And partly, of course, it's been about this woman.
They've been allowed to develop a relationship without front page scrutiny, and it's helped. Catherine Middleton. Romance did not stand in the way of hard work, and Prince William graduated alongside Kate with a Scottish Master of Arts degree with upper second class honours. Of course, no graduation would be complete without family to proudly celebrate academic achievement, but there are not many who can include the Queen in their university graduation. William Wales. The British royal family have served the armed forces for generations. It's a useful place, really, for them to be, because, certainly in modern times, because they are away from the prying eyes of the, of the public and the press, the media. It's a useful service. You know, they, um, they, get, to, uh, they get to experience danger and they get to be part of a team, and it's great for leadership and for mixing with people from all walks of life, which is something that when they're growing up, historically, they didn't really do so much. The reason it's important for members of the royal family to serve in the military is because one day, as um, Prince of Wales, it's felt that it's extremely important that if you are going to be head of the military, that in some way you would have served. The Queen, in fact, did serve um, with, uh, during World War II um, with the Women's Corps. Elizabeth is in the ATS, or British WAC, and at the King's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Queen Elizabeth herself had an active role during World War II and was the first female member of the royal family to serve in a full-time military role. She diagnosed and repaired faulty engines, serving in the ATS. William's grandfather, Prince Philip, served with distinction in World War II and was awarded the Greek War Cross of Valour. Rising through the ranks, the young Prince Philip became one of the youngest officers in the Royal Navy to be promoted to first lieutenant. Prince William's father served in the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. Qualifying as a helicopter pilot in 1974, and joining the 845 Naval Air Squadron, operating from the commando carrier HMS Hermes. In February 1976, Prince Charles was promoted to command, and he took control of HMS Bronington, a coastal mine hunter, for his last nine months in the Royal Navy. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment to each one. I think it gives one a a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people, and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Both William and Harry were keen to follow the example of their family and take an active role in the military. After passing the selection process to become an army officer, Prince William took his place at Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy, from which thousands of successful army careers have been launched. Sandhurst used to be filled, I think, with rather dim-witted sons of the aristocracy. Um, today, it is really a, a, you know, a very serious academy. It's a very tough course and f hugely physical. You, you pass quite serious exams, academic exams, to get into Sandhurst. And, and then once you're there, the regime is, is pretty um, remorseless. William got through it. The cadets at Sandhurst are divided into companies, or divisions as they're called. The senior division always has the honor of carrying the color, a banner personally given by the sovereign. And as the senior cadets complete their training, so the color is passed on. 
the Academy RSM receives the colour and carries it to the new senior division of the next year. William clearly learnt how to march in step here at Sandhurst. By all accounts, he was a natural soldier, considered to be amongst the best in his year. The 44-week training course is gruelling, and it's reported that William found enormous strength during this period and made friends who remain close and loyal to this day. Next year sees the 60th anniversary of the formation of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst the spiritual home of the officer corps of the British Army. And the high standards which it continues to demand of its cadets have been exemplified by your impressive drill and turnout today. The Academy's principal aim is to develop the qualities of leadership, character and intellect demanded of an army officer on first appointment. I place that trust in you with confidence. And my prayers for your success and safety will follow you wherever you may be called upon to serve. Graduating with the rank of Lieutenant Wales, William followed his younger brother into the Blues and Royals as a troop commander, which meant a further five months training at Bovington Camp in Dorset. Harry had been to Sandhurst ahead of William because he didn't do, uh, he didn't go to university. And he had joined the Blues and Royals regiment. Um, William, when he, when he graduated from Sandhurst, when he passed out, he also joined the Blues and Royals. But because of the way that um, the regiments uh, rotated, in their deployments, it was quite clear that William was not actually going to make it to Afghanistan. His regiment wouldn't go there um, for 18 months. And rather than sit around um, kicking his heels, doing training work in, in this country, he decided to go and look at the other forces. Prince William moved to the Royal Air Force, and in 2008, he completed a 12-week intensive flying training course at RAF College Cranwell. Prince William will arrive here January 2008, and he'll be attached to the Royal Air Force for four months, and during that time, there'll be some flying training, and he'll also then go on to operational squadrons to see how the operational side of the Royal Air Force operates. I think everybody's very excited. I know Prince William's keen to come here and learn to fly, and uh, the instructors who've been chosen to teach him are looking forward to it as well. This is the Grob Tutor. It's the RAF's elementary flying training aircraft. All our pilots come into this at the first stage of their training, as soon as they finish officer training. Uh, so the course mates for Flying Officer Wales will be doing exactly the same training as him at this stage. Um, it's fairly docile to fly. It's something you could find similar to at a flying club, but it's also fully aerobatic, so it's quite a capable aircraft, and we can up the pace quite quickly, which is what we do on our training course. This is uh, a Takano uh, T Mark I trainer. It's the basic fast jet trainer for the Royal Air Force and Prince William is going to be uh, coming to us from his tutor flying to expand his flying skills, give him some more complicated and advanced techniques uh, and then progress him onto the squirrel phase of his course prior to the award of wings. It's going to be a very exciting uh, period. It's a privilege to train Prince William. Uh, with regard to how he'll be treated, he's going to be treated the same as all the rest of our students and, and all the uh, junior officers that we work with. And the Air Force is known as the Squirrel, and ours is specifically the AS350BB, which is unique to the Air Force only in pure terms of what the aircraft has on, to, has on it in terms of equipment. Uh, we use it for basic military training for all Army, Navy and Air Force rotary students in the UK. So the Prince will fly both the Tutor and the Takano before coming to Shawbury to fly the Squirrel. It's a, it's a huge honour for, for all involved and uh, we, we have uh, had royal visitors in the past and Cranwell especially um, with its association with uh, Prince Charles and his flying training, everyone is very much, very much looking forward to it. He's not just another recruit but we are trying to make him uh, as, fit in as much as he can and certainly that's what happened with the army. Um, so he'll be treated the same as anybody else, he'll wear the same uniform uh, and those associated with him would call him as they would any other junior officer in the same rank. How's life in the RAF? Very good. Enjoying it very much. Is it very um, different from the Army? Um, in certain ways, yeah. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's still the same sort of, um, sort of camaraderie and everyone getting along really well. Now, I understand you flew your first solo flight yesterday. 
I did, yeah. How did it go? Um, well, I'm still here to tell the tale, and I haven't been billed for a plane, so, so far it looks all right. But um, it was one of those experiences where I thought it'll never come around. And I thought, you know, hopefully a bit longer yet, I'll get back with practice. And the next thing I know, when Struts jumps out and goes, go on, get on with it. And I was left there sort of looking around the room and going, uh, what? So uh, I just did it, and once you get up in the air, it was fine. It wasn't so bad. His father had loved flying, his grandfather had loved flying. Um, it was very much in the blood, I think. And he, and his brother, of course, Harry, loved flying. So the two brothers became helicopter pilots in the end. Once again, proud parents were able to play an active role on graduation day. So he was presenting William with his wings. I mean, it must, he must have felt hugely proud, but also um, a, a, a sort of bittersweet moment for Charles because he himself wasn't able to carry on with his flying career because it was thought too dangerous for the heir to the throne. Flying officer William Wales, graduating with number 227 and number 97 horses. After serving in both the Army and the Royal Air Force, William was then seconded to train with the Navy, spending three weeks at the Britannia Royal Navy College in Dartmouth. So having learnt to, to fly an aeroplane, um, he then went to, do, to explore the Navy, to get a taste of the Navy. And he went out to the Caribbean um, on a, a drug policing um, vessel. And during his time there, um, he did, he was part of a crew that busted a huge, huge drugs haul worth millions of pounds. Um, so he, he experienced quite a lot of excitement um, and probably quite a lot of danger, actually. William extended his Royal Naval Short Service Commission for as long as possible, and it's reported that he greatly enjoyed his time in the senior service. But he was called back to the Royal Air Force and promoted to flight lieutenant, taking up training to become a helicopter pilot in the RAF Search and Rescue Service. He was not going into a, a, a battlefield. Nobody knew who he was up in, an, in a helicopter, and yet it was very real and meaningful work. To me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said a lot of times before, molly cuddled or treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, in my eyes, if Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. And I think as a future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was get, you get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. I and mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And the search and rescue role is now, you know, slightly different. So obviously being able to go to Afghanistan, but it's still doing it. Important job, and I hope that it's yeah. I hope it's just in the right direction exactly for the future. The training is demanding and includes advanced handling, night flying, emergency handling, and tactical and formation flying on the Griffin HT1 helicopter. William Wales, Flight Lieutenant William Wales, is posted to the Operational Conversion Unit, 203 Squadron, Royal Air Force Valley, to fly the Sea King. Flight Lieutenant Wales graduated in January 2010 from the Defence Helicopter Flying School at RAF Shawbury. <laughs> Prince William then transferred to RAF Valley at Anglesey, becoming the first member of the royal family since Henry VII to live in Wales. For the next eight months, he trained on the Sea King helicopter and was assigned to Sea Flight Number 22 Squadron as a co-pilot. Well, before I started Search and Rescue, I had a little brief uh, introduction to it, and it was immediate to me. Um, I spent three hours flying with the guys, and it was totally apparent to me straight away how important the job is, and the skills the guys employ, um, the flying aspects, the, the general airmanship you need to, to have around you, and all the wits you need to survive the weather and whatever sort of situation you're thrown into. Um, it definitely is advanced flying and it's rewarding. So it put the two together and it's a fantastic job. 
It's rewarding because every day you come in to work and you don't quite know what's going to happen. It's quite exciting in that sense, it's unpredictable. But at the same time, it's great that you get to go out and actually save someone's life, hopefully, or at least make a difference to someone. You know, when you know that they're in trouble, you do everything you can to try and get there. And the guys demonstrate that every single day they go out. And with the team environment there is in the cockpit, um, it's very much sort of big family in the sky, and, and the guys do a fantastic job. We've got 11 pilots here. William's a fairly new co-pilot, but as such, he, he, he flies the aircraft as much as anyone else, and he'll be called on, upon quite regularly during jobs to take control of the aircraft uh, while the captain's doing something else. Um, uh, regarding the hierarchy, we're all pretty much uh, we're all e of equal rank, um, just with different varying levels of experience, So, and we all get on very, very well together, have a joke and a laugh when we're, we're on the ground and, and get serious when we're flying. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, when William first arrived on the squadron, it was a massive shock to all of us. Fairly dumbfounded, really, uh, that somebody with such a prestige was coming onto our squadron. But very quickly settled into just one of the guys, um, one of us, part of the family, certainly. Um, and day to day, you, you don't even really notice. I suppose in 10, 15 years' time, when we look back on this occasion, it'll seem very, very special and memorable. Um, but he's, he's a great guy to work with. When you're flying along at night in Snowdonia and in the mountains, and you've got 40 knot winds the clouds down to about 200 feet and you're trying to get through to find someone who's either broken a leg or is lost on the hill. Um, it gets quite interesting, you have to use all four of you, put your brain power together and your skill and basically hope that you know you can actually get there and help. There was a, a key moment in his life. It was in 2011, there had been a huge, devastating earthquake in New Zealand. And William said to his private secretary, is anyone from the royal family going down to New Zealand? Because if they're not, I would like to go and, and you know, represent the Queen and, and express our sorrow at what's happened. And his private secretary said, you can't possibly do this. You know, you haven't got time. How are you going to work out? You know, you've got this, these number of shifts you've got to do with, the, with search and rescue. He said, it's all right, I've sorted all of that. Just find out whether, whether I can go, whether anyone else is going. So he did, and he went. And he stood side by side with people who'd lost loved ones, homes, businesses. You know, the, the scenes there were absolutely devastating. My grandmother once said that grief is the price we pay for love. Here today, we love and we grieve. And that was the point at which I think William went from being a young man to a future king. Family life beckoned and during his time at RAF Valley, it was announced that Prince William and Kate Middleton were to marry. Flying himself into the land his family have worked for generations, Ian Craig's plane touches down in Lewa, the romantic hideaway Prince William chose to make his proposal. Did you serene? Yeah. There and then? I did, yeah. I'd been carrying it around with me in my rucksack for about three weeks before that, and uh, I literally would not let it go. Everywhere I went, I was keeping hold of it, because I knew this thing, if it disappeared, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and, yeah, because I planned it, it sort of, it went fine, as, you know, you'll hear a lot of horror stories about proposing and things go horribly wrong. It went really, really well, and, uh, yeah, I was really pleased that she said yes. I think it was very telling that he chose to give Kate Middleton his mother's engagement ring, and he said, I want my mother to be part of this, to be present. Not in a sinister way, of course not, not the ghost at the feast, but there to enjoy the celebrations and the fun of it all, uh, of a great occasion. And I think people are very well aware of the background, and they certainly have a great deal of um, uh, sympathy, and uh, they're almost willing them to be happy because he particularly has had difficulties in his life. On the 29th of April 2011, Prince William and Kate Middleton married in Westminster Abbey. The nation took Kate to their hearts and she has been by his side ever since. This was very much a, a, a wedding. Their 
personal wedding. Okay, it was very, very public. Obviously, it was televised and, and the world was watching, but it was essentially um, their private wedding, and that's how they kind of treated it. Um, and it, it was very touching, and, and uh, Kate looked absolutely stunning. It was a cause for big celebration. Crowds gathered from far away to take part in the day. After all, Kate would one day become Queen Consort. Like many young newlyweds in the services, duty called and Flight Lieutenant Wales was deployed to the Falkland Islands, becoming part of a four-man crew providing cover for aviation assets and assisting those in need of rescue. Search and rescue pilots here provide 24-hour coverage um, with a seeking helicopter. They're on duty for a 24-hour period um, and covering any eventuality. Um, as you've seen, the, the distances here are quite large. The roads are not fantastic. And if we need to get somebody military or civilian to hospital, um, quite often search and rescue helicopters are the best way of doing it. The deployment was seen as particularly controversial as it came close to the 30th anniversary of the start of the Falklands War. The Argentinians felt that this was a slap in the face to them for Prince William to be marching about in uniform humiliating the Argentinians on what they still believe is their territory. Balancing home and family life with a career can be difficult. Kate gave birth of their first child, Prince George, in July 2013. The media camped out in excitement to catch a glimpse of the future king. Kate and William greeted the press and introduced Prince George to the world. After this, Flight Lieutenant William Wales took the decision to retire from active service in the Royal Air Force in September 2013. William, I think, that time, those years, as a search and rescue pilot, he really felt that he did achieve something. It was a real job. There were no concessions for who he was. He wasn't wrapped up in cotton wool. But the time came where, he, where the tour of duty came to an end. And I think he left probably with quite a heavy heart. But he'd had a very, very good time there. Um, and I think... You know, he'd, he'd absolutely achieved what he set out to achieve. During his time at RAF Valley, Prince William undertook 156 search and rescue missions, where 149 people were rescued. Whilst in the Royal Air Force, he completed over 1,300 flying hours. It's not often he gets to meet the people whose lives he saved. Sharon West got the opportunity to meet the Prince and to personally thank him for saving her life. Hello. I just want to say thank you for rescuing me no, last year. Was it, was it you? Yeah. Was it from the beach in Arnold's yeah. Langer? Yeah. Was it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Was it your Cameron. sister? Yeah. Yeah. How are you? You're right. I'm okay. I'm glad you made a full recovery. A lot, a lot of time you never see who you never meet up with anyone after you've done it. So we made it's a point of coming here today because yeah. we felt you're so good. All uh, right. Say so thanks to you and the no, guys. No, no, no. The guys. The team. It's the whole team. It's all yeah, crew. It's, it's crew thing. Retirement from active service did not deter the future king from looking to the skies to fulfill his career ambitions and to continue the spirit of service to others. In 2014, it was announced that William would accept full-time employment as a pilot with the East Anglian Air Ambulance, based at Cambridge Airport. Kate and William had another exciting announcement. They would be having their second child. In May 2015, Kate gave birth to Princess Charlotte, who would be fourth in line to the succession of the throne. 
he made the decision and it was a, quite a surprise when he announced he wanted to get back into the cockpit because remember he'd left the RAF we all thought his um, flying days were behind him and actually we'd see the Duke of Cambridge embark on a life of official public duty well that hasn't happened um, he's gone back into the cockpit albeit in a different capacity he's flying now with the air ambulance service it's a charity um, but it's still a full-time and demanding job it also means he can have a career aside from the royal family and it's in a perfect arena of course because he's going out and helping to save lives um, so it ticks all of those boxes equally I think because he can base himself further up north and away from Kensington Palace which he considers a bit of a goldfish bowl he can enjoy this idyllic life helping to bring up the children at least in the next few years while they're still very young. He took up his full-time role in July 2015, that any salary paid to him would be donated to charity. Well, first of all, I'm just fantastically excited to be here today, the first day. It's been a long time coming. It's been many exams and, and training to get here. Um, and I'm hugely excited to be joining a very uh, professional bunch of guys and girls um, doing a sort of unique, complex job uh, with the Air Ambulance. And it's, it's sort of a follow-on from where I was with the military with Search and Rescue. So many of the same sorts of skills and, and in, in essence the similar type of job it just follows on from Search and Rescue to here. So it was a natural, natural progression. But equally, uh, doing a job like this is worthwhile, valuable, um, and to me, there's an element of duty about it. I'm really quite keen to, to be involved with the guys and the girls doing um, a complex, you know, professional job. For the next two years, Prince William worked on the front line as an emergency worker, sometimes witnessing intense trauma and with a real hands-on approach to helping his medically qualified colleagues. There is little doubt that this would have had a significant impact on his mental health and personal life. I think nothing ever prepares you that well for what you're going to see and some of the, some of the incidences. But uh, having done Search and Rescue before, we saw a lot of that already. And when you're working with a team, um, you, you, know, you help each other out and you talk about it and uh, you, you get through it that way. And so it's very important to talk about it. William said to a friend recently that, that his priorities were family and flying in that order. And uh, I think the emphasis on those two Fs, family and flying, is exactly where it is for both of them. He's friendly, he's funny, um, he's, you know, always sort of joking and bantering, particularly with, with other men and with colleagues. And I think that was how he managed to be accepted so readily um, by, by colleagues both in the armed forces and, and in the air ambulance. He just, and in, in all the charities that he works for as well, they really love him. Prince William's interest in air ambulance services remains to this day. And after supporting an anniversary for London's air ambulance charity in 2019, he became the official patron in March 2020. It was time to move closer to home. And in July 2017, Prince William left his position as an air ambulance pilot to take up full-time role duties on behalf of Queen Elizabeth. Prince William has made a fantastic contribution to the team. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have him on board. Um, he's a hard-working member of the team, always keen to get his hands dirty and help out, uh, whether it is just cleaning the aircraft or actually at scene, helping out with patients that are critically ill. He's a really valuable member of the team. I think the, 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 over, the, the, the big memory I'll have will be the, the day he arrived, really. Um, the very first day he arrived, you're supposed to call him for just 10 minutes, and he ended up staying for about four hours, um, which is a good sign that he was comfortable amongst the team. Yeah. Um, and then his first day at work, really, um, we, we went to work long before we got a job and we were straight into a mission, a life-saving mission. He's been a fantastic member of the team, and that's really what we were looking for, was somebody who would really fit in, work hard, and really contribute to the operation of the East Anglian Air Ambulance, and he's done that in spades. He's been a terrific member of the team. He, he, made a, he made a space for himself very quickly as a member of a highly professional team, and he earned the respect of everybody around him. Take those off. <laughs> they have been cleaned in two years. He really will be missed because he's a terrific pilot. He's a great guy to have around. He's been really good at scene, and that's, what, that's the feedback I get from all of our clinical teams. And, yeah, he's just been a great person to have as part of East Anglian Air Ambulance.
Just under a year later, in April 2018, Kate gave birth to their third child, Prince Louis, who would be fifth in line of succession. Family has remained an important part of life for William, and the country has been pleased to see more of the young princes, George and Louis, as well as Princess Charlotte at royal events. Prince William continues in his duties as a monarch in training, at the same time as dedicating himself to the vital service of the crown. He has served a vital role on numerous occasions, supporting Her Majesty the Queen, but also focusing on areas of working life, which obviously mean a great deal to him. He is currently patron or president of many organizations, remaining particularly interested in conservation, young people, the armed forces, emergency responders, and mental health. I think everything that William has done in his life has colored what he, the charities that he's chosen to support. You know, the conservation comes from his time in Africa. His interest in the welfare of ex-military personnel comes from his time in, in the military. His experience as an air ambulance pilot, the people he saw there, the injuries, I think, his interest in mental welfare is also tied up in all of that. His interest in the environment, following in the footsteps of his father, King Charles, and his grandfather, Prince Philip, remains an incredibly important focus for William. Queen Elizabeth spoke of her pride for her grandchild at the COP26 summit. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference. This is a duty I'm especially happy to discharge, as the impact of the environment on human progress was a subject close to the heart of my dear late husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. It is a source of great pride to me that the leading role my husband played in encouraging people to protect our fragile planet lives on through the work of our eldest son, Charles, and his eldest son, William. I could not be more proud of them. He spent a lot of time in his youth in Africa, and I think it's certainly the role of his father, Prince Charles, in conservation has had a big impact upon him. It's something he's deeply, deeply passionate about. He's somebody, I think, that cares deeply about issues, but the homeless is one that he's actively involved with. He's also very keen in trying to help um, young people that are on um, drugs and, have, and are trying to get through that problem um, and he does lend a lot of support to that and in fact in fact in my, it's my understanding he's not only doing stuff where he helps himself um, he actually does put his money where his mouth is and through his foundation he has contributed quite a lot of money to assisting people in this in this regard this family has service sort of you know running through them William has got it his father's got it, his grandmother's got it. I think his role model is the queen, not actually his parents. I think he felt that his parents blurred the distinction between the public and the private. The queen has managed to keep her privacy and her personal life much more to herself. And I think William will try and do the same. The prince has made many official visits around the UK meeting a broad range of people who make a difference to their community. With Kate at his side, he has also carried out overseas tours on behalf of the Queen to the Commonwealth and beyond. William and Kate to me are about the future. I don't like to, to look back and compare her to Diana because she is her own woman. And William and Kate, I think, have their own idea of what they want to do. And I think, you know, you see the, these two people moving forward and taking the monarchy forward I say in my book that modernization is a very hard word to use in the context of the royal family because the royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol, but actually in William and Kate, you see a future king and queen who are driving it forward and taking it on to the next step. On the Queen's Platinum Jubilee year, William and Kate toured the Caribbean to mark the occasion. Their journey was met with somewhat mixed reviews. Prince William made an important speech in which he observed the need for change. Next year, I know you're all looking forward to celebrating 50 years of independence. 
your golden anniversary. And with Jamaica celebrating 60 years of independence this year, and Belize celebrating 40 years of independence last year, I want to say this. We support with pride and respect your decisions about your future. Relationships evolve, friendship endures. William's beloved grandma, the Queen, sadly died in September 2022. The nation went into mourning and grief was felt worldwide. But there is no pause in the continuity of the monarchy. King Charles III was proclaimed and William became first in the line of succession. In the new king's first televised broadcast, he announced William and Catherine would become the new Prince and Princess of Wales. As my heir, William now assumes the Scottish titles, which have meant so much to me. He succeeds me as Duke of Cornwall and takes on the responsibilities for the Duchy of Cornwall, which I have undertaken for more than five decades. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales to Wusog Cymru. Although his title has changed, he still offers the same dedication to duty and service. It is likely William will have to take on more events and engagements in his new role. Well, I think that William is already fulfilling his role as Prince of Wales. I mean, he's lived in Wales, he lived in Anglesey, um, he's, he's worked there, he has, um, I think he's, he's done so much in such a short time and he has such respect from people that I don't think people will compare him to his father. I think his father's position of Prince of Wales was unique and William's position of Prince of Wales is very much William and Catherine together. I think he will be very much a king who knows his own mind. William is a very determined man. I think he's mindful of history and won't do anything extraordinary, but I think he's also very much, much more a man of the, of the modern age and of the people than uh, any previous monarchs. Prince William has clearly demonstrated his ability to win hearts and minds wherever he goes, with a genuine warmth and care for people he meets. In the years to come, as he serves as Prince of Wales, he will no doubt continue to follow his duty and support his father, King Charles III. In the fullness of time, when he ascends to the throne as king, he will take inspiration from those who have served before him, whilst modernizing the monarchy in his own unique way. For now, William remains Prince of Wales, King in Waiting. At the moment, they are the golden couple. The royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol, but actually in William and Kate, you see a future king and queen who are driving it forward and taking it on to the next step. Never before have members of the royal family been seen in the same way as we view celebrities, but Kate and William are a very good-looking pair, and because they come across so down-to-earth, I think we're viewing them in a completely different way.
I think he takes the role very seriously. I think he believes in monarchy. I think he will be very much a king who knows his own mind. William is a very determined man. It goes on and on and on, doesn't it? There's <laughs> <laughs> queues of people. He will be very much more modern uh, than, than his grandmother or, or his father. And I think he'll be much more the people's king. Some of my earliest memories relate to times my parents spoke to me, um, or even better, showed me what it meant to have both privilege and responsibilities. Following the death of his dearest and most revered grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II, Prince William's father, now Charles III, ascended to the throne, and Prince William took the title of Prince of Wales. His Royal Highness, Prince William, is now second in line to the throne, but he has his work cut out, following in his father's footsteps and keeping up the tradition of duty and hard work. His destiny is to inherit the crown and succeed to the throne. But how does a prince prepare to become king? Crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace throughout the evening. Then at 10.25, their patience was rewarded with the formal notice of the birth. It was signed by Mr. George Pinker, the Queen's gynaecologist, and other doctors who attended the princess. Prince William, now Prince of Wales, first-born son of King Charles III and Diana, Princess of Wales, has always been in the spotlight. Born second in line to the throne, he was destined for a life of duty and of service. The skies were clear this morning as the Royal Australian Air Force jet made its approach. Prince and Princess emerged showing no sign of the long flight and obviously well educated in the right sort of clothes to wear in Central Australia. And then the moment more than a hundred reporters and cameramen flew from all over the world to see the public debut of nine-month-old Prince William, second in line to the throne. Of course, for Prince William, he would have been able to understand little of what was going on around him at the time, as his nanny carried him carefully down the steps of the aircraft onto Australian soil. Diana's decision to take her baby, Prince William, with her on their tour of Australia and New Zealand in 1983 was criticised in some corners of the media, but it was a turning point for Diana and the catalyst for her to grow in popularity with the public. Later, to protect the young princes, William and Harry, from the excesses of the press and paparazzi, the royal family came to an agreement with the media that the boys would be free from press intrusion whilst they were being educated. And in exchange, the family undertook to give regular updates to the mainstream media. traditional aristocratic childhood in as much as he was taken care of by nannies. His parents were, were, you know, Diana particularly was a modern parent, but she was a modern aristocratic parent and she did use nannies and the nannies really were the people that William spent most of his time with. He had been a very outgoing little boy. He, at his first school he was known as Basho Basher Wills or Basher Wales, because um, he was, you know, quite stroppy and confident. After his early years at Ludgrove School, the young Prince William entered the gates of Eton College, where he fitted in easily to its centuries-old traditions and where he found like-minded people. For their eldest son's big day, the Princess of Wales was in the driving seat. 
With the Prince of Wales at her side, Eton's most famous new boy was with his younger brother Harry in the back. William threw himself enthusiastically into school life. But if there was one area in which he really excelled, it would be sport, an arena in which he continues to devote his energies to this day, seeming to naturally embrace all the principles of sportsmanship and teamwork which make it so important in our lives. Unfortunately, although William enjoyed his time at Eton, it was, of course, blighted by the tragic death of his mother. so much. Thank you. Oh, God. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, how does any 15-year-old and 12-year-old cope with that? Um, uh, it was devastating for them, obviously. On the day of the funeral, William and Harry walked behind the cortege. Um, it was a long walk, and the, the, there were crowds sobbing and, and wailing, and um, hundreds, thousands and thousands of people lining the route. Uh, and they walked with their father, uh, their grandfather, and Charles Spencer. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. William and Harry, we all care desperately for you today. We are all chewed up with sadness at the loss of a woman who wasn't even our mother. How great your suffering is, we cannot even imagine. Above all, we give thanks for the life of a woman I'm so proud to be able to call my sister. The unique, the complex, the extraordinary and irreplaceable Diana, whose beauty, both internal and external, will never be extinguished from our minds. After graduating from Eton, like many young men of his generation, Prince William decided on a gap year. 
Now he's off to the plains of Patagonia for a 10-week expedition. I wanted to do something constructive um, for my gap year rather than, um, I mean, uh, I could do quite a lot of work, but I thought this was a, a bit more of a way of um, making, uh, trying to help people out and uh, meet a whole range of other different people from um, different countries and at the same time uh, helping people um, in remote areas of Chile. I think we're very much seeing a royal for the new century. Very relaxed, not stage managed, um, happy to josh a bit uh, with his father in an informal way, but not scared to say exactly what he's feeling and uh, certainly not prepared to dodge the difficult issues. The clearest example of that is challenge to the press today to let his mother rest in peace. Through his early voluntary work with Rally International, the young prince set off for Chile, where he spent three months working on various community projects, painting, chopping wood, and even cleaning the loos just like everybody else. There was no question in any of the gap here, actually, that he was a prince and treated differently. He mucked in, he slept in sleeping bags, you know, he, he cooked food around a campfire. He did everything that everyone else did. A few weeks later, a young Kate Middleton also undertook a similar voluntary role, and on that occasion, they just missed each other. Prince William loves Scotland, and it didn't take him long to decide to continue his education at the University of St Andrews. He did well enough to get not a place at Oxbridge, which could have been fixed for him. There was speculation that he would go to Trinity College, Cambridge, as his father did. But he was sufficient of his own man to say, no, I want to go to Scotland, I like Scotland. He chose St Andrews University, a very ancient university in the Kingdom of Fife. And so, by chance, did Kate Middleton. And that, of course, where they were both first-year students, freshers, that's where they met. It was at St Andrews where that friendship, because it was initially a friendship, flourished. Um, William and Kate were at the same halls of residence at St Salvador's. They were on the same course in the same year. I mean, some people say, wasn't that just too much of a coincidence? Um, but it was how things worked out. And they spent the first year as undergraduates really getting to know each other. William was not particularly happy in his course. They were both doing history of art. And uh, Kate was, was really great, actually, at trying to keep him focused, keep him incentivized, and actually stop him from leaving St Andrews, which was at one point what he wanted to do. Um, he didn't leave, he switched course, and they spent the next four years living together and falling in love. The people of St Andrews are a very close-knit sort of society, and they welcomed William with open arms, and they were very protective of him. And as a result, you know, he he spent life, he spent four years there, as a pretty normal student. I think the wonderful thing about St Andrews was it was a bubble, away from reality. It was, it was a life that Prince William had never been able to enjoy, whether it was going to the local shops, going to a local bar, going for his morning swim. He could get on with his life and his relationship in private. At all times, they were highly discreet. They were almost never seen together. They were, even with their friends, they didn't allow any gossip to start. The people speculated, but there was nothing uh, definite which proved that they were an item. And I think the pair of them absolutely loved those years. They look upon those St Andrews years with, with great fondness, and uh, they are patrons of St Andrews University because they feel such a strong connection to that place. <laughs> In his own words, it is time now for the big wide world. But today, William's family, like any other, well, almost, came to say a proud farewell to a place that has allowed him a more normal life than any royal in history. That he is deeply grateful is not in doubt. And partly, of course, it's been about this woman. They've been allowed to develop a relationship without front page scrutiny, and it's helped. Catherine Middleton. Romance did not stand in the way of hard work and Prince William graduated alongside Kate with a Scottish Master of Arts degree with upper second-class honours. Of course, no graduation would be complete without family to proudly celebrate academic achievement, but there are not many who can include the Queen in their university graduation. William Wales.
The British royal family have served the armed forces for generations. It's a useful place, really, for them to be, because, certainly in modern times, because they are away from the prying eyes of the, of the public and the press, the media. It's a useful service. You know, they, um, they, get to, uh, they get to experience danger and they get to be part of a team and it's great for leadership and for mixing with people from all walks of life, which is something that when they're growing up, historically, they didn't really do so much. The reason it's important for members of the royal family to serve in the military is because one day, as um, Prince of Wales, it's felt that it's extremely important that if you are going to be head of the military, that in some way you would have served. The Queen, in fact, did serve um, with, uh, during World War II um, with the Women's Corps. Elizabeth is in the ATS, or British WAC, and at the King's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Queen Elizabeth herself had an active role during World War II and was the first female member of the royal family to serve in a full-time military role. She diagnosed and repaired faulty engines, serving in the ATS. William's grandfather, Prince Philip, served with distinction in World War II and was awarded the Greek War Cross of Valor. Rising through the ranks, the young Prince Philip became one of the youngest officers in the Royal Navy to be promoted to first lieutenant. Prince William's father served in the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. Qualifying as a helicopter pilot in 1974, and joining the 845 Naval Air Squadron, operating from the commando carrier HMS Hermes. In February 1976, Prince Charles was promoted to command, and he took control of HMS Bronington, a coastal mine hunter, for his last nine months in the Royal Navy. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the, the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Both William and Harry were keen to follow the example of their family and take an active role in the military. After passing the selection process to become an army officer, Prince William took his place at Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy, from which thousands of successful army careers have been launched. Sandhurst used to be filled, I think, with rather dim-witted sons of the aristocracy. Um, today, it is really a, a, you know, a very serious academy. It's a very tough course and f hugely physical. You, you pass quite serious exams, academic exams, to get into Sandhurst. And, and then once you're there, the regime is, is pretty um, remorseless. William got through it. The cadets at Sandhurst are divided into companies, or divisions as they're called. The senior division always has the honor of carrying the color, a banner personally given by the sovereign. And as the senior cadets complete their training, so the color is passed on. The Academy RSM receives the colour and carries it to the new senior division of the next year. William clearly learnt how to march in step here at Sandhurst. By all accounts, he was a natural soldier, considered to be amongst the best in his year. The 44-week training course is gruelling, and it's reported that William found enormous strength during this period and made friends who remain close and loyal to this day. Next year, sees the 60th anniversary of the formation of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, the spiritual home of the Officer Corps of the British Army. And the high standards which it continues to demand of its cadets have been exemplified by your impressive drill and turnout today. The Academy's principal aim 
is to develop the qualities of leadership, character, and intellect demanded of an army officer on first appointment. I place that trust in you with confidence. And my prayers for your success and safety will follow you wherever you may be called upon to serve. Graduating with the rank of Lieutenant Wales, William followed his younger brother into the Blues and Royals as a troop commander, which meant a further five month training at Bovington Camp in Dorset. Harry had been to Sandhurst ahead of William because he didn't do, uh, he didn't go to university. And he had joined the Blues and Royals regiment. Um, William, when he, when he graduated from Sandhurst, when he passed out, he also joined the Blues and Royals. But because of the way that um, the regiments uh, rotated in their deployments, it was quite clear that William was not actually going to make it to Afghanistan. His regiment wouldn't go there um, for 18 months. And rather than sit around um, kicking his heels, doing training work in, in this country, he decided to go and look at the other forces. Prince William moved to the Royal Air Force, and in 2008, he completed a 12-week intensive flying training course at RAF College Cranwell. Prince William will arrive here January 2008, and he'll be attached to the Royal Air Force for four months, and during that time, there'll be some flying training, and he'll also then go on to operational squadrons to see how the operational side of the Royal Air Force operates. I think everybody's very excited. I know Prince William's keen to come here and learn to fly, and uh, the instructors who've been chosen to teach him are looking forward to it as well. This is the Grob Tutor. It's the RAF's elementary flying training aircraft. All our pilots come into this at the first stage of their training, as soon as they finish officer training. Uh, so the course mates for Flying Officer Wales will be doing exactly the same training as him at this stage. Um, it's fairly docile to fly. It's something you could find similar to at a flying club, but it's also fully aerobatic, so it's quite a capable aircraft, and we can up the pace quite quickly, which is what we do on our training course. This is uh, a Takano uh, T Mark I trainer. It's the basic fast jet trainer for the Royal Air Force. And Prince William is going to be uh, coming to us from his tutor flying to expand his flying skills, uh, give him some more complicated and advanced techniques, uh, and then progress him onto the squirrel phase of his course prior to the award of wings. It's going to be a very exciting uh, period. It's a privilege to train Prince William. Uh, with regard to how he'll be treated, he's going to be treated the same as all the rest of our students and, and all the uh, junior officers that we work with. And the Air Force is known as the Squirrel, and ours is specifically the AS350BB, which is unique to the Air Force only in pure terms of what the aircraft has on, to, has on it in terms of equipment. Uh, we use it for basic military training for all Army, Navy and Air Force rotary students in the UK. So the Prince will fly both the Tutor and the Takano before coming to Shawbury to fly the Squirrel. It's a, it's a huge honour for, for all involved and uh, we, we have uh, had royal visitors in the past and Cranwell especially um, with its association with uh, Prince Charles and his flying training. Everyone is very much, very much looking forward to it. He's not just another recruit but we are trying to make him uh, as, fit in as much as he can and certainly that's what happened with the army. Um, so he'll be treated the same as anybody else, he'll wear the same uniform uh, and those associated with him would call him as they would any other junior officer in the same rank. How's life in the RAF? Very good, enjoying it very much. Um, very different from the army? Um, in certain ways, yeah. Otherwise it's, you know, it's still the same sort of, um, sort of camaraderie and everyone getting along really well. Now, I understand you flew your first solo flight yesterday. I did, yeah. How did it go? Um, well, I'm still here to tell the tale, and I haven't been built for a plane, so, so far it looks all right. But um, it was one of those experiences where I thought, it'll never come round. And I thought, you know, hopefully a bit longer yet, I'll get back to practice. And the next thing I know, my instructor jumps out and goes, go on, get on with it. And I was left there sort of looking around the room and going, uh, what? So uh, I just did it, and once you get up in the air, it was fine. It wasn't so bad. His father had loved flying, his grandfather had loved flying. Um, it was very much in the blood, I think. And he, and his brother, of course, Harry, loved flying. So the two brothers became helicopter pilots in the end. Once again, proud parents were able to play an active role on graduation day. So he was presenting William with his wings. I mean, it must, he must have felt hugely proud but also um, 
a, a sort of bittersweet moment for Charles because he himself wasn't able to carry on with his flying career because it was thought too dangerous for the heir to the throne. Flying officer, William Wales, graduating with number 227 and number 97 horses. After serving in both the Army and the Royal Air Force, William was then seconded to train with the Navy, spending three weeks at the Britannia Royal Navy College in Dartmouth. So having learnt to, to fly an aeroplane, um, he then went to, do, to explore the Navy, to get a taste of the Navy. And he went out to the Caribbean um, on a, a drug policing um, vessel. And during his time there, um, he did, he was part of a crew that busted a huge, huge drugs haul worth millions of pounds. Um, so he, he experienced quite a lot of excitement um, and probably quite a lot of danger, actually. William extended his Royal Naval Short Service Commission for as long as possible, and it's reported that he greatly enjoyed his time in the senior service but he was called back to the Royal Air Force and promoted to flight lieutenant, taking up training to become a helicopter pilot in the RAF search and rescue service. He was not going into a, a, a battlefield. Nobody knew who he was up in, an, in a helicopter, and yet it was very real and meaningful work. To me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said a lot of times before, molly cuddled or treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, in my eyes, if Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. And I think as a future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was get, you get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. I and mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And the search and rescue role is now you know, slightly different to so obviously being able to go to Afghanistan, but it's still doing an important job. And yeah, I hope that it's, yeah, I hope it's just in the right direction exactly for the future. The training is demanding and includes advanced handling, night flying, emergency handling, and tactical and formation flying on the Griffin HT-1 helicopter. William Wales. Flight Lieutenant William Wales is posted to the Operational Conversion Unit 203 Squadron, Royal Air Force Valley, to fly the Sea King. Flight Lieutenant Wales graduated in January 2010 from the Defence Helicopter Flying School at RAF Shawbury. <laughs> Prince William then transferred to RAF Valley at Anglesey becoming the first member of the royal family since Henry VII to live in Wales. For the next eight months, he trained on the Sea King helicopter and was assigned to Sea Flight No. 22 Squadron as a co-pilot. Well, before I started Search and Rescue, I had a little brief uh, introduction to it, and it was immediate to me. Um, I spent three hours flying with the guys, and it was totally apparent to me straight away how important the job is and the skills the guys employ. Um, the flying aspects, the, the general airmanship you need to, to have around you and all the wits you need to survive the weather and whatever sort of situation you're thrown into. Um, it definitely is advanced flying and it's rewarding. So it put the two together and it's a fantastic job. It's rewarding because every day you come in to work and you don't quite know what's going to happen. It's quite exciting in that sense, it's unpredictable. But at the same time, it's great that you get to go out and actually save someone's life, hopefully or at least make a difference to someone, you know, when you know that they're in trouble, you do everything you can to try and get there. And the guys demonstrate that every single day they go out. And with the team environment there is in the cockpit, um, it's very much sort of big family in the sky and, and the guys do a fantastic job. We've got 11 pilots here. William's a fairly new co-pilot, but as such, he, he, he flies the aircraft as much as anyone else. And he'll be called on, upon quite regularly during jobs to take control of the aircraft uh, while the captain's doing something else. Um, uh, regarding the hierarchy, we're all pretty much uh, we're all e of equal rank, um, just with different varying levels of experience. So, and we all get on very, very well together. Have a joke and a laugh when we're we're on the ground and, and get serious when we're flying. 
It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, when William first arrived on the squadron, it was a massive shock to all of us, fairly dumbfounded, really, uh, that somebody with such a prestige was coming onto our squadron. But very quickly settled into just one of the guys, uh, one of us, one, part of the family, certainly. Um, and day to day, you, you don't even really notice. I suppose in 10, 15 years' time, when we look back on this occasion, it'll seem very, very special and memorable. Um, but he's, he's a great guy to work with. When you're flying along at night in Snowdonia and in other mountains and you've got 40 knot winds, the clouds down to about 200 feet and you're trying to get through to find someone who's either broken a leg or is lost on the hill, um, it gets quite interesting. You have to use all four of you, put your brain power together and your skill and basically hope that you, know, you can actually get there and help. There was a, a key moment in his life. It was in 2011, there had been a huge, devastating earthquake in New Zealand. And William said to his private secretary, is anyone from the royal family going down to New Zealand? Because if they're not, I would like to go and, and you know, represent the Queen and, and express our sorrow at what's happened. And his private secretary said, you can't possibly do this. You know, you haven't got time. How are you going to work out? You know, you've got this, these number of shifts you've got to do with, the, with search and rescue. He said, it's all right, I've sorted all of that. Just find out whether, whether I can go, whether anyone else is going. So he did, and he went. And he stood side by side with people who'd lost loved ones, homes, businesses. You know, the, the scenes there were absolutely devastating. My grandmother once said that grief is the price we pay for love. Here today, we love and we grieve. And that was the point at which I think William went from being a young man to a future king. Family life beckoned and during his time at RAF Valley, it was announced that Prince William and Kate Middleton were to marry. Flying himself into the land his family have worked for generations, Ian Craig's plane touches down in Lewa, the romantic hideaway Prince William chose to make his proposal. Could you serene? Yeah. There and then? I did, yeah. I'd been carrying it around with me in my rucksack for about three weeks before that, and uh, I literally would not let it go. Everywhere I went, I was keeping hold of it because I knew this thing, if it disappeared, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and yeah, because I planned it, it sort of, it went fine, as you know, you'll hear a lot of horror stories about proposing and things go horribly wrong. It went really, really well, and uh, yeah, I was really pleased that she said yes. I think it was very telling that he chose to give Kate Middleton his mother's engagement ring and he said I want my mother to be part of this to be present not in a sinister way of course not not the ghost at the feast but there to enjoy the celebrations and the fun of it all uh, of a great occasion and I think people are very well aware of the background and they certainly have a great deal of um, uh, sympathy and uh, they're almost willing them to be happy because he particularly has had difficulties in his life. On the 29th of April 2011, Prince William and Kate Middleton married in Westminster Abbey. The nation took Kate to their hearts and she has been by his side ever since. This was very much a, a, a wedding, their personal wedding. Okay, it was very, very public. Obviously, it was televised and, and the world was watching, but it was essentially um, their private wedding, and that's how they kind of treated it. Um, and it, it was very touching, and, and uh, Kate looked absolutely stunning. It was a cause for big celebration. Crowds gathered from far away to take part in the day. After all, Kate would one day become queen consort.
Like many young newlyweds in the services, duty called, and Flight Lieutenant Wales was deployed to the Falkland Islands, becoming part of a four-man crew providing cover for aviation assets and assisting those in need of rescue. Search and rescue pilots here provide 24-hour coverage um, with a seeking helicopter. They're on duty for a 24-hour period um, and covering any eventuality. Um, as you've seen, the, the distances here are quite large, the roads are not fantastic, and if we need to get somebody, military or civilian, to hospital, um, quite often search and rescue helicopters are the best way of doing it. Balancing home and family life with a career can be difficult. Kate gave birth of their first child, Prince George, in July 2013. The media camped out in excitement to catch a glimpse of the future king. Kate and William greeted the press and introduced Prince George to the world. After this, Flight Lieutenant William Wales took the decision to retire from active service in the Royal Air Force in September 2013. William, I think, that time, those years, as a search and rescue pilot, he really felt that he did achieve something. It was a real job. There were no concessions for who he was. He wasn't wrapped up in cotton wool. But the time came where, he, where the tour of duty came to an end. And I think he left probably with quite a heavy heart. But he'd had a very, very good time there. Um, and I think, you know, he'd, he'd absolutely achieved what he set out to achieve. Retirement from active service did not deter the future king from looking to the skies to fulfill his career ambitions and to continue the spirit of service to others. In 2014, it was announced that William would accept full-time employment as a pilot with the East Anglian Air Ambulance, based at Cambridge Airport. Kate and William had another exciting announcement. They would be having their second child. In May 2015, Kate gave birth to Princess Charlotte, who would be fourth in line to the succession of the throne. He made the decision, and it was a, quite a surprise when he announced he wanted to get back into the cockpit because, remember, he'd left the RAF. We all thought his um, flying days were behind him, and actually we'd see the Duke of Cambridge embark on a life of official public duty. Well, that hasn't happened. Um, he's gone back into the cockpit, albeit in a different capacity. He's flying now with the Air Ambulance Service. It's a charity, um, but it's still a full-time and demanding job. It also means he can have a career aside from the royal family and it's in a perfect arena of course because he's going out and helping to save lives. Um, so it ticks all of those boxes. Equally, I think because he can base himself further up north and away from Kensington Palace, which he considers a bit of a goldfish bowl, he can enjoy this idyllic life helping to bring up the children at least in the next few years while they're still very young. In April 2018, Kate gave birth to their third child. Prince Louis, who would be fifth in line of succession. Family has remained an important part of life for William, and the country has been pleased to see more of the young princes, George and Louis, as well as Princess Charlotte at royal events. I think everything that William has done in his life has coloured what he, the charities that he's chosen to support. You know, the conservation comes from his time in Africa. His interest in the welfare of ex-military personnel comes from his time in, in the military. His experience as an air ambulance pilot, the people he saw there, the injuries. I think his interest in mental welfare is also tied up in all of that. William and Kate, to me, are about the future. I don't like to, to look back and compare her to Diana because she is her own woman. And William and Kate, I think, have their own idea of what they want to do. And I think, you know, you see the, these two people moving forward and taking the monarchy forward. I say in my book that modernization is a very hard word to use in the context of the royal family because the royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol. But actually, in William and Kate, you see a future king and queen who are driving it forward and taking it on to the next step.
I speak to you today with feelings of profound sorrow. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. And we owe her the most heartfelt debt any family could owe to their mother for her love, affection, guidance, understanding, and example. Prince William has clearly demonstrated his ability to win hearts and minds wherever he goes, with a genuine warmth and care for people he meets. In the years to come, as he serves as Prince of Wales, he will no doubt continue to follow his duty and support his father, King Charles III. In the fullness of time, when he ascends to the throne as king, he will take inspiration from those who have served before him whilst modernising the monarchy in his own unique way. I think he will be very much a king who knows his own mind. William is a very determined man. I think he's mindful of history and won't do anything extraordinary, but I think he's also very much, much more a man of the, of the modern age and of the people than any previous months. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles are about to come out now. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public quite clearly coming down the steps of the Ritz after the party for Cam the 50th birthday party for Camilla's sister. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The photograph the people have waited so long, the picture the people have waited so long to see. An absolute cascade of flashbulbs, only a few seconds, but the picture, the scene that says so much. Camilla was in a very, very unpleasant situation. She was almost became a prisoner in her own home. She was vilified. She was absolutely the hated by everyone. I always saw it happening that she was transformed from hated mistress into supportive wife. I think there can be few people in public life who've taken more knocks than she has. Uh, in many ways, very unfair. I mean, people have been absolutely, were absolutely vile about her, and and she's let all that go. Well, Charles is a great believer that that time is a healer, and he he is in essence right. And he thought if we take it very gently. Um, we'll get it right and people will accept Camilla because she's wonderful and people have accepted Camilla but it did take a long time. The, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty and she also saw her dedication to Charles because she, she so helps him. She had a lot of ingredients that Charles really, really fell in love with, and he never really fell out of love with her. So it is, it is a very romantic story. Well, I don't really think Camilla ever wanted to be queen. I don't think, well, she certainly didn't envisage such a busy life at the age of 75. And, you know, she is the, the perfect person to stand at Prince Charles's side. It's interesting, isn't it, isn't it, when you think about how the view has changed of Camilla. At one point, she was vilified by the media, you know, that it was always negative. You know, she's done an amazing job at, I think, at 
change in public opinion. It is no secret that the road to their eventual marriage and very public commitment was not an easy one for the king and queen. Camilla was, probably unfairly, deemed the villain in a story that captivated the nation. Camilla Shand was born on the 17th of July, 1947, daughter to Major Bruce Shand and Rosalind Cubitt. Growing up alongside her brother and sister, Mark and Annabelle. Camilla's childhood was a very happy one. She was as happy mucking out a stable and grooming her horse as she was when socializing in the aristocratic circles of society. In the 1970s, Charles was known as one of the most eligible bachelors in the world. It was a predestined part of his responsibility as heir to the throne to marry a suitable, aristocratic young woman and to continue the line of succession. Lucia Santa Cruz, his first brief love affair, had decided that the bachelor prince would get on very well with a friend of hers, a young woman named Camilla Shand. The couple were introduced and it's reported that Camilla said, my great grandmother was a mistress of your great great grandfather, so how about it? She was referring to her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, who was the long-term mistress of Charles's great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII. Sparks flew as Charles was immediately attracted to her. Still, the electric romance was short-lived as Camilla went on to marry Andrew Parker Bowles, an army officer, a man she had had an on-off relationship with for several years and with whom Princess Anne had had a brief affair before she herself married and settled down. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from a very early age. You know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She was funny, she was a great rider, and she made him laugh. And I think that she's very, very attractive to both men and women because of her personality. She's got a wonderful personality and you know, when Charles first met her, I mean, she didn't care what she looked like, but, you know, she was a great horsewoman. She was really sporty. And I suppose she was a challenge, too, because, you know, she was basically in love with Andrew Parker Bowles. So I think she had a lot of ingredients that Charles really, really fell in love with, and um, he never really fell out of love with her. So it is, it is a very romantic story. I think Charles sees She's his soulmate, she's his best friend. And I think that's vice versa. I don't think that's one way. I think they both see that in each other. And, you know, when you see them together and them interacting and, and you know, also just the way they kind of look at each other and they're on the same wavelength. You know, without even speaking, they're on the same wavelength. And you can tell, you can just, you know, you can just see that between them. And I think that's something really, really special. I think the Queen and Prince Philip had it. I think Prince Charles and Camilla has, have got it. I think William and Kate have got it. And they're really lucky. They're really lucky that they've got that, that royal connection. Charles was said to have been upset about their marriage, but he himself was not ready to tie the knot. And some of the more senior grey suits within the palace deemed the young Camilla to have too much history to be a suitable bride for the future king. Royal guests attended the Parker Bowles wedding, including the Queen Mother, Princess Margaret and Princess Anne. I think Charles was very, very hurt when Camilla and Andrew got married and he stayed well out of it. He was away at sea and he knew it was going to happen, but he just didn't want to be part of it. So he just stayed well out, well out of the way. And I think he was, he was very, very sad, very sad about it. But he knew that probably there was nothing he could do about it. The then Prince Charles remained close with Mr. and Mrs. Parker Bowles. He and Andrew would play polo together. And Charles was also asked to be godfather to their son, Tom. It is said that in 1979, after the death of Lord Louis Mountbatten, 
Charles turned to Camilla for a comforting shoulder, and they rekindled a spark from many years ago. However, after he decided to marry Diana, he and Camilla parted ways romantically, until, as Charles himself said, the relationship became irretrievably broken down. In the years that followed, scandal after scandal would come to haunt Charles and Camilla. Charles's marriage to Lady Diana Spencer, in which the public invested their hearts, fell apart as their incompatibilities came to light. One by one, tapes, books and interviews were released, detailing the unhappy marriage between the royal couple. Charles and Diana separated in 1992 and later divorced. It was also the beginning of the end of the union between Andrew and Camilla Parker Bowles, who later divorced. Camilla was in a very, very unpleasant situation. She was almost became a prisoner in her own home. She was vilified. She was absolutely the hated by everyone. I mean, actually, the Queen felt very sorry for her. She called her that much maligned woman. Because, you know, they've known the Parker Bowles is or, you know, all their life. You know, Andrew's father was a great friend of the Queen Mother and they were all acquaintances. So, um, so the Queen felt desperately sad for Camilla and it was, it was a very, very, very difficult time for her. Especially after Diana died. I mean, then she was even more of a prisoner. With both marriages ending, the path was free for Charles and Camilla to continue their relationship, but that path would not be easy. Diana was tragically killed in August 1997. The nation went into mourning for the beloved princess. A dreadful loss for the world, but mostly for Charles's two young sons, William and Harry. To begin parading their relationship in public would certainly not bode well with the public. Campaign Camilla would have to be put on hold. So they kept their relationship to themselves, away from the media and prying eyes. This period was very challenging for Camilla. She lived a very closeted life, hiding away from an angry and grieving public who still viewed her as the villain that broke the fairy tale. Mark Bolland had been appointed to help with Charles's public image, and Camilla was going to play a part in that, so he worked with them both to enhance their profiles. Operation Ritz, an opportunity that would tempt the media circus and give them the picture for which they had all been waiting. In 1999, Charles and Camilla decided enough time had passed since Diana's death to reveal their commitment to each other as a couple. Well, Charles is a great believer that, that time is a healer, and he, he is, in essence, right. And he thought, if we take it very gently, um, we, we'll get it right, and people will accept Camilla because she's wonderful. And people have accepted Camilla, but it did take a long time. And there's a lot of people that will never accept her. But it did take a long time, and they did it very gradually. Then they became under so much pressure for the first picture of them together. And they thought of all different ways of doing it. Maybe they just should release a picture of them together. Maybe they should arrange for them to be out somewhere and, and press would just happen to be there. But in the end, they decided to do it at Camilla's sister's birthday party at the Ritz. And their press officer let everybody know that they would be walking out of the party together. So there was an unbelievable bank of photographers and even now when they show this moment they put a warning on television flash photography it was just like crazy outside the ritz they're ready for one of the shots of the year charles and camilla together at last tonight it's expected the couple will leave a birthday party together 
finally acknowledging in public a relationship that started back in the 70s. If you ask any photographer which the picture they want to take, it's Prince Charles with Camilla Parker Bowles. It's the one great picture left to take. How important is it not to miss the shot? Oh, it's, it's, you can't afford to miss it. You know, you've got to get the two of them together walking down those steps. If you get that, you're there. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles about to come out now. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public quite clearly coming down the steps of the Ritz after the party for Cam the 50th birthday party for Camilla's sister. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The photograph that people have waited so long, the picture that people have waited so long to see. Quite brief, really, out of the doors, down the steps, into the car and driving away. Absolute cascade of flashbulbs, only a few seconds, but the picture, the scene that says so much. Well, the public have been longing to see them together, so I think they, they, they liked that. But there was a huge, huge uh, animosity to Camilla, especially in America, where, where they love Diana and still do. Um, and they, they, you know, in America, everything's about glamour and how you look, and they just thought, well, she's not glamorous enough. And they didn't think that maybe this is, she was exactly the sort of woman that Prince Charles needed because they didn't really know him. It is well known that courtiers disapproved of Charles and Camilla's relationship, and so too did Charles's mother, Queen Elizabeth. With so much negative attention from the press and lowering opinion of Charles, the then future king, it is hardly surprising that their relationship was difficult to accept. Whilst the monarchy does not rely on a public vote, public opinion matters very much. However, as the new millennium began, relationships warmed, and knowing Camilla would be there, the Queen accepted an invitation to attend the 60th birthday party of the King of Greece at Highgrove. This was their first public meeting together, and a sign that she was beginning to accept the relationship. That year, Charles had also taken Camilla as an unofficial companion to various engagements in Scotland. Prince Charles was in the driving seat this morning as he left Highgrove, knowing the road is now officially clear for him to continue his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. He's said to be delighted that the Queen has finally acknowledged his long-term companion. The first glimpse into the couple's affectionate side was in 2001, when Charles and Camilla shared their first public kiss at an event for the National Osteoporosis Society at Somerset House in London. Camilla greeted Charles with a kiss. It was the first time the couple had shown such affection in public. Also at the reception, some 300 guests, including ex-King Constantine of Greece and his wife Anne-Marie, whom Camilla knows well. It's interesting, isn't it, when you think about how the view has changed of Camilla? Because at one point she was vilified by the media, the, you know, that it was always negative. It was, you know, homewrecker and all this kind of thing and having the affairs and the affair with the prince and everything. And, and so people just didn't want her, didn't like her. I remember that. I remember when I joined the household and somebody knew that I was the butler and just said, oh, I don't, don't like her, you know? And I remember thinking, wow, really? You don't know her, but you don't like her. And that's changed to where today, I don't remember, do you? I don't remember the last time I read anything negative or bad about her. I can't remember. Uh, it's always positive, it's always good. As far as PR goes, you know, she's done an amazing job at, I think, at changing public opinion. Giving her open blessing to the relationship, the Queen invited Camilla to her Golden Jubilee celebrations. Following the death of the Queen Mother in 2002, Charles moved into Clarence House following a significant refurbishment, as it had not been decorated for 50 years. With rooms for William and Harry on the top floor, a room and ensuite were also refurbished and made ready for Camilla. However, it was made clear that taxpayer money would not be used to decorate Camilla's rooms. 
As Prince Charles left, there was a warm handshake for Camilla's son and a kiss for her daughter. The couple tonight are entertaining back at St. James's Palace. As a, as a mother and a grandmother, as a, an amazing parent, we obviously I saw it with her with her kids, Tom and Laura, and oh, you know, great with them. Very comfortable in that role as well, you know, very comfortable. And you can see the, the, the grandkids and her kids adore her, absolutely adore her. Family has always been important to Camilla. Growing up in idyllic circumstances in Plumpton in East Sussex, her desire to give her own children a happy English childhood was a very high priority. Camilla and Andrew had made a home for themselves in Wiltshire and had two children, Thomas Henry, born in December 1974, and Laura Rose, born in January 1978. For one reason or another, the media has portrayed Camilla as being less than an ideal mother, but her son Tom has been quick to defend her expressing how he always feels happy and safe when he goes home as she cooks the food he likes and they all laugh and joke together he obviously adores and appreciates his mother as she entered into the realm of possible stepmother to william and harry the world speculated about the boy's feelings towards camilla and what that relationship might look like with the second marriage she has her adopted sons and women harry and the relationship was obviously really good between them as well. Um, she was very good at, you know, from what I remember, she, there, was, there, was, there was no obvious, can I say, favouritism, if I can say that. Do you know what I mean? So it was always like everyone was treated the same way. It is said that the boys' relationship with Camilla took time to grow gently. She was part of a story that involved the breakup of their family, so it was quite natural for it to be a little awkward at first. However, over time, the boys took to Camilla, seeing how their father benefited so much from the loving relationship and witnessing how happy she made him. They just wanted to support their father. You know, they, they always wanted to kind of be their family and support him. So anything he wanted to do, um, they, of course, would support him. And, and I think they just wanted him to be happy. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news, and when the Cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole government. So I remember one morning, the television was on in the other room, and suddenly we had breaking news, and it said the Prince of Wales has announced his engagement, and we worked for him, but we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. And I remember getting into the room and watching this, and we were all like, wow, they're engaged, and we didn't know. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. <laughs> if you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. You can have a How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just I'm just, I'm just coming down to us. Did you get down on one knee to propose? Of course. <laughs> what else? After several years of brief appearances at small events, seeding the public imagination in the possibility of a marriage between Charles and Camilla. It was finally announced in February 2005 that they were engaged to be married 35 years after they had first met. I think the early days, in fairness to her, I think it was obviously slightly nerve-wracking as well because she was marrying into the family. She obviously knew the family very well, but suddenly she was marrying into the family and was going to become, well, one of the, the, the most senior members of the royal family. So I think there was quite a bit of pressure for her, but she's never, in all the years I was there, she never changed. She was always the same. Your Royal Highness, uh, eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you, you are you, feeling? How in bit, particular <laughs> Princes William and Harry are feeling yeah. at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy, very pleased. 
Be a good day. Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. <laughs> Prince William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. The one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. <laughs> I think it's very difficult to know William and Harry's relationship with Camilla. I think that, that they certainly didn't. And then William was the first one to meet Camilla, which was slightly by accident. Uh, he met her at St. James's Palace, where, where he, he, his father was living at the time. And he, um, I think, you know, Camilla just didn't interfere in their lives. And, they, and I think they really warmed to her. No, she is. Um... She's, she's a wonderful woman, and she's made our father very, very happy, which is the most important thing. William and I love her to bits, get on really well with her. Um, and as far as I see it, nothing's changed. I'm not around that much. I'm at Sandhurst. William's just finished university. Now he's doing a bit of work here and there. So um, we're not around that much anyway. But when we are around, everyone's happy, everyone's fine. You know? Well, of course, it's absolutely wonderful news. And all of us, the whole family, are delighted. Uh, I don't think one wants to say much more than that, but I'm very, very happy to reiterate this. Hmm? Princes William and Harry also said today in a statement that they were both very happy for their father and Camilla and wished them all the luck in the future. Their wedding day was scheduled for the 8th of April 2005, but unfortunately another obstacle stopped them in their path. Pope John Paul II died and Charles was expected to attend the funeral on behalf of the Queen. The wedding was postponed until the following day. Finally, the big day arrived. On the 9th of April, 2005, Charles and Camilla married in a civil ceremony at Windsor Guild Hall, with Prince William as best man. After a 35-year courtship, two marriages and two divorces, Charles and Camilla finally wed, a day so many thought would not be possible. Well, the Queen felt that, as the head of the church, she, she shouldn't be seen to be attending the ceremony. They got married in the town hall in Windsor, and the Queen very wisely said she, she wouldn't attend the ceremony, but she would attend the blessing in the church and she would give a reception. Um, and the, but William and Harry were at the ceremony and other people supporting them there. It was very, very small and it was very intimate. I was busy working at Highgrove, a phone went. One of my colleagues got the phone and he said, oh, there's a phone call for you. And it was um, one of the princes top aides, one of his top aides, and he said, I've, I've been asked to phone you by the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. He says, because they would like to personally invite you to the wedding. Because as a member of staff, you haven't completed the amount of time, but they're sending you a private invitation. I remember that as if it was yesterday. I remember exactly where the, the call took place. I remember my thoughts. I remember the phone. I remember everything. I remember I was trying not to get upset because I was so emotional and like excited about this. And it was unbelievable. I mean, it was amazing because suddenly there I am as a guest to the Prince of Wales and Duke Cornwall and with all the celeb friends, with other royals, um, VIPs, dignitaries, prime ministers, and I'm there as a guest. In 2012, Queen Elizabeth publicly signalled her acceptance of her new daughter-in-law when she named Camilla Dame Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order. The Duchess went on to accompany Queen Elizabeth on the carriage ride during her Diamond Jubilee. Sadly, Camilla's brother, Mark Shand, died an untimely and accidental death in New York in 2014. After celebrating the success of a fundraising campaign for a conservation charity, he fell and hit his head on the pavement. 
He was taken to hospital, but sadly died. It came as a great shock to Camilla, her sister Annabelle, and to Charles, who were all utterly devastated by the loss. Charles and Camilla took over the work he was doing, becoming joint royal presidents of the charity. My brother, who founded the charity, I think if you saw all these elephants now scattering across the, the southwest of England, he'd be so proud. I don't think he, when you know, he sadly he died, um, having raised a lot of money for the charity, and my husband and I took it on. I don't think he, he uh, I don't think he would have believed how how well it could have. It's it's gone from strength to strength, and. Um, you know, I, I'm just really proud to be part of it. I'm really proud that we've been able, with the help of Ruth, who's absolutely fantastic, to bring it to this level. Camilla very rarely speaks about personal matters to the press, but many years after the scandals with Charles and Diana, she said, I couldn't really go anywhere. It was horrid. It was a deeply unpleasant time, and I wouldn't want to put my worst enemy through it. I couldn't have survived it without my family. Camilla has won great respect from the press and media for never reacting to stories or trying to correct the many falsehoods about her. In 2016, Camilla was appointed to the Privy Council, along with Prince William, the statutory body which advises the monarch on state matters. It is clear that she takes her responsibilities very seriously, and she is devoted to her role. En route to becoming queen, Camilla's role and title was Duchess of Cornwall. The role of Duchess of Cornwall comes with many responsibilities. Of course, she must support her husband, but it has become an expectation that as a duchess, she uses her influence for good in her own charitable endeavors. Camilla's approach was gentle. She did not rush into supporting many different charities, but she took her time and found organizations that she felt she could help raise awareness and funding when needed. Camilla's first patronage was the Royal Osteoporosis Society, though her work with the charity actually began in 1994. Unfortunately, Camilla's mother suffered from osteoporosis and the disease led to her untimely death. Her grandmother had also died of the illness. I think she now feels that the time is perhaps right to risk a little bit more publicity so that it will benefit the charity and I think she's wonderful to do that because obviously over the years she's suffered greatly at the hands of the media and I think she's very brave to be a little more public on our behalf. My mother was only 72. Then, only eight years ago, Osteoporosis was seldom discussed, rarely diagnosed, and usually attributed to old women with so-called dowager's humps. My family knew nothing about osteoporosis. The local GP was kind and sympathetic, but he, like us, was able to do little to alleviate the terrible pain my mother suffered so stoically. We watched in horror as she quite literally shrunk in front of our eyes. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the quality of her life became so dismal and her suffering so unbearable that she just gave up the fight and lost the will to live. As a result of my mother's death, I became determined to find some way of helping people with osteoporosis from experiencing the same fate and general disregard that she encountered. I was lucky enough to discover on my doorstep the National Osteoporosis Society. The work the charity was doing was close to Camilla's heart, and she remains heavily involved with the charity, becoming its patron and then president. Camilla is also keen to fight illiteracy, working with organizations such as the National Literacy Trust, Book Trust and Beanstalk, keenly encouraging a love of reading in young people. Her own Instagram feed is very focused on books and reading. Right, everybody, I'm going to put you a book called Dog Love. 
Camilla has a personal interest in animals, and so naturally looked to organizations she could work with, which protect the welfare of animals. She is patron of the British Equestrian Foundation, the Kennel Club Charitable Trust, Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, and more. Well, I think Camilla's repaired her reputation by just being very patient. I'm just taking it very slowly. She didn't do too many royal engagements to begin with. She walked, you know, she was always letting Prince Charles take the, the, take the bow, if you like. You know, he was always in front. Uh, it's only really and probably in the last couple of years that she's really ranked up her engagements and her patronages and, and become much more high profile. But I think she's very much, we still feel that she is there for her husband. She has also shown a particular interest in helping charities and organizations that fight against sexual violence and domestic abuse. Camilla has been praised for her ability to make victims feel safe and relaxed and happy to share their stories and experiences. Gita, it's not her real name, was raped in Hackney at the age of 15. She'd been using drugs to try and forget until she got help. I felt so dirty, like no one would want me. I had names and horrible comments. The service made me realise it wasn't my fault, that I wasn't to blame. Now I don't have to use anything to numb the pain. I can talk to someone instead and try and choose a better path for myself. Today, thanks to the East London Rape Crisis Service, she was well enough to tell her story to the Duchess of Cornwall, who came to visit the new health centre in Ilford, one of four rape crisis clinics supported by the mayor's office, but whose long-term future is under threat due to budget cuts. Well, I'm very pleased the Duchess of Cornwall has been able to turn up because she gives it a lift. She helps us to publicise something that is so important for, for women across London, because Victims of uh, rape and sexual violence have got to know that there is somewhere they can come where uh, they're going to be secure, where they can talk to people. Camilla is always keen to think of ways to help and use her influence for good. Typically, rape victims undergo forensic testing where they have their clothes taken away and are given basic products to wash with. Camilla came up with a neat idea to give them a small wash bag filled with lovely aromatic products. It was a small gesture, but it made a big difference. Home Secretary, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Clarence House, and thank you all very much for coming. I know how busy you are, so I'm completely indebted to you coming here today. Now, the purpose of asking you all here today is to try and form a united front to help victims of rape and sexual abuse. And what difference does it make having the Duchess's endorsement for something like this? I think the Duchess's endorsement is, is really significant to have um, someone like the Duchess saying, this is an important issue, um, I want to hold a reception like this, bringing these people together and making some strong statements um, is really significant. Mm. And it was a strong statement, a sort of exhortation she made in her final, this whole final sentence of her speech. Um, how can that sort of aspiration be achieved? I mean, is that possible? It is possible. It's really hard work. She's absolutely right that more needs to be done. Um, it is aspirational, but it's up to us to get on and deliver. Important work's been done. We're heading in the right direction, but there's a lot more to be done. And so strong words are very important in this environment. So I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, with the hope that this reception will draw you all together from every corner of the country to share your expertise and experiences. And perhaps from this small beginning, we'll be able to build a future where society will simply not tolerate rape and sexual abuse any longer. Thank you all very much. Thank you. What I've also noticed is that the, the charities she's got involved in, I mean, some of them are automatic. When I say automatic, they, 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 there's different things that have that don't have to, but they do go to senior members of the Royal Family. That's how it works. But I have noted with her that a certain charities and things she has taken on because of 
how she feels about the subject, how she really wants to support it. The other thing I remember with the Duchess's compassionate side is the old Dow's marvellous children's charity, and that's where they get all the, the, the children that have got life-threatening uh, illnesses and diseases. I say life-threatening, I think a lot of them do not live for many, many months after seeing the Duchess at Christmas time, when they arrive at Clarence House to help decorate the Christmas tree. Now, do you know it's one of the worst I say the worst thing is it was 